Okay, folks, welcome to Paranormal Roundtable. I'm your host, Josh Turner, and I've been spending more time okay, being able folks. to use welcome my own Paranormal studio Roundtable. here at the house. My It's my study where I where I do things or whatever. Um, so I want to talk about something tonight. We, we, were, we, were, we were on, a, I was on a show earlier with uh, Tex and Bonds and Booze and, of course, Barton and Letitia Nunley. And the show was uh, Dogman Roundtable. I got in a little bit late. I had a lot of stuff to do. I was I was overwhelmed with things today. Mondays are extremely hard for me. I have to really, really, really push to try to get things done on Mondays. And uh, there's always like meetings and things I have to do. And I'm up early. And I'm just, I was so tired. I said, you know what? I'm going to take a short nap, short nap. And I'm just going to get myself together. And the short nap ended up turning into um, an hour and a half, two, you know, and it was, it, it went, it cut into the time I woke up and I was like, oh my gosh, the show is on. And so I, I apologize for that. I was running late and uh, no excuses, but I was just, I'm just beat. I was wiped. And uh, so I, the, the reason I wanted to get people in tonight, because there was a good, there was a good crowd there and I felt obligated to, to give you guys something. I have some things I could be doing, but um, there's always something to do. There's always something that needs do doing. And, and so, you know, I thought, you know what, let's take the crowd over to my show and, and we'll continue. Tex had to go and be with his grandson. And of course, uh, you know, you had Blas and Booze. They had to get up early. Got to go to work. Barton's got to go to work. He gets up at 4 a.m. I know Barton very well. He's got a lot of things he's got to do and take care of. And um, yeah, so just one second here. And we'll get started because I, I got something I want to talk about. And what, what it is, is somebody gave me a story and... Now they're talking like uh, the, the person that gave me the story, they're saying that uh, they were starting to have second thoughts, you know, about it and should I tell it or not tell it. And so they literally kind of asked me um, to just put it out there. Um, 
I don't know, you know, what the fear is. I, I, I know that there is some trepidation. Um, and I thought maybe, you know, maybe there's something behind this. Maybe I need to go ahead and put it out there before mm -hmm. it gets, you know, the, you know, whatever, because, you know, just when somebody is, is kind of panicky and they said, you know what, just go ahead and put it out there because something could happen. And I'm like, what do you mean something could happen? I don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Um, and they weren't real specific on, you know, so when we get to about a couple hundred people in here and I can start talking, this is not something that I'm going to take lightly. Um, so let's look at the comments real quick and let's get, let's get in here and see what we got. I haven't even looked at the comments here. <clears throat> P. Jean says Mondays are crazy for me as well. I totally get it. I had an Irish goodbye last night as I fell asleep during one of the chats. So if you go, if, if you, if you listen to the show, we started talking about all kinds of other stuff and that is kind of how it goes with me, especially with me and Barton. It's just, we, it, with that guy, I mean, I've been through so much with that guy. I mean, we have, oh my gosh, dude, in the, in the, these few years we've been working together, it's been uh, an, an evolution of our friendship, you know, and we've interviewed bunches and bunches and bunches of people together and separately and then we've interviewed them you know and there have been so many stories back and forth that we've we've, we've gone through and he is one of the old school people in this field now um and I, he was somebody i wanted to work with way back but he had told me when i first started talking to him he says i may be one of the only people thank you love cat for that donation i greatly appreciate it <clears throat> You already beat Saturday's uh, donations by 99 cents. That was great because I was thinking Saturday, Tony kind of teased me. He says, nobody likes you. They didn't They didn't give you a dime because they think you're ugly. He made a joke, and I laughed it off. My, my brother kind of teased me. Um, but then later on, like I said, it wasn't about getting anything. It was like maybe I wasn't doing a good job. Maybe I'm not doing my job. Maybe I'm not doing good. I'm not, you know, and so I really started to kind of, I don't know. I was laying there kind of feeling like um, like I couldn't breathe. You know, I was like, man, what? maybe I'm losing my touch. Maybe people don't want to hear me. You know, you start to doubt and things creep in and, and whatever. But it, it, this whole thing <clears throat> comes full circle and, and you realize, you know, you go back on on Sunday. You know, it's like a pitcher. You throw, uh, you, you get shellacked and somebody hits a few home runs off you and you're like, you start to question yourself. And so then I said, I told myself, I said, if I don't do good on Sunday, then something is wrong and I need to figure out what it is and correct it quickly. Um, but there were people in the chat, just nobody, you know, it wasn't, you know, and I thought, man, I got to do better, you know. But uh, <clears throat> I don't know that it's me so much as it's just the times maybe, you know. And um, I wanted to say something, though, like I was saying about Barton. Thank you, William Bedard. I appreciate that. And uh, I, I think that when you look at, at, at this uh, situation with me and Barton and how, how far we've come and our views aren't 100 percent, you know, because mine are ever changing. And I had this conversation actually with Larry Fisher earlier. Me and Larry had a long talk today because there was some contention there between me and Larry because – Larry doesn't believe like I do. But like I told Larry, you don't have to believe like I do because my beliefs are ever changing and, and they're changing with what I'm finding. Uh, one of the things that Anthony pointed out uh, on, on our show was that very much I did not believe the way Armando Salazar, my former co-host who passed away, sadly, him and Johnny Henderson, they passed away three days from each other of the same thing. And um, the, the late John Anderson, great guy, one of the best in this field, uh, salt of the earth man. His son, uh, Elijah Henderson, and Gabby, his daughter, uh, both, you know, the, the Cryptid Studies Institute, good people, great people. And um, one of the things that I, I remember uh, about, you know, when I talked to him and about his beliefs, you know, and I talked to Armando about his beliefs, and they all believe differently. Uh, Armando was a Sitchin guy, and of course, I didn't fully believe, and I still don't fully believe the way Sitchin believed. I don't. That's. I just think that there's some truth and some validity to it. But Henderson, Johnny Henderson, he was a Seventh Day Adventist, and he he told me about his beliefs. Barton's mm -hmm. told me about his beliefs, and I believe some of each one. 
and I'm somewhere in between. I don't, I don't totally, but I don't feel like we have the, the all the answers. One of the things that comes with that is the belief that these creatures that we talk about, Bigfoot, Dogman, whatever you want to call them, you know, Goatman, um, the cryptids in particular, but I don't call them cryptids. I subscribe to what Barton Nunley calls inhumanoids. And I believe in that for a long time, ever since I read his book, The Inhumanoids. And I thought, there's no way that these things are an animal-type creature that has not been discovered. And Ken Gerhardt's another one that helped me find that path. I started studying the dogman phenomena very intently. And Ken went down that road with me. In particular, this last year, we did, um, no lie, we did about 60 in interviews of, of, of witnesses of Bigfoot, Dogman, mostly Dogman. Barton was involved in that too. We interviewed a lot of people, a lot of people between the three of us. It was an amazing thing. And throw in Sibylla Irwin too, the artist. Uh, when, when we did these uh, conversations we had prior to the conference and leading up to the conference, a lot of theories were postulated on. And Ken himself told me, he says, dude, the Dogman phenomena has blown me away. His exact words, he was like, dude, I never dreamed that it was, the, he goes, it is creepy. He's like, I'm a cryptozoologist. I'm looking for undiscovered species of animals. He said, this thing is not an animal. And of course, you know, Barton was there and he's like, it's not an animal. <laughs> it is an inhumanoid. And Ken says, I agree. He says, I don't know what this thing is, but it is not a cryptid. I know that. It is not an undiscovered animal. Now, Ken interviewed no less than 20 some people himself just on his own. And I gave him those witnesses. And I said, here, talk to these people. If you don't want to believe me, you don't believe me. Same thing with Nick Redfern. Nick Redfern uh, called me up. True story. He called me up and he says, dude, the, the Bigfoot book, unbelievable. He says, you know, Josh, that book, very incredible, very on the level, blah, blah, blah. You know, it was very, you know, the way he talks, you know. And and so he, he told me, he says, this is real. This is what I believe. David Weatherly, same thing. Same thing. Another guy uh, who's a good friend of mine. We talked and we talked and we talked. And then me and Christopher Jordan talked. And we went around, me and Daniel uh, Jones and him, and we talked at the conference. And we said, let's do a UAP panel. Let's put it all together. Let's figure out what we're dealing with here, right? Well, one of the things that comes with that is something that a lot of people don't like to talk about because they don't think that it's real. They think that if you talk about this, that you got to be some kind of crazy person. And I'm going to tell you this right now, you're not if you believe in shape-shifting. Now, I had a guy who came on my show. His name is Nick. I call him Big Nick. He's a big dude. He's a, an African-American friend of mine. He's from Chicago, and he's a no-nonsense. He's a tough guy, and he's not one of those that goes around like, I'm a tough guy. He's just a tough guy. I've seen him lift people off the ground with punches. Trust me, the guy's a tough guy. He's about 420 pounds. He's a big dude. He's a little bit shorter than me, um, but he is a, a, a monster. <clears throat> used to work for me. He used to work for my friend Arash. Both of us, me and Arash, have seen the creature that you call the dog man. Now, Nick was in an elevator, and he came on my show, and he talked about this on one of the live streams. He encountered something that looked like a normal human in the elevator with him. He said this guy towered over him. He said he had red hair. He was a, he was a Caucasian man. He's like, and he looked at through the mirrored elevator, and he saw this guy moving his face, his eyes shifting into slits like a lizard. And he says, I just kept looking at my phone and pretending like I was looking at my phone. I didn't notice it. And I had another guy, I'll call him MC. He's he's going to come on the show. I got him. To call, he's going to come on the show. He comes, he, he tells me, I'm in an elevator, same thing, in Atlantic City. And I witness one of these things change and do something unbelievable. Now, I'm going to say that because he's going to talk about it. He's going to tell it on the show. These are examples of shape-shifting. I interviewed a woman who was in Tallahassee, Florida. And she heard the show, and she says, I heard you talking about Tallahassee one day. And she says, 
I'm going to tell you this. She's like, I saw a man walk into the convenience store that I was working in in, in 1988. She's like, he walked into my store and began to convulse on the floor. Now get this. This is an incredible story. Her name is Missy. And she says, I walked over there to see what he was on. And I thought, great, another person on drugs. She told me this story exactly a month ago, <clears throat> February 11th or 12. Well, you know what? Close to a month ago. I think it was the 12th, something like that. I know it was a couple of days before Valentine's. And I could hear her husband in the background. So he's like, tell him about, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, and she was like, I'm trying to tell him, you know. This guy, she said, was in his underwear. He had pulled his clothes off. His, his shirt was pulled off. His pants were pulled down. And she said, I watched this man convulsing on the ground. Okay. He had hair all over his body. His face, she said, was the, 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 the muzzle of your, of your face right here, she said, was elongated. Not completely like a snout, but it was elongated. And she's like, and I watched this man look to be turning into something. And, and I said, you know, and then she kind of got quiet, and I'm listening to her talk, and I said, what happened? She's like, I didn't stick around. I ran out of the store. She said, and the security cameras they had, of course, this is 1988. They're not very good. She said, all I see is this blur run. You know, you see it on the camera, like a white blur, a just shriek, like, like a streak, and then out the door. She's like watching the flash, right? She said, I told my boss what I saw, and he laughed at me. She's like, he laughed at me. He didn't want to believe what I had seen. She's like, and then two weeks later, she's like, my husband and I get a knock at our door. And this is the part where he was like, tell them that when they came to the house. I'm like, you know, okay. Two guys in black coats. I'm not going to call them the men in black because that they were just normal guys. They looked like agents. And she says that they were feds, according to her. Now, I'm saying that's what she said. I'm not saying this is what happened. This is a story that I'm repeating that was told to me. And she said that these people questioned her and asked her if something strange had happened to her in the, in, in the summer. This was like, you know, uh, like I think she said two, I think it was like two months later or something like that. She said, they, they come to me and it's like October and they asked me what happened in August. And I told them, I said, a man came into the store. He was complaining about being hot. He began to like shake and convulse and he went and laid on the ground. She said he, he reeked of booze. So she thought he was extremely intoxicated, and uh, he looked to be on drugs. His eyes were rolling back in his head, and he was bouncing his head back and forth. Now, when she told me this story, she told me this. She says, there is a guy who, who I can get you in touch with, who, when she spoke to this guy, she said that he can tell you, you know, She's like, he listens to your show, and he, he'll he'll talk to you. And I said, okay. So she introduces me to a guy who says, I have a werewolf story, and I thought it was his story. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't his story. He said, look, I can introduce you to someone who is a werewolf. And they even offered to me to meet them. I would have had to drive and meet them uh, in Mississippi, which I was not willing to do. And I told him, I said, I'm not going to drive to Mississippi. And and, and he kind of jokingly, he's like, look, don't be afraid. He goes, if, if you're afraid, he goes, I'll go with you. I know this person. He's a reformed, he's a Christian now, right? And I said, two things. I'm not going to meet someone. I don't care even if it's just to buy something from, uh, what do you call it, the uh, Craigslist, Craigslist, whatever. I don't, I don't do that. I'm not going to do that. I said, but, but even if I did, I'm not going to drive to Mississippi because I'm a very busy man and I have a business. I have two business, actually three businesses, and I don't have time. I'm a workaholic. I said I don't have time for that. I said I'll flesh out the story. What do you got? Didn't, I didn't, I did not believe it. I did not believe him. I believed Missy's story. What she saw. 
but this guy seemed kind of like not sketch as the as they say but uh he just was kind of vague and i said you know you need to get me in touch with this man if you're going to do it so some time goes by and a couple of weeks ago i kind of just put on the back burner because like every day i'm still i'm still getting information every day that could become potentially a story or something that's going to happen down the road. So what I'm doing right now, I'm working on stuff that'll be coming out in April or even May. And that's how you do it. You got to keep it going, right? And so I told him, I said, maybe we'll talk about this. We'll flush it out, whatever, no pun intended. And uh, I said, but then again, probably not because I'm thinking to myself, you know, I'm like, this is probably not real. Oh boy. So, <laughs> so the person gets back in touch with me. And the reason I'm telling this story tonight right here is because I don't know how much time I have um, to, to get this story out because this individual said, if you're going to tell it, tell it. Because I'm not, you know, and not to be one of those people, but I want to be the first one to break this story if he does go and decide to tell other people, which he's being told he better be quiet. So I have my time to tell what I got to tell and get it out there. So what he tells me. He's like, he gets on the phone with me and it's a, it's, it's, it's sort of contentious at first. He's like, so you're a werewolf guy. He asked me that question. I said, what does that mean? Like who, who, you know, what is that? I'm, I'm not a werewolf guy. Okay. I don't know what you're talking about. He says, well, you're a guy that, that, what do you guys call it? The dog man. And I said, yes, that's what some people call it. He laughed. I'm going to say this. I'm not going to lie to you. Okay. When he laughed. Um, gave me the chills. It did. It, it, it was a laugh, you know, like, you know, it was, I don't know, I can't do it like him. Um, it kind of made me, um, it kind of, it kind of scared me a little bit. I'm not going to lie. I was like, wow, that's a very sinister laugh. There was the other guy on the phone and I said, Hey, um, you know, is this, is this what we're doing here? We're taking, we're making jokes, you know, whatever. And he was like, this isn't a joke, Mr. Turner. He's like, and I'm not like anybody you've interviewed. He goes, I know for sure you've interviewed at least three people who have done this. And I'm like, really? He says, yeah. Oh, yeah. I recognize a couple of the stories. He's like, those are people I know. I really know them. And I thought to myself, I said, now, having somebody who gave me a story about this that saw something in a convenience store back in 1988 in August, and then to this point right here, so I said, look, we talked for a little bit. He told me a little bit about his background, what he had done, and he asked me not to disclose that. And I said, okay, fine. It was it's nothing serious, but he doesn't want to be tracked down. He told me that there are different people out there that do things that I thought were only from the realm of fantasy. Two things he told me. One, he says, we already just aside with the werewolf thing, he said vampires exist. And I told him, I believe that. I know that. In fact, when I was uh, out at the collector's store yesterday, they're selling four different vampire kits, one of them dating back to the 1700s, and they have a really, really old one that's from like the late 1600s that they're not selling. And I told him that. I said, I said, I, I, I know vampires exist. I'm writing a book about it. He kind of kind of laughed, not a sinister laugh, just a normal laugh. And then he said, the other thing I want to tell you, <clears throat> not only do vampires exist and werewolves, like that's just a given, whatever. But he said that um, there are people who go out of their way to encounter these beings. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, they're called hunters. I've heard of this. In fact, I have a friend in this field who interviewed one. And it was Kirk Reed. And, of course, he told me he could get me in touch with this guy. I've never taken him up on the offer, but I probably will. He said these people. And he said that there was a show that, that these guys had gone on to. I'm not going to say the name of it. And he said that one of them was on there. One of them was a liar. He said, that guy, I know he's not. He's just making stuff up. He said, but the other guy, he really was one. He goes, because of the detail that he was going into. He says he knew about us. And when this guy talked, he wasn't a young guy. Like, I, I can tell you that. I'm not saying that because if a young person tells you, hey, 
I'm a werewolf or I'm a reptilian or I'm a vampire or I'm the Mothman. It's like, you're, I'm not going to believe this young guy. But when an older gentleman tells you something like this, it tends to hold a little more weight. And this was, to me, it was an older gentleman. And I believe that he himself, whether or not it's it's completely true um, what he was saying, he believed he was telling the truth. So in my mind, here's what's going on in my head. My, the gears are turning in my head. And I'm like, this guy believes that he's a werewolf or he was a werewolf. Now, whether he is one or not is up for speculation. Anybody can say that they're, a, you know, you can say whatever. I can call myself a pastrami on rye. It doesn't make it true. When he was telling me this, I could tell that he believed it. He's an older gentleman, and he believes that this was what, what was real. He told me, he says, I'm 56, almost 57. In fact, I think as of this, he probably is 57. Um, he's like, I'll be 57 in, in, in a few weeks. And this was, I guess, you know, so he's 56, 57 years old. And he goes, I tell you, this is the truth. He's like, shapeshifters are real. And I said, so I started asking him some questions. So it became interview with the werewolf. And I said, if. I were to tell you that I'm a werewolf, would you believe it? His his answer, now get this, his answer is like, I have no idea. He goes, you won't know. He goes, I see you on the camera, on the TV. I've watched a couple of your episodes. And he goes, and I listened to your uh, story about the bear man. Very intriguing. He's like, I've always been interested in that because that's another facet. He's like, I don't know the bear people. I know they exist. And he said that they do supposedly live in your area. And I said, that's very comforting. <laughs> I kind of like not knowing for sure. You know, you, you kind of want to say, yeah, that, that's they're there. But you don't really like to be confirmed with somebody who claims to be a werewolf that says, yeah, bear people live in your area. Okay, fair enough. Uh, kind of creepy. And then I said, but you wouldn't know if I was one or not. He goes, no wouldn't i can't look at a camera and tell that you are he's like but you do know an awful lot about what we do and what we are he goes but i think you're holding back and i want to know why and i told him i said because i don't completely believe that's what i told him now at that point in the conversation and i admitted to him later i said i was lying and i apologize for lying because i do believe but in, for the sake of my conversation, I was dishonest a little bit. I admit that. I'm sorry. But I told him, I said, I want to know more. You need to tell me more. And if you want to continue talking to me, feed me, Seymour, because I don't know if I believe you or not. He told me, he says, if you don't believe me, that's fine. He said, we can hang up the phone and never talk again. This could be the end of our conversation and it won't hurt my feelings. And I said, okay, fair enough. He said, but I'll tell you this. Some of what Hollywood portrays of werewolves and vampires is very real, very true. It's a very accurate depiction of what goes on. He said a lot of, though, of what Hollywood depicts and is, is, is all bullcrap. He went on to tell me that it has nothing to do with the full moon, which I already was pretty well aware of that. Um, it's a lore that was made up from the movie The Wolfman. He also said that it has nothing to do with Wolf's Bane, Blooming, or any of that other Hollywood jazz. But he said it has a lot to do with the science. He goes, and I believe, according to my friend here, was on the phone with us, he said, you call it the black science. And I said, yes, I do. I said, and in Spanish, it's brujeria, brujeria negra, which is the black magic. He says, yeah. He says, we agree with that part. It is a black science. It is something that is forbidden, but that has been done for millennium. He said, and there was a time when people were changing into other things, not just wolves. Wolves became a very popular, he didn't say this word, avatar, but for me, I know that's what he's getting at. It became a very popular uh, avatar to use because it was a human fear. 
especially in the medieval times, when packs of wolves could be 20 to 30 deep. And being out in the wilderness, running into a wolf could be an absolute death sentence because you knew that there were probably more. And the fear was very palpable anywhere you went, whether it was in the Levant, the Middle East, or in Asia. Wolves were everywhere. They, they were on all of the continents. They were pretty much everywhere you went, there was wolves. Wolves would attack regularly, attack people regularly and kill them. So the, the fear of the wolf was very deep-seated. He tells me, I went along with this cult, as he calls it, and we worshipped a demonic entity. He goes, I don't call it Satan because that's not what it was. He's like, I wasn't a Satanist. Now, I know what a Satanist is, okay? And by the definition, he was not a Satanist. Satanists believe in, do what they wilt, and they worship themselves. It is a self-gratification, instantaneous, I do whatever I feel like doing, I'm free from the, con the constraints of society and of morality, which is really screwed up. I admit that. I agree with that. It's not correct. And he told me that what he believes, because he doesn't have all the answers, is that this cult had been around since the ancient since the time of the ancient Mesopotamians. When he gave me the name of the entity that they worship and serve, I found it strange. I said, I think I know who you're talking about, but you're not saying it correctly. And he told me, he's like, that's something that I don't do. I don't invoke it. So there were two letters off. And my wife has asked me not to repeat the name of the entity. Looking it up, it was an ancient Mesopotamian deity. And they did believe in blood sacrifice. And someone has to bring them, someone that they love or care about, when that blood is spilled on their altar, they are granted certain liberties, if you want to call them that, and they become something other than human. Now, here is the part where you're probably not going to have heard this. A lot of this you may have already heard, and if you listen to the show, you've probably heard all this in bits and pieces. Let me get comfortable here. If you can get comfortable, I feel like I'm going to jump out of my skin. No pun intended. Once again, I'm, you know, I just feel anxious talking about it. Give me one second. Whew. Okay. So when he began to talk to me about the transformation process, he said, it's not like what you would expect. He's like, when it first happened to me, I didn't go out in public for three days because that's what I was told to not do. So I sat around my house smoking cigarettes and drinking. I was a heavy drinker and a drug user. He's like, but according to the rules of our cult, he goes, you weren't supposed to drink alcohol, but I did it in excess. You weren't supposed to use drugs, but I did it in excess. And I was talked to by some of the elders about my habitual offenses. I'm a very large man, and I'm intimidating. And I think that they thought better of pushing it with me. And what he said, he began to have problems with some of the people that were in charge. They didn't go around calling themselves alphas. Thank you for that donation. Thank you to everybody who's donated. I appreciate it. It definitely helps the show. We're trying to get some camera equipment so that we can do more outdoor stuff, and we appreciate it. He said that these people were called elders. And he said that one of them was considered to be the oldest, get this, was almost 200 years old. I kind of laughed. And I said, really, 200? <laughs> uh, and he was like, you laugh because it's, it's not funny. He was a vampire. He's like, in every sense of the word, he was a vampire. His diet consisted of blood. He's like, he used certain things of the body to stay in the human body. Even then, he still looked ancient. He looked old. But he could move and walk and talk like a young person. And at times, he would walk into the temple where we were at, 
looking like he was maybe in his 50s or 60s, but he could only hold it for so long. And he spent most of his time in the dark because, not because he couldn't go out into the daylight, but because the sun was really bad on his skin. His skin was like paper thin unless he had recently fed. And I asked him this question, and this is deep. And I said, how long were you involved with these people? And he said, 19 years. 19 years. He said, the good thing about the modern day is that you could be talking to someone and just casually throw out there that, hey, I'm a vampire. <laughs> and people would laugh. <laughs> yeah, me too. Or, and this is something that the person who listened to my show had told him, because I wondered where he got it if he'd only heard a couple episodes. What are the odds that he only heard this? He said, I heard you making a joke about saying you were a werewolf in line at his grocery store. I said, yes, I did. And I can't remember whose show it was on or if it was on my show, whatever. And I said, so you heard that? He goes, no, my friend that's on the phone here did. And he said, yeah, it was me. I, I watch all your stuff. So then I said, let me ask you guys a question. Being a amateur investigative journalist, I guess that's what you would call it. I said, what if you guys are just shining me on? What if you're both just full of BS? And what you're saying is absolutely bullcrap. And I said, and what if you guys just watched my show and decided to pull one over on me? And he says, you can't know that. He's like, but why would I waste my time doing that? He said, I'm a welder now by trade. He's like, and I don't have time to watch your show every day, Mr. Turner. And he was a little condescending. And he said, you're not that important to me. He's like, I'm trying to tell you the absolute truth and you're making light of it. He's like, I can hang up right now if you want me to, and I'll go away. I won't harass you, bother you. There's no threat, nothing coming. I won't mess with you, but you won't hear from me, whatever. He said, but I'm going to tell someone this because it needs to be told. As a Christian, I want people to know this. Thank you, Liberty, for that donation. I appreciate it. At that point, I said, okay, no more smart remarks, no more chuckle house. Mm -hmm. Whatever I did to offend you, I apologize. If nothing else, it's a good story. It's a good encounter story, whatever. He told me many, many things. A lot of things. One of the things I'll call him Gerald. Gerald told me that he got involved in this when he was a young man. I would say, you know, at the age of 19, you're very impressionable. You're very easily led astray. And that is when he went to a party that changed his life. He said, I'll start from the beginning. He's like, when I was 19, I was initiated into this cult. He's like, I had an aunt who was with a guy. And she was with him for about three or four years. And he got me involved in the drug trade. He began to sell narcotics with this guy. Through this guy, he met a group of people who were ravenous for psychedelics, and they were selling it. And he said these people would not do cocaine, they would not do heroin, they would not do, and they didn't even drink, but they wanted MDMA. Big time, they wanted it. There was an, a drug we know as ecstasy. They also wanted LSD. These were things that he knew that would sell his aunt's uh, boyfriend. So they began to traffic this. And then this big client became almost an exclusive client as they were buying it as fast as they could get a hold of it. And he asked one of them one day, he said, her name was Cassie or Casey. And uh, he said, um, but this was not a, um, how do you say it? It, it? He could not tell what this person was, whether they were a male or female. They had a, a female's body. This is weird. And they had a very deep guttural voice. The person that, that, this, that he began to communicate with, Finally, he came to the conclusion that it was just some sort of deficiency. Something was wrong with the way she talked because she was very much a female. 
And he said that she didn't look like someone who was transsexual or, you know, a transvestite. And he said that it she looked like a female, a very voluptuous, very beautiful female. And he asked her point blank one day, he's like, I was a little, little high. And I just said, look, were you a dude? And she was like, no. My voice is this way for a certain reason. She's like, when I do certain things, my voice goes back to normal or sounds more feminine. She's like, I have not done those certain things, but it's almost time. And then she says, since you're so brazen, maybe I'll show you something one day. One thing leads to another, and he goes to her apartment one day. There's another woman there, and they are doing the deal, and they offer to have intercourse with him. Now, this is adult time. If you don't want to hear about this, don't, then don't, whatever. They do what they're doing. He goes in there. He's a young guy, and he's like, at this point, he's like 20, and he's like, wow. Wow. You know, these these women, and one of them, he said, probably in her 30s. The other one was in her late 20s. And he's like, this is my lucky day. Beautiful women. He said, during the, the process of this, one of them reached up, kissing on his shoulder, bit him very hard. And he pushed her off him, and he's like, what the heck? The other one goes to wrap her arm around his neck. And he, these are not big women. He goes to try to free himself. She bites him on the shoulder, too. Pulls his head back. The other one sits up on the bed and puts a finger right to his neck. And he said that he could feel what felt like a knife poking into his throat. But he said, Mr. Turner, it was not a knife. It was her nail. It was her claw. And I'm like, what, she... Yeah, I almost made a joke. I was thinking to myself, like, what did she not go get her nails done correctly or something? What, you know, what, what's, uh, what is this? And he tells me point blank. He says, this woman was going to cut my throat. The other one had her hands around my stomach and were, they were telling me, take it easy because we could disembowel you and kill you very easily. His shoulder was bleeding profusely. The one that had him by the throat, they both went down and began to drink out of his out of his shoulder. He thought, what are these people? Vampires? What's going on here? And he asked them, he got very quiet, very calmly, because I was very quiet and calm. And I said, look, I don't know what's going on. I just want to live. And the one that was behind him said, no, no, you're good. You give us something that we need. We need it for our rituals. We need it for our ceremonies. It's very important. And as long as you have a use to us, we won't kill you. But she said, as long as you continue to ask questions that you shouldn't be asking, your life is in danger. And then he looked down and he saw something that he never thought he would ever see in his entire life. He said, the woman that was laying in front of me, I've noticed she had hair all over her legs, and the back ends were the hawk-looking legs like a dog, a wolf, whatever. He didn't use those words. That's my words, but that's what he described to me. And he said that the one that was behind him, very much canid, he could feel the breath of what was a dog, literally, panting over his shoulder. And he was looking, like turning his head. The one in front of him was like, look at me, look at me. Look at me. And he continued to look at her. Then her voice began to become deeper, more guttural, to the point where it was like almost two people were talking through this one woman. And as they began to change, she says, get up, put your clothes on, and leave. Don't talk about what you've seen. Then when he tried to, the woman behind him, no longer a woman, tightened the grip. And he said, I could have swore it was a man's arm very big, very large, with hair all over it. And it slowly slid its arm around my chest and let me go. At this point, I'm just, okay. At this point, he got up off of the bed. He said, I turned and I looked and I saw an abomination. I saw these two furry, wolf-like, whatever the hell they were. 
And as they were staring at me, the final word I heard speak was leave now. He took off. He's like, I ran so fast. I got out of there. I left most of my clothes. I put my underwear on backwards and my pants. I was throwing them on as I was trying to get off my shoes, my jacket. I left the drugs. I left everything. He goes, and I got out of there. I made it out to the car. He's like, and I'm sitting there looking at this house, and it's in the woods. It is. It's on the edge of town. Nobody around. I mean, they had neighbors, but they weren't close. He's like, and I was driving out of there, and as I was going through those woods, I thought, what did you just see? What did you just see? He goes, and I questioned myself for days. He's like, I was terrified. I sat in my apartment, drinking, smoking cigarettes, wondering what it was that I had just witnessed. And then I get a knock on the door. He goes, and I'm stoned out of my mind. He goes, I get up, I go to the door, I open the door, and there is my aunt's husband, or fiance at that time, asking me, what did you do? He said, like, well... With Casey, I went, he goes, yeah, Casey. He goes, what did you do? He goes, they're looking for you. You haven't answered your phone. And he tried to explain to him. He says, look, I, I really don't want to. He goes, I don't care what you want. He's like, I told you not to get too involved with these people, not to ask questions. And definitely don't be alone with them. And he said, yes. And he goes, and you broke every rule I told you. He's like, and now... Their leader wants an audience with you. He said once he was told this, they went to meet them in a parking lot. And he said if he hadn't done what he did and seen what he'd seen, he would think it was just another leader from a drug cartel, dealer, whatever, and it was just another sketchy deal that he was going to have to deal with. He brought his gun. When he put his gun in his jacket, his uncle, I guess, or his, you know, aunt's boyfriend, whatever, told him, that's not going to help you. He's like, it's not going to help you. He says, you're going to need a much bigger caliber to do anything to these people. He goes, I'm going to tell you right now, what we're dealing with is something supernatural. And he's like, I know you probably think I'm lying. He goes, no, no, no. And Gerald told him the truth. He says, I screwed up. Yes. I saw them. They look like werewolves. His aunt's boyfriend says, okay, so you know what I'm saying. He goes, I've never seen them do that, but I've seen them lift people up. I saw one of them throw a trash can, the kind that, you know, that, that need a big, you know, hydraulic lift to get up. Saw him pick one up and throw it like it was nothing. He's like, these people, they're, they're aliens or something. I don't know what they are. And when they got to the meeting spot, he goes, this guy comes up wearing a trench coat, had something in his right hand, and he noticed it was a, it was a shotgun. The guy opens the door and says, get out. They get out. He said, at this point, he goes, I thought maybe we should have just not showed up. Maybe we could go on the run, blah, 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 whatever. He's like, I'm thinking these thoughts. And this woman comes up to me and puts her hand on my chest where my heart is. And she tells him, she's like, calm yourself down and no, there's nowhere to run or hide from us. Period. Pulls him out of the vehicle, takes his gun from him, throws it. It's, you're not going to be able to use that, she said. And they sat him down in a car. And they surrounded him. Two guys, two girls. His aunt's boyfriend was being talked to off in the distance, and they took him off to the woods. He was terrified. And they said, you were shown something that you shouldn't have seen. And he said, look, I didn't know. I didn't want to see. And he says, yes, but you were asking questions about us, about what we do and about what we are. And this is the problem because you have chosen to insert yourself 
into something that you shouldn't have been. And he says, I apologize. I'm sorry. With tears in his eyes, he's telling them, I'm, I'm, I'm a mess. I should not have done this. He's like, I'm not going to lie. I was crying. And I begged for my life. The guy in the front seat turns around. He looks at him and he says, look, he's like, I'm the leader of this sect. We answer to another group and that group still another group and all the way up the chain. He says, there are eight of us in this particular group. He's like, what we do is follow orders. Can you follow orders? And he said, yes, I, I can follow orders. He goes, it doesn't seem like it because your friend over there told you not to do certain things. He laid down certain ground rules and you violated them. Hold on one sec. I will do that. Somebody says I need to turn the lights down. I'm going to do that right now. Make it a little more fireside chatty here, right? This is in a this this uh, story gets me a little. Okay, <clears throat> and I've heard this story twice. So, what he told me, he says, I told them, I said, look, I promise you, I can follow orders. I can do whatever you want. I'll do anything you want. I will just please don't kill me. I'm a young guy, and they all laughed. They said, we don't care how old you are. We kill anything and everything. Doesn't matter. Don't try to appeal to anyone's humanity. And this guy looked him dead in his eye, and he said, our humanity died a long time ago. It's non-existent. He's like, we have no morals. It's just pure animalistic pragmatism. He's like, the drugs that you provide, we can find someone else for that. You're not an essential person. He's like, but you're a big, strong guy. And you would fit in very well because you're very immoral. And at that point, he had done some very immoral things. Then he didn't realize that they were probably to. They knew about it. He said, well, you, we know you've done some things. That's what we need. We need somebody who will do some things and not question it. Someone who doesn't have fear, which you're showing a lot of. And he's like, can you control your fear? And he was like, yes. He said the girl that was next to him had her, her hand on his heart and said, you need to slow it down. You need to calm down. Become ice." She said, so he did. He's like, somehow, some way, I just fought my urges to jump up out and just try to escape. I couldn't. There was nowhere to go. Two people on either side of me, two in front of me, and I was doomed. He's like, and nothing else. They had guns. I mean, he goes, I'm not going to get away. There was nothing I could do. So they made me an offer that I couldn't refuse. Kind of like being in the mob, except with demons. And he said, okay, what is it you want me to do? And they said, the first thing we're going to do is get rid of your friend. He's no use. He knows too much. And he made the foolish mistake of bringing you into this. And you obviously, being a wild card, you know, this never should have happened. But thank goodness it did. So goodbye to your friend. So they asked him to go and do what they needed to do. They pulled him out of the car and they walked him over to the woods. And they said, get rid of this guy. At that point, he's like, I don't know how this happened. He goes, I've never been one of these kind of people. I've never been a person to balk at anything, you know, immoral. 
He's like, but something in that moment told me I could not do that. And I said, what if, what if we both joined you together? And his aunt's boyfriend was like, yeah, 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 let's do that. Because he was willing to do anything to get out of this predicament that they were in. At that point, they kind of went back and they reconvened. They talked and they came back and they said, okay, fine. And they gave him an address and said, be here, seven o'clock. We'll talk. You have two days. Don't leave town. When they left, they were both in tears. He goes, we were both tough guys, thought we were badasses, and we were both crying. We were in tears. He's like, my aunt's boyfriend was like holding the steering wheel and lowering his head onto it. And I kept, we were all over the road. And I thought, we're, we're going to die on the way home. He goes, and I told him, I said, you're going to have to get it together. He's like, we can't sit here and cry. He goes, these people mean business. He kept on hitting the steering wheel and telling him why. Why did you have to do what you did? Why did you not listen to me? He's like, you almost got me killed. And this guy, he says, I told him, you almost got me killed. You introduced me to these freaking maniacs that, that can become whatever they are, monsters. What are you doing? Why? You know, there's all this arguing. He's like, and then. We began to smack each other, punch and kick and whatever. And then we almost wrecked. We went off into a ditch and we got out of the car and we proceeded to try to beat each other up, which didn't last long because I was much bigger than him. He goes, and we'll call him Mike. He's like, and me and Mike, me and Mike got into it. And Mike got his ass beat. He's like, and I laid there on the ground, both of us, just chest heaving. Didn't know what the future held. Did not know what was going to happen to either one of us. But I knew it wasn't good. And I thought, this is it. I'm going to be a part of something that I don't want to be a part of. And it's his fault. Or is it my fault? Personal responsibility is a very big thing. And people oftentimes, when something happens, they want to blame someone. And they want to look at the other person and say, look, you caused this in my life. He's like, looking back on it now, Mr. Turner, he kept calling me Mr. Turner. I said, call me Wolf. He's like, I'm not going to call you Wolf. I'll call you Mr. Turner. I said, okay. He said, Mr. Turner, he says, when you look back on it, he goes, it wasn't Mike's fault. It was mine. I could have said no at any time, but I didn't do that. He's like, I was exposed to Christianity at a young age. I rejected it. He's like, and I continued on down that dark road that anybody can fall into and not even know it's a slippery slope. It just keeps, you can't get out. You can't get out of it. You're, you're just, you're stuck. What ended up happening was a living nightmare that went on for almost two decades. He said, the things I've seen and I've heard and done, he's like, it's unspeakable. And living that way is untenable. He's like, it's unsustainable. They have a very high mortality rate amongst their own because they're very, very, very cultish, of course, and they're very untrusting. They'll kill you for anything and make it look like an accident. One of the things he told him was at any given time, we know where you're at, we know what you're doing, we know who you're talking to, because they have this thing they call the hive mind. Hive mind, which is pillared by certain individuals in their group, which, as it turns out, the communication is the most important thing, and those are people that they consider to be not as easily expendable. Those are people who are born with what they call ESP, and Kind of like the Force in Star Wars, they hunt these people down, they find them, and they try to turn them by giving them a series of tests that they don't even know that they're taking. And when it happens, then they approach them and say, hey, would you like to live forever? Which is also a lie. He said that if you choose the route of being a werewolf, you do not live forever. You age slower, but you will eventually die. As a vampire, you can live if you drink certain fluids, not just blood. There's other things, too. And he said, he said, our leader is a vampire. Literally. He, and he's like, he, he thought, I, this is crazy. Uh, a real vampire. And he says, yes, he's a vampire. And I was like, 
He's the leader. 200 years old. He's like, but he's not. He's not even one of the oldest. There are covens, as they call them themselves, a coven. He said there are covens out there, in particular Eastern Europe and then the Middle East, that have some that are like almost 800 years old, 1,000 years. Some of them that know how to do things that would blow your mind. They can die and then inhabit another body. Dark science, dark magic, whatever you want to call it, that goes beyond anything we would we could possibly imagine in our minds that would sound like fiction stories, science fiction, something you would never, ever, you couldn't possibly believe. He said our particular group is considered a newer group, even in the New World, which is what they call this, the New World. He said, and it's funny how much Hollywood loves to portray us on TV, they, they worship us. According to what this guy said, he says, this is one of the guys in the meeting. He said, they worship us. They put us up on a pedestal. People talk about us, but they really don't know. He says, I get a kick out of it. I watched Buffy the Vampire Slayer. This is a guy telling him. He says, I watched Buffy the Vampire Slayer and I laugh. And so he looks at the guy and he this is his initiation, right? And he tells him, he's like, well, what are you? He says, oh, I'm a vampire. He's like, but you've already been bitten. You're already, it's been, the choice has been made for you. Because he says, well, I want to be a vampire. He's like, no, mm -mm. you're going to be a wolf. He says, what is the difference? He goes, not much. You just do things differently. You kill differently. Both have their advantages. Both have their disadvantages. He said, he's like, but we are the soldiers and the enemies of morality. He asked this question. He says, I asked this guy at my initiation. I asked him, I said, why? Why morality? He says, because morality are the chains that, that bind us, that control us, that keep us from having absolute freedom. Sounds a lot like Satanism, right? That's what they do. He said that your beliefs in God and everything else need to be dispelled because God gets in the way of what we want to do. He says, we worship a deity. And that deity's father was the enemy of God. Kind of odd. He didn't say that the deity was the enemy of God, but it is, but the deity had a father that was the enemy of God. And he went on to talk about the Bible and different things and told him how a lot of it wasn't real, you know, and then a lot of it was. And he said that whatever you do, don't talk about Jesus. Don't have crosses in your house. He's like, and don't allow Christians anywhere near you. And then he said, he even said this, he said, and some of them are just false. They're, they're just weak and as evil as anybody you can imagine, and they're easy prey. He's like, but you're going to learn that there are some that are protected. And if you try to attack them, it would be like getting indigestion, like you've never, like, like an acid burning in your stomach. He's like, and even attacking them could possibly kill you. And he thought, well, that's odd. Earlier in this conversation, this guy was telling him how they were the apex predators. And he says, how are we apex predators if we can't even attack some guy that goes to church? He said, I didn't say that. He's like, we attack guys that go to church all the time. He's like, in fact, some of our members go to church. The stronger ones can walk into a church and drink holy water. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Now, did the priest that blessed the holy water, was he, you know, who was he? You don't know. He's like, and then sometimes you'll run across somebody and you'll see them because the light will be shining all around their bodies. He goes, you stay away from those people because attacking them is a death sentence for you. 
He said, what's going to happen to you is not like you would think. And this is the part he told me. He says, Mr. Turner, it is not like you would think. And I said, how do you know that? You don't know what I know. So I asked Gerald. I kind of got smarmy with him. I said, Gerald, this isn't the first time somebody's told me that they're a werewolf. Not the first time somebody's told me they're a vampire. This isn't my first rodeo. He's like, I know. You've been around the block. I said, yep, I have. And he goes, and you know your stuff. He's like, but what you've never talked about, and if you do know this, you've never said it. And he had me on this one. And I'm willing to admit it. He said, you yourself are not the wolf. And I was like listening. And when he told me this, I said, what do you mean? Now, this is the part where it gets really weird. He told me, he says, you are assigned a demon, as you would call it, a spirit. He goes, I know now that it's, it's what it is. He's like, but you're assigned a spirit. And they use a Latin word for it. When I looked up this Latin word, I thought, that doesn't make any sense. But a lot of what they do and say doesn't make sense. They use code, just like they didn't call the entity that they served, that they got the power from. I find out that this demon that they serve, he's not even one of the, he's not the biggest in the pantheon. According to the Mesopotamian tradition, and I'm not going to say its name, his father was a very, very dark, powerful, evil entity that was feared by the Sumerians and the Mesopotamians and the Babylonians. But you wouldn't know this unless you studied that kind of history. So this guy either really knew his history, was a very good liar, or he was telling me the truth. And he told me, he said, this powerful entity inherited from his father these abilities that he could bestow upon his followers. He said there were other demons that people follow and they worship and serve and whatever, and that's fine. They do what they do. We didn't, we weren't at war with them at the time, but at one point they were. They were. They fought these other cults for supremacy. And like I had said before, and I suspected, they don't all play well together. That's a myth that they're all organized and they're all bosses together. That's not that. I knew I got that part right, and I was happy for that. Everybody likes to be right, right? But he told me something that I didn't know and I had never thought of. And what he said was, when you accept this other, as they call it, that's what they call it, he's like, what it does is it attaches itself to you. He goes, you can feel the pressure in your neck. And in your back, in your back arches, and you feel this pain shoot up through your tailbone. And that is where it sticks what they call the stinger. And it latches on to your body. Then it comes out through your chest and becomes a part of you. He goes, you can feel this electric shock feeling going from the tip of your toes to the top of your head. And then he's like, you take a back seat to whatever this is. At first, you don't know what it is. And it begins to look through your eyes and you can hear your voice being used. You can hear the grunting and the growling and this entity, which has just been waiting for a body, is now in charge. You have some control. You have a little bit of say in where it goes and what it does because it needs your nervous system to react and do things. So he goes, you become a part of a symbiotic relationship with this entity. He's told me, he's like, you probably have seen Venom, right? And I was surprised that a guy in his 50s would even know much about that. And I said, yeah, I have. He goes, yeah. He's like, my son used to collect those comic books when I was, you know, when, when I was involved in all this. He said, and I was interested in that because that is what it is. It's a symbiote. Thank you for that donation. We appreciate it. 
And I thought, that is crazy. He also talked about the black goo, which is something that I have encountered, and I know about that. And he wasn't going to fool me with that one, and I told him, I said, I know exactly what that is. He said, oh, I know you do. He's like, I can tell you're someone who has encountered this, and you rejected it. And that's a good thing, because the black goo also goes out and finds people that are willing to accept it. And then, like a homing beacon, we descend and find the people and get them to be involved. He's like, when I talk to someone, I can tell whether or not they've encountered it. And then he went on to kind of insult me, which really I don't like being insulted or threatened. And that almost ended our conversation because he said, you're a very arrogant man, Mr. Turner, because of what you've seen and what you've been through. You think you have all the answers. And he's like, and you're not as tough as you think you are. He's like, you're tougher than, the, than most people. He's like, but against one of us, we'd kick your ass all the way to the moon. At that, I had to laugh. And I said, okay, that's your opinion. He goes, no, that's not an opinion, Mr. Turner. That's a fact. And I said, dude, I will break your back. He goes, right now, if you fought me, he's like, you would kill me. You'd crush me like a bug, like you stepped on a June bug. He goes, I'm old and my, my body's frail. He goes, I'm not nothing anymore. He's like, all I have left are my, is my faith and hope that God forgives me for the things I've done. He said, but in my prime, being what I was, he's like, I would twist your head off and kick it like a soccer ball. That sends chills to me just talking about it right now. I don't know how to answer that. The pride in you says, hey, you know, shut up. You wouldn't do that to me. You couldn't do that to me. I know what I am. I, well, you, don't, you don't know anything about me. And then I thought about it, and I thought, this guy is being very honest. He said, like I said, amongst humans, you're whatever. He goes, but not everybody's a human. There's a lot of weird things walking around out there pretending to be human. He's like, and you don't want to come across it. And I said, I did once when I was 15. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, you did. You're lucky to be alive. He also went on to say that they laugh at the dogman people, you know, whatever, because they're out running around in the woods looking for stuff. He says, and if they ever come across one of us, he goes, it's big time curtains. He goes, there are some that are actually anointed and, and God. And we don't attack them. We don't hurt them. We can't. We can try. But it's a big, big risk. He goes, and then there's some that just go out there running around the woods and they never come back. He goes, and it's one of us or maybe some of the other phenomena out there gets them. So I asked him this question while we were on the subject of the other phenomena. I said, right there, let me ask you a question. I said, Gerald, what is Bigfoot? And he said, very frankly, he says, Bigfoot is its own creature, its own species, its own whatever. Because they don't mess with us. Typically, we don't mess with them. They're a very ancient creature that was created by what I used to call my father. It was created by his grandmother. That was very telling. That's how they explained it. And I said, I believe that they live within the earth. He said, that's very, very, very smart of you because that's where they come from. But a lot of them choose to live in the woods, topside, whatever. And I asked him, I said, have you ever seen one? And he says, no. Never went looking, never cared to. When I asked this guy other questions, some of them he answered and some of them he just kind of balked at. He said, I still have a life left to live. I want to finish seeing my grandkids grow up. And there's certain things that I'm not going to tell you because I don't want you to go and repeat them. He says, you have a show and I know that you're going to go and repeat what I say. And I said, okay. I asked him about a few other things, like 
vampires. Do they fly around with wings, whatever? Absolutely. He says, yes, those are what we call the pure ones. Those are actual vampires that have existed for a long time. And just like their cousins, Bigfoot and everything else, they come from a certain place. Somewhere there was a crossover into humans and their disease was spread. And he called it a disease. He said it is a sickness, not just of the physical body and the corruption of the flesh, but of the soul. He said, and your mind is trying to make sense of everything that's happening. And when this thing took hold of my mind, of my body, of my spirit, he's like, we became one. Have a name? And he said, no, it was not a name. It doesn't give you the name because with the name, you could actually cast it out and reject it. He said, and you're never alone. Never. He said, you could be in the bathroom alone, enjoying your peace, whatever. It's always there looking through your eyes, watching you. And the hive knows, the coven knows what you know. He said, it's a horrible way to live because you have no peace. There is never peace. He's like, your blood pressure will go to points where you would normal people would just fall over dead. And then it drops so low that it's like you're not even alive. He goes, and none of that matters. None of it matters. He's like, medication doesn't affect you. You don't need it. You don't go to the doctor because you don't get sick. And he asked me a question. He says, you ever met a person who doesn't get sick? And I said, I have a few times. He said, yeah, well. You might wonder what they are, because that's not normal. He said, I wasn't sick for 19 years of my life. He's like, I could break a bone, and within days it would be healed. And he asked me if I had ever known somebody who could heal really, really fast. And I said, yeah, actually, I did. And I'm that way. Um, but I'm not like that, like he's talking about. And he said, yeah. But I'm not talking about someone who takes supplements and works out. And he's like, I could break my, my arm. And within days, it would be back to where it was supposed to be. So I could look normal. He's like, and I don't look as old as I should. He says, I look like I'm 40. He goes, I feel like I'm 80. It takes a toll on you. Physically, mentally, and spiritually. That's me talking, not his words. Then he went on to tell me. He's like, the promise that they give you of eternal life is bullcrap. Rarely does anyone make it out. He goes, eventually, they kill you. They do something, and then they bring in new people. He said, to live two decades within that coven was a rarity. He's like, but I was big, strong, and brutal, and I had a body. He's like, and I was addicted to working out. I worked out all the time, which does add to your physical prowess. He's like, and I continually did this. I was obsessed with being bigger and stronger and faster than everybody. He's like, it's not like you become Superman. You're not impervious to certain weapons and things like that. But he said, it is true. There are certain things that you got to avoid. He goes, and I was told salt, silver, certain metals, just you have to stay away from them because they can be lethal to you. And he also told me, he goes, wearing silver wasn't going to kill me, but it could impede what I needed to do. And he also went on to say that if it's injected into his body, it would work as a poison, just like it would anybody up in high doses, high amounts, but it could also impede what he needed to do. And if this thing gets unattached to you, it could kill you. And you don't want that to come unattached because that's your life core at that point. At this point, I'm trying to remember everything he's telling me, which is why I had to have a second conversation with this gentleman. He said everything becomes a part of furthering their aims, their goals, whatever. 
they worked as a wing to help certain people in certain high places. That was their job. And as they did these jobs, they got more and more points with their boss and their boss's boss, and they all moved up and they made more money. He said, I made a lot of money. Lived in a nice house, had the appearance of worldly wealth. He goes, but it was at a price. My soul every day was bleeding to death. He's like, I was living a lie. I had a wife who did not know what I was doing. I fell in love six years after I got involved. We got together. We got married. I eloped. Stupid. I went to Vegas. I went there for a weekend, and I ended up married. He said, I come back, and they tell me, no, no, no. You're not going to be married. So if you want her to live, you need to get rid of her. He said, at this point, I was pretty powerful, pretty strong. And they have a rite of passage type thing where if you can pass this course, then you can move to the next level, and then you can get married. Within the confines of their beliefs, the person that you marry has to be chosen by all of them, not just you. So you can't just go off and marry someone and then think, hey, I'm just going to be with this person and y'all are going to have to accept it. He says, no, that's how you get killed. That's how the people you love get killed. He's like, so to protect the person that I loved, I went rogue for a little while. And eventually they caught up to me. Fortunately for me, even though these people are very immoral, I was very useful to them. And at this point, I was an asset, not just for them, but for higher up people. And they requested me quite regularly to do certain things. So it wasn't even up to his boss or his boss's boss, as I call him. That's not really what he called him, but his priests, to kill him. It wasn't their choice. And somewhere up the chain, they decided to let him have his wife. But the minute that she became suspicious or if anything happened, anything at all changed at all, anything, she says, hey, I want a divorce, I want to go on my own, or if she cheats on you, or if anything goes on, or if she goes to a psychiatrist, or anything at all, or if she goes to church, that's it. You're done. She's done. You're done. Children done. Everything. Are you willing to do that? Can you abide by our rules, our laws? Yes or no? He's like, there is no no, because if you say no instantly, your life is forfeit. So he said, yes, I can do this. Then there was this thing they call a chastisement. And this was really weird because the demon that he was with, that was a part of him, this symbiote, this venom, whatever you want to call it, was also culpable and responsible because the demon was supposed to report to its whatever and be like, hey, this guy is doing this, this guy is doing this, and I'm not. So there was what they call a cleanse, a scorch. And I'm not joking. This is what he said. They did this weird purification thing, and they did they unattached this devil, demon, or whatever from him, and then reattached it. So whatever it is that makes them do all the crap that they do, they can literally make them bend space-time and become monsters or whatever you want to call it, was punished by its cohorts. I'm assuming, I don't know for sure, because I, you know, I asked and he didn't even really know, but my assumption is that there were others that had these attachments and the attachments punished that attachment. I don't know how that works exactly. But then they reattached it and it was like, you better be in, you know, in charge of this guy. Pay attention. The thing that he said you could do, this is weird, that they could actually work deals with their demons. And what they can do is offer it earthly pleasure in exchange for shutting off like a camera that shuts off and not tattling through the coven. 
He said, because we weren't supposed to drink. We weren't supposed to smoke. We weren't supposed to do drugs. He's like, but everybody was doing it. We could take psychedelic, but only certain ones. He's like, and you had to do it in the presence of others, which is when they would have these, what they called life-giving lessons, which essentially were orgies, basically. Giving in to the animalistic desires of whatever the hell you could think of. They would bring in normal human people who were willing to be uninhibited and do whatever. He's like, they loved having sex with us because of our abilities to be like machine-like with it. He's like, you're given these abilities to do human carnality like you wouldn't believe. The opposite sex throws, throws itself at you. You're very attractive. You're very muscular. They love that. And you're very strong, very virile. They used sex magic, basically. And they used blood magic. And not just animals. Not going to get into that. One of the things he said... He's like, drinking blood was ritualistic for us, but for the vampires, it was life. He's like, I always cracked up whenever I'd see a vampire there, like drinking it like wine, you know, and they're, and it's like he knows that they're just imitating it, but that's really what they do. They have different types of blood from different types of situations, whatever it is that they, you know. And he said, it was so bizarre. He's like making deals. You know, you don't speak, but you have these mental thoughts. You go back and forth with your demon. And you tell it, hey, do you want to get high? And it would be like, yeah, let's tune out, as he called it. And they would tune out and they would get high, drunk, stoned, high. He's like, and I did not tell my wife that when we were doing it, this thing was also enjoying her flesh. He's like, it was horrible. He's like, I was literally allowing this thing access to, to everything in my life. He's like, it was like a, a, a friend that you didn't really want, but you were stuck with. He's like, I would go, like you go on the computer. And you're looking at something, and it wants you to look at something or look up something. And some of these things were disgusting and vile. He goes, and I had no control over it. Going on to the dark web to watch murder, things like that. Horrible things. Things that we, as normal people, would vomit from. He's like, as a Christian now, he's like, I would never do these things. You couldn't make me do it at gunpoint. And I told him, I said, that's something that I say quite often. <laughs> I wouldn't do any of those things at gunpoint because it's wrong. It's immoral. It's an abomination unto God. My God is the father of Christ. His God was whatever. He said that you go through these rituals and every week you are going to these meetings to reaffirm your allegiance to these people and to their deity. And he said a lot of cursing of God goes on. You have to renounce him. You have to do all these bad things. And he asked me, he says, can you imagine living your life like that? And I said, no, I can't. And he's like, but a lot of people do it. And they're not even in this cult. And I told him, I said, you're right. A lot of people live their lives spitting in God's face. And they're not even getting anything out of it. Not a damn thing. He made a joke. He said it. I thought of it. He, I rationalized it. He said, Mr. Turner, I rationalized it by saying, at least I'm getting something out of disrespecting him. He said, every day I would see people who would do these things for no reason. And I thought, what a bunch of suckers. He's like, and then it hit me one day. When the council that he had never heard of 
they had a big meeting and they called him forward. And they wanted him to end his relationship with his wife. And this is what they told him. They said, if you don't, you will be punished, possibly executed, and your wife will be taken from you in some form or another. And he told them why. He asked them a question, why? And they told him, she's going to church. And he's like, no, that's not, that's not correct. He's like, she's, she's a pagan. She wasn't really a pagan. Her mother was, and she was raised up in a commune as a pagan, but she really wasn't. And they said that she's been reading the Bible quite a lot. And somebody's been talking to her about the Gospels, and she's been meeting with this person. And it is a man. And he says, anger swelled up in me. He's like, I was so mad I could feel my, my hands felt like they were on fire. He's like, I was mad. I was mad at her. I was mad at whoever this man was. I was mad at these people. I was mad at everybody. He's like, at that point in time, I felt like I could have killed the whole world. He's like, so what I did... I said, give me two days. I'll take care of it. They said, you have one. Come back in 24 hours. He said, okay. He goes to his wife. He confronts her. He says, who is this guy you've been going off and talking to? And she's like, what guy? And she's like, don't lie to me. You've been going and talking to some guy about the Bible and Christianity, whatever. She's like, oh, yeah, I met this guy, you know, and you know, from her job. He's, his wife is my friend. And they invited us to their church. She had not gone yet. This is how they, they even, they knew this. They knew this. And she said, I want to go. And he says, no, that's not possible. You can't do that. She says, yes, I'm going to go. And Gerald says, I smacked her. I lost control. He's like, and I wanted to tell her everything and tell her you can't because of this. You will, you know. But he goes, I couldn't. I was trapped. I was stuck. I couldn't tell her anything about what was going on. I was absolutely trapped. He goes, I had never hit her. She got up off the bed. She started packing clothes and started getting ready to leave. And he's like, and I'm sitting there going like, what, what am I going to do? He asked me that question at that point. He goes, what would you have done? I had to answer him correctly. I said, I don't know. I don't know what I would have done. I said, but I might have just rolled the dice and told her the truth. And he said, that's what I did. I begged her on my knees. I said, please, you need to hear what I have to say. She's not wanting to hear it. He's like, luckily, my wife's a level-headed person. And she stopped and was like, what? She's like, I'm done. You just, you, you put your hands on me. He's like, look. We've been together for all these years. He goes, I've never hit you before. He goes, and it's not about you going to church. It's about what will happen. And she's like, what? She's like, I'm not happy. Maybe I'll find peace. I need God in my life. Maybe I need it. He's like, maybe we all do. And he says, and when I started doing it, I felt like something was gripping my throat like a vice, choking me, keeping me from saying the words I wanted to say. And she's like, I believe in Jesus, okay? I'm sorry that you hate God because over the years she had noticed it. She's like, but I want me and my children to learn about God. She's like, my whacked out mother did everything she could to keep me away from my father who wanted me to know about God. And he died on his deathbed, making me promise that I would get saved and become a Christian. And I want to keep that word to him, if nothing else. I want to know God. I don't want to live in this 
whatever it is. He's like, you have this weird hatred for God, and I don't like it. I don't understand it, and I don't want to know it. And he goes, I got down on my hands and knees, and I was like, he goes, I was crying like a baby on the floor of my bathroom. And I said, honey, please don't leave me. He's like, what I'm about to tell you is going to change our lives forever. Even the retelling of this is intense. So let me. He told her, he says, you don't understand. He's like, I am a part of something. He's like, and then three, four hours later, we're both sobbing and we're crying. And she says, we need to go talk to these people that can help us. And he says, no, if you do that. Their lives will be forfeit. And she's like, they're very devout Christian people. They can help us. And he said, no. No, they can't. Not against these people. He goes, and then something grabbed my body, my soul, and shook me. And it said, yes. He's like, I heard a voice ringing in my ear. And it said, yes, they can. And then he goes, all these thoughts and memories and everything started coming through me and flooding through my body and my mind. And he goes, at that point, I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. There was a guy at the very beginning of my initiation. He hadn't seen him in years, but he goes, I remember him there saying, do not attack the anointed. Don't do it. You can't do it. Well, something's wrong with the signal here, folks. Are you still there? Can you guys hear me? See, I'm talking about this and see what happens. It starts going out. Mm -hmm. I want to thank everybody, even if you're getting here a little bit late. Thank you for those who have donated. Like I said, we're trying to get the money together for the cameras, and I appreciate that everybody's done that. We are talking about someone who gave me a story about being what he calls a shapeshifter, a werewolf. Okay, let me refocus here. So what he said, he goes, I remember. I remember talking to this guy. He goes, and it was told to me at the initiation, they said this. But they didn't go really deep into it because I think it wasn't sexy enough for them to be, hey, we're big and bad and tough, but don't hurt people who like God because then it just kind of doesn't sell. But the other guy, he told me, he said, don't do it. He's like, and I knew witches, real ones, real ones that would put curses and hexes on people and make bad things happen to them. He said, I got into it with one one day. She was a friend of the coven, what they called an associate. And he goes, and she really messed me up with a curse, and my cohorts thought it was funny. So I went to her house, and I put an end to the curse. He's like, witches like to mess with werewolves until it gets physical. He's like, and then some of them can be like you. They can change just like you can. He says, you got to be really careful with that. Yes, you're right, Melissa. You notice that? The screen froze up. This is, I'm, I'm in here alone in my study and I'm getting the chills. So what he told me was really intense. And he said, I begged my wife. I said, do this only if you really, really trust. And she says, you know what? I'm going to tell you something. They asked me to say a prayer with them at work. I did. And he's like, what, what, what prayer? What are you talking about? What, what kind of prayer? And she says, I asked God 
to forgive me for everything that I had done. And she said, I ask Christ to come into my heart and forgive me for my sins and to accept me into his kingdom, amongst other things. And he began to cry. He said, he's like, I'm so happy that you did that. He's like, I want to be free. At that point, when he began to cry, I am an emotional guy. I began to cry too. And I said, look, I am I feel you. I understand what you wanted was freedom. You wanted to be free. I get it. And I said, so what did you do? And he said, Mr. Turner, I rolled the dice. I got in the vehicle and I took off with her. I could feel this other in me watching through my eyes. I could feel it pleading with me to stop because my salvation was going to be its condemnation and probably its destruction because it couldn't stop me. And I told it, no, you're not coming out. You're not coming out. This is not your time. This is my time. This animalistic other that would come out to do the dirty work of whatever these people wanted. And he goes, and they weren't even people anymore. Believe me, they're just demons walking around with human flesh. And he told me. I was quiet at that point, and he asked me, he's like, Mr. Turner, are you still with me? I said, yes, I am. And he said, I want you to know we made it to this guy's house. He had the preacher there of the church. I'm not going to say the name of the church. No, I want to get them, you know. And he got out and he's like, and his wife, Melanie, she's the one that got my wife saved. He's like, we had the kids. They went off and went with the other kids upstairs. There was an older girl there. They took them upstairs. And he says, come inside. And as it turns out, this man that was married to this woman was a former Satanist. But he was not into anything like I was. He had no idea. But he understood the dark arts because he used to do it. And he put his hand on me and he goes, you have a demon on you. And he goes, yes, I do. And he's like, we have to get rid of it. So he called two or three other people. They all came. They came in the middle of the night, like one in the morning. And they came. He goes, and they put their hands on me and they prayed. They prayed. He said, and weird things happened. The lights went out. He's like, and then I laid on this table and I convulsed and they saw a quick flash of what this thing was capable of. And then it split the table that I was on and went down into the ground. And it was off of me. He's like, I rolled over. I fell onto the, to the ground, onto the floor. He's like, I crawled around like a baby. And he said, this man, he knew what he was talking about. And he said very quickly, he says, say these words with me right now. He's like, that thing is still right there. You need to say these words with me right now. He says, in the name of God, come on. In the name of Christ, tell me. He said, come on. He's like, I couldn't do it. I, I was trying. I was trying. And this thing was coming back to me and trying to put itself into my throat, trying to stop me from speaking, squeezing the life out of me, squeezing my throat where I couldn't say what I needed to say. Thank you. Thank you for that donation, Jamie. We appreciate it. And he said, I say this in the name of God, in the name of Christ. He's like, I could barely get the words out. Coming in my heart, save me from my sins. He said, I said it. I rolled over. He's like, and this black goo came out of my nose and my mouth, and I nearly passed out because I couldn't breathe 
because it would go back in and it was choking my lungs and it was coming out. And what looked like a, a black sludge became a smoke and it was like dissipating and they were all choking and coughing. And he said, these people were saying this in the name of Christ. We rebuke you in the name of Christ. They were trying to get rid of this evil that was in me. This thing kept trying to reattach itself. And he was like, I knew that its power was broken. The Holy Spirit came over me, something I had not felt. And it gripped me hard and told me, you're okay. It's over. He said, and I heard a loud voice. And he says, to this day, I don't know 100%, but I feel in my heart that it was the voice of Christ. And it said, you have no power. No power over my children. Be gone. He said, and I felt the presence standing over me of something that was like 30 foot tall, just a very strong. And it said that. You have no power over my children. And now my camera is messing. Mm -mm -mm. Something doesn't want me to talk about this stuff, does it? I got a very good compliment from this man. And I told him, I said, you know, this woman that, that introduced me to the, the guy that introduced us, what are the odds? And he says, oh, I knew. He goes, I wanted you to tell my story because you have an ability. And he's like, that's your job, right? He's like, I've only seen a couple of your shows, but you do a very good job. And I appreciated the compliment. He's like, I also think you're a man of God and you're on the right path. But then he gave me this ominous warning. He said, those that you've dealt with in the, in the past that you've had problems with, he goes, they're not done with you. And he also said, you got a road ahead of you. It's going to be an uphill climb and it may not end good. So you have to do what you have to do while you're here and you're able. He said, because your kind is outnumbered big time. And I asked him this. I said, what do you mean your kind? Because shouldn't it be our kind? And he said, no. He said, I'm not like you. He said, you, and this is what he said. He said, you are a person who always had a pure heart that played a bad guy. He's like, most of my life, I was a real bad guy who did bad things with no remorse he goes, and until that day on the floor, the only person I had ever loved was my wife. I had no feeling for anyone ever in my life. I was a sociopath by every bit of that definition. He goes, I fit it to a T. He goes, and then in the end, something gripped me because I was even willing to give up my wife if I had to. He goes, would you? And I said, no. No, I would die for everybody and anybody that I love in my life. And he said, that's the difference. I wasn't. He said, I had no emotion other than the want to live and do what I wanted to do. He said, up to that point in his life, he had no feeling, nothing. He said, I heard the words, I heard the voice of Christ on that kitchen floor that day in those people's house. They witnessed something supernatural. The guy that was praying over me, a former Satanist, he's like, I had seen these things before, but I never knew. He's like, I told him somewhat of what I had been through. And the story doesn't end there. What ended up happening to him? 
When he goes back home and he told his wife, he says, I have to go alone. You and the children have to stay here. And she's like, no, please, no. He said, I kissed her. What could have been my final goodbye? She's like, Gerald, don't leave. Please stay here. They called the police, told them a little bit. And that there were people that could be after him. He needed to go back to his house to get his clothes and some things and some toys for the kids and whatnot. And um, sure, I'll take that. If you like, talking to my wife, You're wearing one of my shirts. Looks like a tent on you. And he's like, I could use the escort. And then he's like, when I'm walking out with this police officer, when he touched my arm, I knew immediately this was not a person that I should be going with. This was a person who was connected to the hunt. And I stopped and I said, hey, uh, you know what? I forgot something. Let me go in and grab my wallet. I, you know, And he was like, no, 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 no. Let's go. Let's go back to the house. And then there was another police officer who was not part of it. And he was talking to the other people. And in fact, that other officer went to their church. And that officer that was with him told him, no, you're going with me alone. You don't want to make trouble for these nice people, do you? So what he did very brave man. He said, okay. He said, and we're going to go in my car. He had an unmarked squad car there. And he said, let's go. And he said, hey, I'm going to catch a ride with Officer Jerkoff here, dickhead, whatever. And he got in the car with him. And they left. And as they left, he said, I thought that was it. I'm never going to see my family again. But he goes, but if nothing else, he's like, I knew that my soul was saved that night. And that at least I had a good chance of not spending eternity in hell. And so he did. He took off. I'm trying to open this drink and it's becoming very difficult. There we go. Oh, we got it. It's pretty good. It's got like a prebiotic, probiotic, whatever. It's called karma. Funny. Thank you, Nelly, for that. I appreciate it. It's very sweet of you. And so he gets back to his house, and guess what? There's no cars there. He goes inside, and there's six of them right there in his living room. And one of them walks right up to him and kind of sniffs him. He's like, oh, new cologne? <laughs> I don't, I mean, I, I, that was me, my joke, because he said they were making like snide remarks and jokes, and so I'm just kind of ad-libbing there, but they were like, oh, okay. You smell different. You look different. Oh, you're glowing. That newborn smell. He said, and one of the leaders came up to him. Very large male, six foot six. He said, me personally, I'm six five. I'm a big guy. This dude was bigger than me by an inch, inch and a half. Strong, huge guy. He said, because some of them, um, you know, they have an ability and they can make their bodies larger, bigger. They can walk around in that form if they wanted to. He's like, this guy, complete bully, always bullying people, kill people, bad guy, very bad guy. 
He comes to him and he says, I could snap your neck right now for what you did. He's like, and in that moment, he goes, I was emboldened. He said, I don't know who's going to help you do that, but you're not going to do it by yourself. And he's like, well, that's why I brought friends, just in case I can't. He's like, where's your wife? He's like, she's safe somewhere. He goes, oh, she's not safe. And he goes, now I remember why during the initiation they don't tell you not to hurt the anointed. It was a secret thing that this other guy told him. And then maybe you find out on your own, but you learn a valuable lesson. He goes, but I was told ahead of time by a guy that liked to run his mouth. And he said, you can't hurt me. And he says, oh, is that so? Why? And he said, because. I'm protected. And he goes, by who? And they all laughed. He says, by the one most high. He goes, oh, and they gave the name of this ancient demon's grandfather or whatever the hell it was. And he laughed. And he goes, that was my turn to laugh. And I said, no, no, not the false God that you have convinced me is my boss. He's like, but my master, my Lord and Savior, see, his dad is a lot stronger than your God's dad. His daddy, well, he's just a punk. And they were like a gasp. Whoa. Thank you, Larry, for that donation. I appreciate it. And he said, and then at this point, one of them got up, which he knew to be a very powerful warlock. And he was also a vampire-ish person type guy, whatever. Feel weird calling them what they are. But that's what they are. And he comes over to him and he says, you can do nothing to me. And he always walked around with this big stick, like he was Gandalf or something. And he says, and he goes to strike me with it. And it hurt. It physically hurt. And then he goes, there was a moment of doubt. I thought, oh, maybe I'm going to get beat to death. Maybe I'm going to be killed, eaten alive. I don't know. He's like, but vampires, they don't typically try to drink the blood of a werewolf because it's very bad. It's acidic, and nobody likes it. It's demonic blood. They want pure, innocent blood. So he says, so what are you going to do, drink my blood? And he says, no, I'm not going to drink your blood. We're just going to kill you, period. He said, at this point in time, he's like, I had never used this as a weapon in my whole life. And he said, something came over me. That demon was in me, was gone. And there was this spirit. And I knew what it was. He said it was the spirit of God. It was the Holy Spirit of the one most high, the, the father of Christ. And it says, in the name of Jesus, he said, I rebuke you all. And they began to back up away from him. And he, they all began to back up and back up. And he says, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you all. I rebuke you in the name of Christ over and over again. And he was getting in their face and becoming more emboldened. And he said, in the name of Jesus, do something to me. Try. Do it. I dare you. He said, in this pack of demons, shapeshifters, warlocks, vampires, whatever you want to call them, not one of them stepped up. Not one of them. And some biker dude that he didn't even know was standing there, he said, go ahead. Hit me with that chain. I dare you. Go ahead. In the name of Christ. And they all just backed up and backed up and backed up. And then a couple of them left right off the front door saying, oh, we'll be back. We'll be back. Don't worry. This isn't over. He's like, because you can't hurt me. He goes, and even if you take my flesh, he's like, you're going to pay an ultimate price for that. And you know you can't attack us. You know that. You have been lying this whole time. Everything you do is built on lies and fear. And that's why he's like, you, a small group of you can terrorize everybody. And one of them said, you're just part of the sheep. He says, yes. I am. He said, like, I don't even know where these words came from, Mr. Turner. He goes, I don't even know how I got the, the, the gumption. He said that word, the gumption to do it. But he said to me, he said, at that point, 
Christ spoke through me and told them, you have no power over my flock. I am the shepherd that watches. And no wolves are going to take me. He told them. He's like, no wolves, no blood drinking mosquitoes. You're not going to do anything to me. You're going to leave my house. You're going to walk out of here, take all of your familiars and your evil spirits and all of your demons, your attachments, your others, and leave this house. It belongs to God. The one you hate, the one you curse, the one you mock. All the jokes that you've made about Christ. Oh, if he was up on the cross, this is what he said. They would eat dinner and make jokes. Oh, if you're on the cross, why don't you come down and save yourself? Because his death made him more powerful than any being that ever existed. He said, it was like a, an empowerment I had. He goes, go ahead, strike me down. He's like, I felt like Obi-Wan Kenobi he made a joke. He was like, I, I was like, go ahead, strike me down. I'll become more powerful than you could ever imagine. He's like, and you won't hurt my family. He's like, they left. They walked out. He said, I got down on my knees and I just took it all in. And I expected there to be some serious retaliation. And I got some weird phone calls and a few weird messages left in my mailbox. Sometimes somebody would drive by my house. He's like, but nothing. Nothing. He's like, in this day, to this day, I don't. I don't hear from them. I don't talk to them. He's like, I ran into one of them at the grocery store one day, and she looked the other way. As he called it, a very powerful she-wolf. She was a very bad person. He's like, but I didn't even balk at her. I stared at her. I looked her dead in her eye. I was like, go ahead, say something to me. And he's like, you have no power. And this is what he told me. And I said, let me ask you this. Why me? Why do you want to tell me this? And he did give me the compliment. He said, you tell the story very well, and you'll convey it very well. He said, like recognizes like. And he said, I was a very no-nonsense guy. He said, and I can respect that. He said, what would you do in the face of this evil? And I said, I would look it in the eye. Do what you did. And he said, that is why I respect you. He said, looking it in the eye, he goes, and you, he goes, so I've been told because I haven't watched all of your shows. He goes, but I've been told that you tell people to rebuke these things in the name of Jesus. And I said, I do. He said, you believe it? And I said, I absolutely do. He said, because they have no power. When faced with the armor of God, this is my words, no weapon formed against you will prosper. In fact, I see Dana Ortega in here in the, in the chat. Dana had sent me those messages during the war that I had with these people. Some of them were, were doing black magic on me, folks. Real, it's real. Spiritual warfare, hardcore. We were fighting back and forth. I had to go around my house and cleanse it. I'm under no illusion. I, as a man, I'm just a man. I can't cleanse my house. I can't use sage to make the demons go away. But in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you, works. I get goosebumps when I say that. Say it with me. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. Get rid of it. Because that's what they do. That's how they get you. That's how they hamstring you. They don't like when you do that. 
Kind of like that scene in the, what is it called? Men in Black, where he kills the bug and he's like, stop that. <laughs> don't do that. Exactly. It offends them. It is very offensive to them. They don't like it. And I'll say this too. Here's what's weird. I don't have a camera lit in here. I just have a lamp right there. And you can see it flickering. I don't know why. A lot of weird things happen when you talk about these things. And I knew that there was going to be an aggravation, upsetting, whatever. Joanne says, I use Jesus Christ's only holy name against my dog, man. And Kennedy really took his name and had a bad effect on it. It started backing up slowly into the woods and fire just came out of its mouth. Joanne, I'd like for you to contact me. See, people, there are people in our community who believe that these things are nothing but evolutionary beasts, monsters that roam the earth as some sort of animal, but they're not. They're really not. And they hate the fact that you talk about them as being shapeshifters, as being werewolves. You know why? Because their minds are poisoned. They're poisoned, and they're poisoned to our community. And people are constantly telling me to shut up and stop talking about this. You sound crazy. When I was writing my book, I was threatened again. Not only have these people emailed me multiple times when I did the show. Well, there have been multiple shows. Texas Wolfman was one of them. There was a bunch of them that I've done on these werewolf creatures. Typically, when I talk about werewolves is when I get threatened. I can call a dog man and... Talk about people seeing him in the woods or put somebody on the show that says, yeah, I saw it in the woods and blah, 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 blah. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. But when I call them with it, everyone loses their mind. You get called crazy. They make fun of you and they say that you're evil, you're this, you're that, and you're blah, 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 blah. But when a man gets in touch with me and pours his heart out to me and either tells me one of the greatest stories that's ever been written in the fiction world or he's just what he says he was, a simple man who got caught up in something akin to a nightmare and was delivered by God through his Holy Spirit and his son, Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. and cried on the phone to me and asked me to retell the encounter. And I was going to wait until next Sunday. And he was urgent, and he said, do it now. And I said, why? And he said, just please do it now. It's kind of ominous, a little, little spooky, I'm not going to lie. But if... Something were to ever happen, you know, you heard the story. That's it. There it is. We'll call him Gerald. Thank you for giving me your story, Gerald. And I appreciate your honesty, your openness. Can I say 100% that everything he told me was the absolute truth? No, because I'm a physical man and I cannot read his mind. Did it appear that he was being completely honest with me? Yes, it did. At the risk of sounding like a crazy lunatic here at uh, 1230 at night on in Central Texas. 594 people in the chat. Now we just, Joe Breezy just showed up. You're running late, Joe. I see Larry Fisher in here. I see Jules, Overbuild Automotive. My people, my family, my base. Philip Barnes. Croatian, you people show up. And I think that that was one of the things. He didn't tell me this, but I'm going to assume that this is one of the things he wanted me to tell this to an audience. And he predicted something. And if you're listening out there and to your friend, um, Nathaniel, his buddy, if you guys are listening, You were right. 
absolutely right. He told me, he says, go and tell that story and you'll have five, 600 people no matter when you tell it because it's going to happen. And he's right. At first, I thought, okay, whatever. Monday night, late, how many people are going to be up to listen to something? Things happen for a reason, folks. <clears throat> if you're out there and you're living in this world, and not to sound like a preacher because I'm not, but if you're not anointed, you're not living with the armor of God, you're not part of the flock, you need to get yourself right because that's the only way. Gerald's story sounds crazy. It sounds like something out of a Stephen King's book, whatever, but I'm not a fiction writer and neither is he. And I could tell he is what he says he is. He's a welder by trade. He told me, he says, I've done a lot of bad things in my life. A lot of things that I'm sorry for. He's like, but God has given me new life. He's like, and now my wife knows the truth and I don't live with the pain and suffering of living a double life. He's like, I thought about writing a book. And then I thought, I don't want to draw more attention to myself. He said, you, Mr. Turner, are out there on the forefront of this. He goes, you're in the spotlight. You're telling people the truth. He's like, and I watched your show, and I heard you talking about being attacked, and I thought, there it is. He's like, it's going to continue to happen. He's like, you're like me. He's like, but your kind is way different. And he always made that distinction. He's always saying about your kind, whatever. And I reminded him of something. And I told him, I said, Gerald, you're not a werewolf anymore. And he was like, touche. So folks, if you have any questions, Put them in capital letters, and I'll answer a few questions before I run. I appreciate everybody showing up, and I appreciate everybody who donated tonight. And um, this is someone's encounter. It's not my story. It's not. I didn't write this story. It's not an AI-generated fraud, makeup, believe, whatever these people are doing. I don't do that. These aren't uh, fiction, fantasy book stories or whatever. Um, I don't have the rights to this story. And, uh, you know, it is what it is. He wanted this story to be put out there. Wendy Eater says, Wolf, have you heard about the cannibal gangs roaming in Haiti? <laughs> They're doing it here in Austin. Are you kidding me? That's here. And yeah, I know uh, Haiti. It's yeah, it's a mess. Believe me. In fact, Stefan, our uh, my godson, he's he's from Haiti. What sort of stuff is happening to you or your home? Oh my gosh, during this war or just in general? During the war, we had people come into our house, astral project, and they tried to build an altar. Well, they did, but it was destroyed recently. Um, they went around our house and basically in astral form and, you know, told another one of their people what they saw and they were pretty damn accurate. So, yeah. so we had to do a cleanse in the name of Christ, get rid of it. The St. Benedict is very powerful. It's a very strong. I use it. Uh, Joe Van Dorp says, key points tonight, screen freezing during story. Yes. <laughs> yes. 
Uh, are we getting more immortal stories? I, I don't really have. Uh, I mean, since I, got, I had that one episode, I haven't really. I've gotten one person who's reached out to me claiming to be an immortal. That That is the only thing I've gotten. I don't have any other thing than that. Yes, Jim, he was. And this man told to perform a blood ritual. Of course he did. I didn't want to get into all that because I don't want because because literally I've heard people on the internet talking about what it is and how you do it. I'm like, don't do that. I mean, J.K. Wolf, do you think that Sasquatch is possibly also a shapeshifter? Very possible. I talked to a, a person from the Ute tribe years ago um, who was a friend of mine's grandfather, and he basically told me that uh, Sasquatch is there's a Sasquatch, and then there's something that mimics it. That's what he says. But who knows? There's different different versions of it. Love Cat says, questions in all caps, please. Yes. Do you have any questions? that Because you may think of something that I didn't tell you that I forgot about to, to tell you. I'm pretty sure I got it all. But um, I thought it was important. Lead Tracker E, everyone should cleanse their home regularly. Exactly. Caitlin McLean says, uh, so he wasn't a werewolf anymore. He wasn't a werewolf anymore. No, he was not. How long ago were you told this story, Josh? Recently. We can say that. <clears throat> Roisha says, thank you for the message, Josh. Everything is relevant and nothing is a coincidence. Yes, exactly. Quantum Potential says, I need to decompress. I'm scared out of my mind tonight. Be careful what you wish for, 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 right? Maybe the next episode can focus on training, lifting, pumping, iron, diet, nutrition. Come on, dude. Victor Collado says, if Josh, did you ask him about aliens? Actually, no, I didn't. That didn't come up. I thought about it after I had, you know, the second conversation was me just going over the talking points that I had gotten from the first conversation and it was just him going and kind of checking off everything that we had talked about. And I said, okay, good. I got it. And he said, do you need to read it back to me? And I said, I don't read it back to you. I got it. So hopefully I did a good job, Gerald. I'm sure you're listening, but if you, um, if you don't think I did, well, we feel free to call me and complain. Um, yes. Grim Van Helsing. There's power, power in the name of Jesus. That's absolutely right. Jim Bob says, have you heard of werewolf covens before this man's testimony, vampire covens also? Yes and yes. Yes, absolutely. When I had mentioned it to his friend, who did listen to my show on a regular basis, only the podcast, though, he did not know much about the live stream. And so we talked about it. And he said that, <clears throat> fortunately, Gerald actually watched two of my live streams completely. Robin, yeah, we're going to try and do more of that, but I need to buy camera equipment. So that's one of the things I'm waiting on. And I got to have money to that I can allot to do that. I had to do a revamping of our studio. Our other cameras were getting old and we had to re we had to buy a new computer and all kinds of stuff. And that blew our budget for the damn near the year. And so we just had to redo everything. And then we've just now have an issue with our studio where we keep the storage where we keep all the this, this stuff and unfortunately the lick the lighting is out and we tried to put the new bulbs in you can't do anything so in order to go in there to find the shirts and the whatever we got to have a flashlight to look at so it's a mess so right now we have to have somebody uh, uh, one of our uh, what do you call them contractors come and fix it These astral projectors are very true and annoying. Do you get these attacks when you're sleeping? Yes. They try. They mostly attack people around me. Um, I'm not saying like I'm a badass. They don't hurt me. You know, none of that. But that's, that typically doesn't work on me. 
So they were doing it to people around me and they were doing it to, to other people. Martin and his wife had problems, but Bettina had problems. Um, several people in my circle, you know, inner circle, um, that did have some issues with people doing that. Wendy Eater, was Gerald doing work for politicians or corporations? He didn't say. Um, I'm assuming that he probably did some some things for people. There's a lot of bad people doing a lot of bad things. General Nuts, should, should I get rid of the Slayer shirt with pentagrams? Okay, that's a good question. I don't agree with your name because I'm not going to read that, but uh, um, Larry Fisher says, Josh Turner, great message tonight. I wish I had 100 to give. Don't worry about it. Larry, you're a friend. Um. Everybody that donates donates what you give. That's that's all you can do. That's all you can do. I'm not asking for anything. Joe Breeze says, Wolf, I got good advice on camera equipment for cheap, and I know the tech size. Hit me up if you want. Thank you. I know a lot of techs can do all that, but I, I do. I actually, I want to do a nighttime investigation with you, Joe. You're you're close by. So there's a few people that live you know in this area that I do want to go out and do some stuff with. And I would like to go out with people who are, Good Christian people who are anointed, and we won't so we won't get attacked. That's a good thing. That was one thing that I did gain from this conversation that I had with him. Um, and he's going to get me in touch with another person. And get this: <laughs> this person was a vampire. So, hope, hope. I know it sounds cliche, but interview with the vampire, right? I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe I can get in touch with this person. Um, maybe not. I don't know. His name is Joel. That's all I know at this point. I don't know anything about the guy. I just know his name is Joel, and they've known each other for years. And he helped him get out of yes, a part of this thing that they do, which I know the name of, and I'm not going to say it because I don't need these people coming down on me or even trying because even if they can't hurt me, they can try to hurt people around me that I care about. I don't need that. Uh, let's go here. It says, uh, Wedge Antilli says, it explains a lot about why people in positions of power do such awful things. And yes, exactly. So in your question, General, uh, should I get rid of a Slayer shirt with Pentagram? I used to be a big fan of Slayer. I actually like their music. I like their 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 whatever. Uh, but it is very negative, and they do sing about a lot of things that are kind of negative. Um, they don't necessarily just sing about devils and demons and stuff like that, but their imagery is very bad. And yes, I would, if I were you, get rid of the pentagram or anything that has 666 on it, like the Iron Maiden Trooper, because they had that album and that song about the 666, the number of the beast. And I know that the song is actually about uh, evil witches doing a, a ceremony or whatever, and somebody stumbling upon it and seeing it, whatever. They still, they, if you put that number on there, like Iron Maiden did on the trooper, I just recently threw away my two trooper shirts. It hurt me, but I had to do it. Um, I still like the band sometimes. Uh, maybe, you know, every now and then, I like the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, maybe a few of their songs, but I don't listen to them too much anymore. Alexander the Great, very good song. Uh, Chris uh, Arroyo. Uh, Tom Arroyo, I'm sorry. A very, very uh, nice guy. He actually doesn't live far from me. He lives about 90 miles away. And um, he is claims to be a Christian, but of course, you know, he doesn't, they, they're retired now. They don't sing, whatever. And he said it was all theatrics. It was, there was nothing behind it. And, um, you know, kind of like Kiss or whatever, but I don't, I don't listen to their music anymore. I just don't. It's a negative, got a negative megahertz to it. I don't do it. And I wouldn't keep anything around. I used to have a, a, a Vermont, the the whatever, the, the the Slayer with the pentagram thing, whatever. I used to have that poster. I got rid of it. I don't, I don't participate in anything that has pentagrams or any kind of imagery that could be used by the dark ones at all. So in, to answer your question, and thank you for the donation, um, no, I would not keep it around. I would get rid of it. Chris Rideout says, the first time that I ever heard a wolf man getting saved, glory to God. Yeah, well, I guess it does happen. Uh, 
Jim Bob says, have you ever heard of government hunters, soldiers that go and kill werewolves and dogmen? Yes. Jose Luis Mendoza. Hey, Josh, can you explain the silver cord? Thanks. Uh, let's see what we got time for. And thank you for that uh, other do uh, $2 donation. Appreciate it, uh, General. He says, like the band and shirt, but spiritual warfare. Uh, it's good to see so many good people in here tonight. Okay, so if you guys want to hear about the silver cord, I will, I'm will. i going to tell you. Uh, the silver cord, I will explain to you what it is. The silver cord is the attachment from your where you're born, your umbilical cord. And when you are out of your body, it is attached to your your astral body, your your basically what you look like as a human is an avatar and when you are out of your body in this realm and through the, what we call the astral plane that's the intermediate zone okay not going to get into a big explanation but that silver cord is attached to your umbilical cord your physical body you can go anywhere and everywhere and it'll stretch as far as it needs to but if it gets snapped or cut you're dead simple as that uh, protect that. If you're out of your body and you find yourself out, you need to make sure that that doesn't break. So, then people have different ways that say that you can protect it and this and that. I'm not going to get into a big old dissertation because we'll be here all night. Um, Joanne says, I tell people don't underestimate the powers of Satan. If you're in the dark arts, Four, four years, you have a choice to become a vamp or werewolf. Most use vamps due to the transfer into werewolf is so painful. Okay, now that is something that I can attest to. Not that because I'm not a werewolf. Okay, don't don't get me don't get it twisted. I can attest that that it supposedly is painful. But what I was told by Gerald, it's not as painful as you think it is. There's not like the Hollywood where their bones are popping and snapping. And I said this on the show the other night, and they're over there like, oh, 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 you know, for hours or whatever. And you're watching the movie, right? And, and you're sitting there going like, why? Why don't you grab something and hit them? Why don't get, you have time while they're flopping around in Hollywood? Go get lighter fluid and get you know, you know, whatever. Burn them up. What are you doing? I mean, in, in, in my time, I would just. And I'm going to be real honest with you. This is going to sound completely cuckoo bananas, but I have pistols and I have silver rounds. Ask my friend Nick Valente if you think this is a joke. It's not a joke. And I know several people in this field who do go out with dragon's breath and incendiary rounds, and they do use silver. Silver doesn't tumble well, so you're going to have to do it at close range. Okay? Who wants to get that close to a creature like that? Not me. But... If you are a one dark one that does whatever they do, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, silver will hurt you, okay? Uh, you can also get your your head blown off by a shotgun. That's absolutely a real thing. But I will say this. Silver is very, very hard to hit something at a distance. It's not going to tumble very correctly. Copper is a good one too, though. These metals, gold, very powerful. I wear gold. Um, and Dana says, go and get rid of the pentagram shirt. Yes. Um, but I've heard that it's it's painful to trans to transform, but the vampire, the, the one of the things is easier, access easier because you don't have to become, you don't have to whatever. And the werewolf needs more room. OK. And when he was waiting, this is part of what Gerald's story was. Gerald told me that when he was waiting to change the first time, he waited for like three days and nothing happened. So then he goes outside and he starts feeling all weird. And when this thing took over, then he ran into the woods and it happened. You know, uh, that's why the, it's a myth when they say that you can't control it. Like they said, that oh, you become a werewolf and then you just start going eight crap and throwing yourself everywhere and you can't control it and you have to be chained up. Now, there are some that do that. There is even a story that was told on Paranormal Witness or Paranormal uh, what's it called? Paranormal uh, there's a couple of them. Paranormal something or another. 
But anyway, th there was a show that was told on that, and Mr. Ballin did one on that. If you don't know who that is, go check him out. There's a lot of true crime and a little bit of supernatural. But uh, there was a story that he did about three years ago, and it was about that. And it was this werewolf, and, and it was chained up. Now, that happens too. And and I'll tell you another thing. If somebody's eyes glint in the, in the, in the sunlight, a, a yellowish amber color, I was told by more than one person that that is a possible werewolf. Um, there are different ways to tell what somebody is uh, if they are. And I know this sounds, like I said, cuckoo bananas, but I'm one of the few people who's willing to sit up here and tell you that they exist. Would I have said this uh, five years ago? No, maybe not even two years ago. Knowing what I know now, yeah, I, I just there's too much evidence that for me anyway, and not the evidence like you know you're going out and being able to track it with science, but just that says that hey Panzer, don't do that. No, 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 I can't. No, no, no. He wants to come. No, he wants to come in. Um, what you have to do is is be open minded and understand that evil is a perversion of man and, and twisted, turning yourself into an animalistic uh, avatar of, of of demonic proportions. This is something that people really do. They really do this. I used to work out with a guy named Frankie. Please call him Frankie. He said, "Dude, my brother's a werewolf." He used to joke around about all the time. He died years ago. He used to take steroids. It's a, it's an unfortunate thing. I never would touch the juice, um, but he was a lot stronger than me, and he it's because he juiced. And he said, "My brother's a werewolf, and he can lift an amazing amount of weight." And I went to their house one day. This guy came out, and he was very bestial looking. I'm not joking. And I watched him bench press 700 pounds. At that time, I was benching about 450. Um, wow, it was incredible. And um, when I asked him that question, he jokingly, I jokingly said that he looked at me and he gave me this look like he wanted to rip my throat out. I said, oh, OK, I'm just I was a young guy. I was I'm just kidding. I, you know, I don't know you. Um, so I just kind of was like, all right, I believe you. I was like 18 something. Um, was he? I don't know. I have no idea. But uh, I, it made me wonder. It really did. Because the guy, when he was lifting, he looked like a beast. Uh, and I've seen a lot of people lift weights, but this guy just looked monstrous. But uh, anyway, the, you're right, Joanne. A lot of them, there are more vampires running around in human form than there are werewolves because the, there's a misconception. But let it be a misconception because we don't need more of them running around. So it's much easier just to go and have to drink the blood and do whatever they do than to actually become a werewolf. But you do have a, an element of control. This other basically takes over and does, and it knows when to do it. It's not like you're going to be at the HEB, that's our grocery store here, and someone's going to go, blah, you know, and then you're going to be like, oh, my gosh. You know, I was looking at cereal, and look what happened. Guy turned into a freaking werewolf, right? And That's not how it works. That's not what happens. They go out and they do what they do. And if you're unlucky enough to be running around in the woods doing boots on the ground, you might run into one. And that's not good. Unless, of course, you're strong in your faith. Been eating your Christian Wheaties. That's all I can tell you. Peace Frog says, I used to love Slayer. I did too. Not so much anymore. Music industry is evil. Yes, it is. That's why we make our own music. Go to Paranormal Soundtable. We have now, I think, eight songs in our library. We plan to have at least 20 by the end of the year. That's my goal. Uh, no need to add extra energy. I dig it, but it's leaving the door cracked, and there's no need to have extra negative baggage. I don't know what he's talking about there. Um, if you're asking, you probably already know the answer, not being a smart mouth, but just saying, I think you're being convicted by the Holy Spirit, probably. Melissa says, we have followers of demons and satanic and I don't go, oh, yes, goodness gracious, I'm telling you. Any stories of vampires getting saved by Jesus? That's what I'm going to talk about next because according to what Nathan well, Nathaniel's his friend that got me in touch with him that from the woman that, that had the thing she saw in the, grocery, in the gas station. That's how I met this guy. That's how you communicate. You meet one guy, you meet another, another gal, and you meet another gal, another guy, and that's how you meet people. That's how you do it. But this person that gave me this story, okay, Gerald, which is not his real name, Gerald, he's going to introduce me to a guy named Joel. 
And Joel supposedly was a vampire, and supposedly he will, we will get into that. I would have loved to have put this episode uh, that I just did on the podcast because it reaches more people. It would have reached way more people because it reaches all of the people on the podcast platforms, which there's 16 platforms or 15, whatever it is. There's like, say, I don't know, 80,000, whatever it is. And then, but there's only 32, five or six on here on, on YouTube. But I was told to hurry up and do it. I needed to do it. And so I did it. I don't know why. He just said, we need to do this. Do it now. And I said, okay, I did. And so I did it. Uh, your astral body is huge and white looking. Well, I can't read what you're saying there. You pop out awake. Very smart. Joe Breezy says, I threw away my shirt. Shirts that have negative symbols, even though I don't give them energy. I just need to, uh, it says, he says, I, don't, I just don't need the energy they bring. Absolutely. That's how they said they off Anton LaVey, a face in the crowd. Are you talking about how they cut his silver cord? Because that's what I've heard. Jules says, Wolf, I have been, Wolf, I've been astral projecting since I was a kid. Devil, heathen. I've been, <laughs> okay, I'm just kidding. Wolf, I've been, I've been astral projecting since I was a kid, but I never saw a silver cord. What does that mean? You don't always see it. It's there. It doesn't mean that you, you know, that it's not, not real. Now, you can go into another phase where you become like a ball of light and you see in all directions. That's a no, whole nother level of, um, it's like you're, it's just like you're completely into another level of, um, consciousness and that's a, another, uh, density and it's something else. Silver buckshot is better. Yes, actually that, thank you for saying that wedge, because that is something my great uncle used to actually do that. And I always wondered what that, why he did that. I would go out to his place. He was always, he was in avid deer hunter, the whole family out there were, were, were hunters. And th during uh, Thanksgiving, the turkey was always something that somebody had shot and killed. This was my uncle Buck. And I know that sounds funny because John Candy played a movie called Uncle Buck. He was my dad's uh, uncle from his mother, his real mother. And um, his mother, my dad's mother died before he was like two years old or something like that, or when he was two. And Buck used to make Copper and silver buckshot. I never knew what it was for. But there were dogmen in that area. And in fact, I had a couple friends who went out hunting, and I told those stories on DER. Um, and they hunted out there, and they ran into, one of them ran into a crawler. The other ones ran into uh, three dogmen. Three dogmen. I've told that story before. To this day, I actually talked to one of them maybe about a year ago at Arash's bar, and Arash was there. We were all there. Scorpion D, everybody. Um, I believe Nelly was with us too, I think. And we were all sitting there. I don't remember. It was one of the times where right before I stopped drinking, so it must have been about a year and a half ago. And uh, I would drink every once in a while as a social drinker, whatever you want to call it. And um, the guy was reiterating his story. He had just gotten out of prison not too long ago for the second time. Because he was somebody I knew back in the day, you know, and he was always in trouble. But he said when he was in the joint, as he called it, he said, I had a story. And I have that story and I'm going to try and reach out to him now that you've reminded me and talk to him and tell him, Hey, give me that story that you had from the guy from the joint, the guy who lived in Illinois and he had a dog man encounter that was crazy. Um, he ended up crawling up under a car and this thing was trying to pull him out. There were two of them. So, or they were werewolves because they do exist. Jim Bob says, I believe the movies will show us these things, but we'll call it entertainment. That's exactly what they do. They do that with everything. Overbuilt Automotive says, Josh, do that again. Laugh out loud. I needed that. <laughs> Made me smile. Josh, impersonate the werewolf movie change. Like that? Yeah, there you go. Probably freak everybody out right there. Thank you, Josh. Great show. 
And that's assuming they can't shift interdimensionally to avoid a bullet. Exactly. We don't know, Joe, do we? I've never shot at one. At least I don't think I have. Copper rounds, yeah. The same company that makes dragon breath shells also make armor piercing incendiary three inch shells. Yes, because if anybody knows the Hernandez Ranch, now me and my people have been out there and we've talked to somebody named Noah. Now, Noah is the brother of Abel, who Abel was the one that raised stripes. At least he had them for a while till he got bigger and let them go. That was back in the 60s and 70s, whatever. Noah uses those on a regular basis to keep out what he calls the pack. He shoots at them into the tree line. Now, I would think he was an absolute nutbag, crazy man, and I kind of do. I still think he's a little off. He was a Vietnam vet, and he did a lot of uh, stuff when he was in Vietnam. But there's some truth to what he says, because when we were out there and it was starting to get dark, we heard the noises. And I was not interested in sticking around. We left. I don't know how he can live out there amongst those things. This is another thing the late J.C. Johnson talks about, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later in the week. We'll come on and we'll we'll do this. He talks about how some of these shapeshifters change. Well, they get stuck. And that's a question that I asked Nathaniel, who told me, you know what? Ask my friend. See what he says. He goes, but I, be I believe I remember him saying that that can happen. So when we started talking, we got into the, the conversation. I forgot to ask Gerald about that. And I apologize. But I did ask his friend, and so he did tell him, and I think he's going to email me about it, and we're going to talk. And that be what some of these dogmen that are like that all the time, could that be what's going on? They go out there to shift, shape, whatever, do, do whatever they do, and they get stuck. And then they become what we call dogmen. They're just like that all the time, blah, blah, blah. I did ask this question. I told him, I said, when you change, do your legs look canine? He said, yes. And he goes, what you saw when you were 15, because I talked a little bit about what I saw. He said, it was that was it. That, you looked like a werewolf. That was it. Like something you would see from Hollywood. He goes, and you could also become a, just a straight up giant wolf and run around on all fours, but it was a lot harder to achieve that. And he said that, uh, and he didn't say anything about people being stuck that way, and I didn't ask, but he said that uh, he knew some people who just chose to just stay that way for long periods of time. And at that point, well, I should have done my due diligence and asked, but I didn't. Sorry. Um, I will be a little more careful in the future when I interview people and ask those questions. I have a lot of people to interview, hundreds, if you can believe that. I'm not joking, and I need to get on the ball. But duty calls, and I have a job. And if more people would send me money, then I wouldn't have to work, and I could do this. Get all this information to you. People don't appreciate it. your stupid self. Just kidding, folks. Uh, X says, are there ways to tell if someone you meet is a vampire? That I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I was given a few tips about werewolves, not vampires. I don't know. That is a good question. That's the kind of questions we need to ask Joel. I really wish that we could get these people on the show, but that's the thing. They, after I'm, I understand why they don't want to do this because if it's, you know, they've been through that kind of stuff. You know, there are some people though online who, who, who I've seen who will are talking about this and they don't seem like they're too um, out of the, like they don't seem like nutbags. They're just telling you what's, what's what. Um, but you know, people classify it as some kind of goofy, you know, make believe fiction, whatever. Mr. Ballin lives in mine and Wolf's backyard. He's in oh, Mr. Ballin's in, in my backyard now. He's in Austinite. I should try, I should probably try to hit him up. Uh, you know, he's got a massive channel, but I saw his billboard the other day. But you know, Joe Rogan and me have like mutuals, and I still haven't talked to him. And it's not for I mean, I haven't tried. I mean, I just I haven't tried. And but I mean, I was also, and this is true. I was offered to be on the unexplained and I turned it down. I know people think that's crazy. I've also been offered to be on coast to coast and I didn't do anything about it. That people think is nuts. 
Okay. And I was offered to be introduced to Joe Rogan and I didn't take it up and I didn't do it. And it's not because I don't want to go and be on coast to coast or I didn't want to be on the unexplained or because I didn't want to meet Joe Rogan, but because I don't have time. If you only understood how much time I have, and I devote a lot of my spare time to doing this and talking to you. And in fact, today I had a very, very important call, a very important call with a group of friends, people I call family, really. And um, I did something hastily and I because I was kind of worried. I didn't know what was going on. And I, I got upset with some people today. And so we had to have a conference call. And that takes time, too. You know what? It, 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 when you have to do and deal with things like that, that took hours of my time out of my day to do all that stuff today, it kills me because I have to do a bunch of things to catch up. I have clients I have to deal with. On top of everything else, folks, I've got to tell you, we're at war with these people. I'm not joking about the people online that were talking all the crap. I don't care about them. I'm talking about these, these homeless camps out here. These people are out of control. And one of them and their leader has vowed to kill me. And if you think I'm joking, I'm not. Scorpion came on the phone the other day and he talked about it. I think it was uh, Friday. Was it Friday? I think it was Friday. Friday night, I think it was. I was on with Rai Voss from Codega's uh, Cabinet of Curiosities or Codega's Curious. Uh, I forgot his name. It was a Rai Voss' show. Um, I'm so sorry, Rai. I can't remember right now. But the, the, just so much going on. So Rai Voss was on, and then Shane Michael Chris from West Coast Dogman Project, and they were on with me on Friday night. Go check it out. And Scorpion, at the beginning of the show, he talks about what what is going on with these people. One of them I call Queen Boudicca because she thinks she's the boss, and they're very bad people. And one of them did actually come at me and try to kill me. He said he was going to do it, and he attempted until I stopped him. And Anthony and Nelly were witness to that. My life is... It's not a movie, but it's it's very uh, it's not normal. Let's put it that way. I don't live a normal life, and it just I, I was destined to not do that. And so I, I you know, <laughs> Eric Palacios wants to follow me around with a camera and see what I go through on a nightly basis. Believe me, um, Larry's worked for me. He knows that there are some places that we work at that are dangerous. The East Side. He worked at the East Side. There's some bad people. Um. He's worked at the wall, which is more or less peaceful now, but it wasn't at one time. And you never knew what was going to come crawling out of those woods. And I'm not joking. Okay. So. Sarah Jane says, what about the people he bit and and they were then cursed? How can he help them now? Well, that, here's the thing about that. I did ask about that. And I'm glad. That's a very good question. I told him, I said, do you bite someone and then they become a werewolf? And he says, yes and no. And now here's the, the weird answer. <laughs> he says, it's their choice. Now, some of them choose and they reject it like it's a poison. And then they have no, they, they can't control. They, there's nothing they can do. And if you're the one that did it, you can control them. But there again, they can't be a, a, a person that's anointed. Um, they can, if they're fake or they're weak in their faith or they accept Christ, but they truly don't really accept it. And it's just a lip service thing. Then they can be taken down. And he said that some people, even Christians will lose their faith and, and turn against God and become the evil. Um, he said that these people in particular are not ever trusted fully because they were once anointed or they, they rejected their anointing. So they're kind of like traitors to their own kind. So they're never fully, uh, and they're usually culled. So one of the things that was told to me was that there is a weird thing that can happen where when you choose someone to mark them, or if they come to you and they know about it and they want to be marked or chosen, because that can they can do it through blood, saliva, and other bodily fluids in exchange, basically. And it's a disgusting process that they can take on this ability it is kind of like being baptized. Now, being baptized isn't going to get you into heaven, and it's not going to send you to hell, not being baptized. But it is what Jesus said to do because Jesus came down in the flesh to show us the word of God made flesh, the son of God, the anointed one, the one most high, the son of the one most high, right? So that being said, God needed to show himself in the flesh, which is Jesus in the flesh, basically the word made flesh. So Jesus did a physical baptism from his cousin, John the Baptist. 
in the Jordan River. He was baptizing people, and that is where Jesus was baptized. And he was told, basically, he told us, this is what you do, because it is a physical covenant that represents the spiritual covenant. The spiritual covenant is much more important, because you're actually giving your soul to God. The baptism is sort of a physical thing that people need to see and look at and feel. And so there it is the same thing. It is the opposite. It is the flip side. It is the bad. These people, what they do is a sort of physical baptism, which is this accepting of the blood and all the other crap that they drink and do and whatever. And then the spiritual acceptance, though, is when they accept that evil, uh, the darkness, which goes and becomes a part of them. But you're never really given free will, although they love to talk about free will, this and that bull crap. They're actually given some sort of like, you know, snitch that goes inside of them. I heard somebody say, I saw it in the comments about a snitch is what it is. It's right inside of you. And it kind of really takes over. And that is the control mechanism. You really don't have full control. You have to learn to live with it. And you kind of make decisions and it says yes or no. So that's what you're doing. And that's what it is, according to what Gerald said, which is something that I'd kind of thought before, but I wasn't 100% sure and I didn't know how it worked. So that is pretty much, you know. So it says, how can he help them now? That's the other part of the question, Sarah. Well, that's that's the question, isn't it? I didn't ask. So we have two questions to ask him. Can he help those people that he helped convert, which he did convert people? And then what was the other question I had to ask him? Um, there was another one. Somebody can tell me I'd be appreciative. I don't know. I had so many. Proetian says, just say it, Josh. It's knowledge for us. Yes, Joe, that's exactly what it is. A perversion of God's gift of life as he has given to us. Louis says, Wolf, do you think Dogman Bigfoot will reveal themselves to humanity at the end of times? Uh, a lot of people say that. A lot of people say that, but that's a lot of speculation. I kind of talk about that at the very, very end of my book. If you've read the Dogman, the uh, Werewolves and the Dogman uh, phenomena, which I wish I would have had this story and think to go into that book. Oh, my gosh. But um, that is something that we don't know. Um, So I was looking at the Cocoa Krispies. Bam, Doc. <laughs> uh, do vampires look pale? Dana asked that question. Do vampires look pale, Josh? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, you know, I was too busy talking to him about being a werewolf, not about vampires. Uh, I'm pale. I'm not a vampire. I'm Irish. <laughs> That's the thing. Uh, well, thank goodness. We're, we're glad to have you. We're glad that you're not a vampire. We appreciate that. The devil is over perverted music. You're absolutely right, Dana. Facing the crowd, leave the satanic stuff behind, rebuke it and start new things, supporting God, truth, and righteousness. Plenty of material to write and sing about with all the injustices. Absolutely. And you can write in the songs about the paranormal and about these things without it being all messed up, perverted, and satanic. Go, like I said, to Paranormal Soundtable. And you'll hear Nelly's uh, uh, music. Yeah, Joe Breezy, you're talking about the the secular music that that they that they pass off as Christian music. One of the songs that says, uh, "I am a stone unaffected," you know, and it says. And then he says on this song, he says, rain hell down onto me. And I was listening to it, and I was thinking, it's a pretty good song. It's about Demon Hunter or whatever. <clears throat> then I thought about it. He's over here saying to do all this stuff to him. And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. And they never talk about Christ in this supposed Christian music. It, there's never any, they're not praising Jesus. So you're like, what is that? Leslie says, do you think as Adolf they can maintain a sense of humanity? What do you mean?
Um, I'm trying to read some of these comments here before we go. Uh, Paranormal Oz says, Josh, I love the show. This is the truth. I believe I am sure that this must be the way that this must work. Thank you for having the heart and the balls for telling the truth. Much love. Thank you. Appreciate it. I appreciate everybody who's still with us, who showed up and who's asking questions. And um, something that I felt moved to do tonight, and I was told that I should do it, and I did it. I said, okay, let's do this. Wedge Antilles, Josh, have you heard about the transformation from the howling was made with real information? Yeah, I, I've talked about that on my show. I don't know, man. I think it was real information. Yeah, but was it real? I don't know. Two shadows. Thank you for that donation. Greatly appreciate it. Um, I heard vampires smell bad. I, you know, I did hear something like that. There was an Eastern European legend, and I was actually talking to an Italian friend of mine. She lives in Italy, and she was telling me that 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 is what they believe that there are certain vampires, especially in the Italian boot where she lives, um, that vampires actually do smell bad, and that there are covens of them everywhere in Italy. Really, really true. She says that that's a very real thing. She once lit, uh, spent a summer in Sicily with her grandparents because her, her mom's uh, side was Sicilian and her dad is <clears throat> Southern Italian. And she gave me a story. And at some point I will tell it. And, and funny enough, it is a vampire story because you were asking the question about vampires smelling bad. Yeah. And that is something that she noticed was an odor coming from this thing. And I say a thing because that's what it is. And what was the question we were going to ask him? Uh, it was about vampires. Somebody can remember earlier. I'm going to go back and, and, and re-watch this so I can get all the questions and try to get them in my head and, and lock them in. This has become an impromptu PRT marathon session, coast to coast AM. Get ready. What does that mean? With the Filipino vampire, the Oswing. Oh, yeah. You can tell who they are because they can't look you directly in the eye, according to my grandma. Yeah, supposedly because they're dishonest too, but but vampires can very much look you in the eye. But that's a myth. I don't know if it's true. I think vampires can can look you in the eye for sure. The face in the crowd says, "Anyone interested in these topics? Barton Letitian, I uh, know me, and we'll have." We will have a dialogue. Yeah, I hope that I can have a dialogue with you too. Get in touch with me. Reach me out. Reach out to me. Josh Turner, PRTPodcast.com. That's how you reach out to me. Yeah, Joel says, your followers, we would understand if you missed a live stream or two to make big connections like Joe Ballin or Coast Coast. I wouldn't be on Joe on, on a Ballin show because what he does is just retell people's stories. But I think he'd be an interesting guy to interview because I did watch his story about the ghost encounter he had. And wouldn't that be cool if he came on and told it? I mean, maybe we could facilitate something like that. Um, you never know. I mean, I've reached out to people who I thought would just, you know, even back when I was smaller and I was like, hey, and they they knew who I was. And they, um, some of them anyway, most of them, and they were very cool and said, yeah, let's talk. Let's be friends. Uh, like like Christopher Garitano. I didn't know him from Adam. And I was watching TV. I was laying in bed. I told this story before. And I just saw him on TV and I said, man, this guy's in Austin, Texas. And he's, he's, you should looking at a house that I've driven by many times. And I've said this before. I covered a case, you know, for Linda Godfrey on there. It was a, you know, in my life, I've been blessed to, to, to know a lot of really, really famous people. Um, I've been, I've been fortunate. I've been very fortunate. Uh, I've met a guy. I didn't want to get into it because then it's just bragging. I'm not going to talk about it, but anyway, the, it, Chris Garitano, I reached out to him and I said, hey, I got a show called Paranormal Roundtable. You know, he's a guy that made uh, Strange World, the Monte Carlo's guys doing all kinds of big things now. And he's doing all kinds of stuff. And he, he messages me like almost every day. We talk, hit me, him, Barton. We're all very good friends. Um, I'm blessed to know guys like him, you know, and, and know uh, uh, Josh Ninocchio got a huge channel. He's legit, you know, and he's got a really good thing going. You know, he's he's not a what do you call it, a fake subs or whatever. Um, 
And so it's cool to be able to talk to these people and be able to, to communicate with them. I'm really good friends with Ken Gerhardt, obviously, Ken, Lyle Blackburn. I talk to the guys all the time. David Weatherly is really my neighbor. He lives, you know, about 15 miles from here. Not, no. And um, Christopher Jordan lives in the next neighborhood over. I mean, we're all right here. Uh, and Nick Redfern, very, very good friend of mine. We were very close, and he moved back to England, but he was just three hours away. So was Lyle. <clears throat> Ken's like an hour and a half. So I made some connections. I made good friends. I made friends with Barton. Me and Barton became best friends. If he lived here in Texas, we'd probably be hanging out all the time. Um, you know, and so these people are movers, shakers, and people who do things in this business, in this field, in this industry, in this community, whatever you want to call it, whatever this is, that's what they do. And so I, I do get people that call me up and ask me questions, like the guys that produce uh, Monster Quest, the guys that produce uh, Expedition X, uh, the people that produce uh, These Woods Are Haunted. I do know all these people. I know all those people that do those things. And I've been asked to consult on some things and asked to appear on certain things like The Unexplained, and I couldn't do it. I had things to do. And they didn't want to spring for me to, to fly out there with Nelly. I'm not going by myself. Not going to do it. Um, so I said, you know what? I'm not going alone. Um, I think my wife, if not, then not, no dice. And they didn't want to do that. So there we go. And so uh, I do have, uh, you know, stipulations. And I won't. And I promise you. And I'm looking the camera in the eye. If I could look the audience in the eye, I would look you in the eye. And when I talk to people, you can go to my conference. I'm a no-nonsense guy. I'm not a liar. I'm not a fraud. I'm not a fake. And I'm not a bullshit artist. And I look people in the eye and I look in the camera. And I will tell you this. I'm not going to compromise my morals, my principles. I'm not going to lie to you and commit fraud and tax uh, uh, hoax. What do you call it? Uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, when you mess with people, um, what's it called? When you uh, trick people, whatever. Um, I forgot what it's called. Anyway, I'm not a hoaxer. I'm not going to commit any kind of fraud or whatever. I'm not going to do anything that's bad, wrong, illegal. And I'm not going to, um, you know, take your money and do anything dishonest. I'm not that kind of person. Um, there's a lot of people that can attest that I've helped them in this business and in this field or whatever um, to help them to prosper and, to, and to, to make, you know, to make better decisions. I've given people advice and I've given out lots of money. Uh, and I've done that to, for a lot of people to help people. People need it. There's a lot of people that are suffering I'm not a rich man. I'm not. I really am not. But I do do a lot of stuff for my community. Um, Tex uh, from uh, Texas Front Porch, I was on there earlier with him. He can attest to it. Um, we talked, you know, when we were in San Antonio, and I told him what I was going to do. I said exactly how I was going to do it, and we did it. He was apprehensive in working with me because he thought that, you know, me being in the middle of that war was going to drag him into it. And I said, I'm not going to drag you out into the deep water and leave you. I told him that, I told Blondes and Booze that, and I told uh, Boomer, BMR. I love Big Bigfoot Michigan Rob because of that group. He was the first one to come to me and say, look, I want to stand with you. I'm not going to fight, uh, 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 let you fight alone. And I said, okay. And he brought the others along, and, and we've been friends ever since. Tex had a reason to be afraid. He had one of them that was uh, pretty nasty and mean, didn't live far from him, blustering and acting tough. I don't give a damn about your toughness or your persona, whatever you perceive to be, whatever you are. I don't care. Doesn't scare me. Your astral projections and your demonic altar didn't work. It broke and splintered like a cheap piece of wood. That's what it is. A cheap piece of spiritual wood. Use it as a toothpick. Nothing can stand against my father. Like I said, my father is not your father. Quoting Jesus. And he just told you like it was, you know, the truth is the truth and it will come out. The next conference is going to be a banger. Just like the last two, they poo pooed the first one. You didn't give people enough time. Ain't nobody going to pay that much to go do blah, 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 blah. 500 people show up. The next one. Oh, nobody's going to pay those prices for those tickets, but you're getting two and a half days and you're getting 22 speakers or whatever it was, 23. Nobody's going to go for that. Nobody's going to. They, and they poo-pooed. And then, oh, you're not going to have a sun. Nobody can do a Sunday. That's, they, they said it's never been done. They said no conference has ever had a good Sunday, unless it was one of the really big ones that they had, like the one they had in Utah this past year. They said, you, 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 you can't do that. Nobody does that. You can't. We won't do it. 
We did it. I said I was going to write two books at once. I did it. I said I was going to make music. I'm like, oh, we're always making music. Oh, I did it. Everything I said I'm, I'm going to do, I do it. And I'm not using the power of Satan or any other demon or any other piece of crap to help me get to where I need to be. God has blessed me with two things. A brain, right, to think with, and a powerful body. And I've used those to affect in my life. Now, you could do the same. If you have a strong enough brain and you're wise enough, you can learn how to build the body. But people are born with abilities and they totally just cast them aside. And they think that they need to go and find the devil to become a superhero or a super villain, whatever it is that they choose to be. These people that do these things, they're lost. Jake says, are these werewolves akin to skinwalkers or are they different? I would say they're different. That's a very good question, Jake. I will say they're very different. I would say that they're different in a, in a cultural aspect. The skinwalker being something that comes from the Navajo. And I'm so sick of the ghost community. They've slammed me. They're like, this guy is so ignorant. Uh, he talks about skinwalkers. That's only from the Navajo. I know that because I read that in some book. Because I'm smart. I thunk it. Okay. Uh, you can shut up. All right. Because... It's a catch-all. All All of the native tribes, whether it's the Ojibwe or the Algonquin, they all have a shapeshifter legend because they know that it's real, that it's true. It's a true thing. Um, So if you talk to somebody, I was interviewing somebody the other day that's going to come out on the show, is the Yaqui Indian. Yaqui Native American, who's actually, they're more akin to North American Native Americans um, in the sense that, that, like, there's the ones from Mexico aren't necessarily considered like Native Americans, but they really are. Um, in Mexico, they're called Las Indios. And so, but he he's a straight up Yaqui, which is from the southern border of Texas, northern border of Mexico. And they are straight up natives. They look like North American Native Americans, although they, they are from Mexico. And he told me, point blank, he's like, dude, taking the button. And it helps you to get into the, the, the ability to shift. You shift easier. His grandfather and his father were both shape-shifting medicine men. He didn't. He went on to work at a power plant and become a normal person. And he said, but I can tell you this. I watched them both shape-shift. So that's going to be very interesting when that comes out. Uh, one of the things I got to say, though, I've interviewed multiple people who've witnessed this or talked about it, but I haven't talked to someone who claimed that they were a skinwalker. Um, but now I have talked to someone who claims that they're a werewolf. And this is about the third or fourth time that I've had them. But this person actually told me everything. One of them, my, my, me and my brother tried to interview, we tried to talk to, and he was just like, obviously he's full of crap. My brother actually got really upset because he's got a worse temper than me and threatened to beat his ass. And so then that ended that. And my brother's like, you're a werewolf. How about I just stomp your head in? And then, you know, blah, blah, blah. And this guy had no answer for that. So obviously he wasn't a werewolf because he could have turned into whatever and turned us into hamburger meat, which he didn't. So, I mean, wasted our time. And my brother's not the kind of guy who likes to get his time wasted. He will beat your ass. So that was something I had to get him under control. Um, And so here's the thing. There's a lot of people who say a lot of things, talk a lot of trash. I do believe this guy was being completely honest with me. I don't have a reason to doubt him. Um, I did kind of make light of it at first a little bit. Yeah. Well, yeah, quite a bit. I was, I was silly and kind of like, okay, yeah. Tell me what's going on here, dude. I said, put down the freaking, uh, you know, bong, whatever, jokingly. And he said, Mr. Turner, if you're going to mock and make a joke out of this, then I promise you, I'm not going to tell you anything. I'm just going to hang up. Is that what you want? I can do that. He's like, I'm perfectly okay with that. And that's why I said, okay, then let's stop with the, with the bowl. Um, I'm, I'm a jokey guy and he knew that. His friend watched my show pretty regularly. And, you know, Nathaniel, I want to thank you, too, for introducing me to him. Ah, see, Chris Garitano's right. He's in the chat right there.
Thank you for that donation, Sarah Jane. You're too sweet. And you've, you've asked a lot of very good questions. You know, um, She says, thank you for bringing us this important info. I think it will become more prevalent in the near future. I hope so. I really do, because we need to have more frank discussions about what's really going on, what is happening. Um, these elites, you know, say it quietly, you know, but they know about all this stuff. They know that the supernatural is natural. They know that. Kat Caitlin McLeod says, could the man, the story you just told us, could he transform at will? Yes and no. That's another thing. I did talk to him about that. What Gerald mm -hmm. told me was it was something that he had to have his demonic entity, whatever. Believe it or not, what he told me was that that entity sometimes would go dormant, too. And sometimes it would go dormant for like a week or two. Not like it was gone, but it was like just asleep or something. Like he couldn't get it to do what it wanted. Like he would be like, I need to do this. I need to do this. And it was just like, you know, so to recharge, get this, he would have to go back to the temple. They had two temples in particular, well, actually three. One was like a recharge zone where they would just go in and put their hands in this water, which was a dark water. It was like a, that's kind of interesting, right? It was a dark water. It was like black. It was like a scrying mirror. They could look into it and they could see things. And there was like smaller ones and then there was a bigger one. And um, he, they would go in there and they put their, water, their hands in the water and they would they would recharge it. And then there was a blue flame that they would go to and put their hands in and the flame wouldn't hurt you. It would just, it would penetrate you spiritually and it burned. And it was called the hell flame. The hell flame would actually also wake up the entity that was in you because it would, I think without a certain amount of energy or something, it would just go unconscious, kind of like it was unplugged. Ah, very weird. Another thing that was really bizarre, I'm glad you asked this question. Another thing that was really weird and I got my notes right here somewhere. Whatever. I got a pile of notes right here. Don't even use them hardly, but I, I do a little. So anyway, here's something very interesting. He said that around electromagnetic energy. Now, if somebody were to come in to your house, like with an EMF reader or something that was akin to like a ghost reader, they could pick up the energy from this demon. And they did that, dude. Like his wife talked him into going on a ghost tour. He said it was a huge mistake because he went into this haunted house, right? And he could see the demons. Like he could see them. He was like, oh, there's one right there. That's uh, that's one right there. And there was ghosts too, two different things. He said, I would see the ghost. I would see the demons. He goes, and I would just be like unaffected by it. I didn't care. It didn't bother me. He's like, but the demon in me would be going crazy. It would be vibrating. And their EMF readers would go to him. Like, some, they'd be like, something's around you. Something, oh, I can see, feel, whatever. It's around you. And he's like, yeah, stupid ass, it's me. I got this other on me, you know, and it's there. And it's, you know, looking through my eyes. Uh, so I thought that was weird. Um, very interesting information there. And so, yeah. Ask Gerald about how to tell someone he meets as a werewolf or a vampire, please. Okay, so that's a question I need to remember. Do me a favor. If it's a serious question and you think I might forget it, email me. Email me. My email fills up pretty fast, folks, but I look at it every day, and I do read 20, 30 emails a day, not just from you, but different people, different things. And I have four different email accounts, and I think two of them are active on here. So actually I actually have five. Actually, no, I have six, but that the two of them are for work, different businesses, my two businesses besides this one. And then I have two for the show, and then I have one that's a personal or two that's personal ones, but that's it. Josh, have you heard of the channel Dogman and Paranormal Research with Jeff and Don't? Yes, unfortunately, I have. Do I think it's credible? No comment. Phil's turn says, I've met Joe Biden. I hear he was a, a bad dude, and he ran around with a bunch of bad boys. That's all I can say about that. Caitlin McLeod says, Josh, I have some really good ghost stories for you. Please contact me. Contact me, Josh Turner, uh, uh, dot com. Sorry.
Dana says, Josh, I've been hearing about the young man being drowned in a lake in Austin, Texas. Yes. A bar they believe has been slipping Mickey fins. They say it's a serial killer. It's been going on for years. Yes. <clears throat> I know about that. And I can talk a little bit about that, but it's getting late now. It's been on three hours. I will say this very quickly. The first murder took place in 2008. It was a Palestinian guy. They thought it may have had something to do with his connections to uh, the war in the Middle East and everything else. But turns out probably not. He was one of the first victims of what we know to be the Lady Bird Lake killer. I personally subscribe to the idea that it is not one person doing the killing. It is a group. And I think that there are two, at least maybe three women involved, and they slip these people something that they end up down by the lake where they are robbed and murdered and drowned in the lake. And it goes along with the criminal culture and element that exists downtown where I was, you know, where I was a part of, cut my teeth down there on that, all that crap down there. Um, a lot of Sixth Street. A lot of, um, and I'm not afraid to say this because I don't give a hell. You know why? Fuck them. Excuse my language, but I don't care about those people. They're criminals and they suck. It's run by the underworld. I can tell you that. It very much is. I don't care what anybody says. There are mafias, multiple different criminal organizations that run all that. You know, like I said before, screw them. I don't care. They, they do what they do, and half of them know who the hell I am anyway. I don't give a shit. <laughs> Con artist. There you go. Ace Banner. He's always watching my words. Yeah, I was looking for the word. Like I was tell I was having that conversation with Tex earlier. I called him Tax. I meant Tex. And I was telling him, look, I'm a real, I'm the real deal. I'm not a fraud. I'm not a faker. I'm not a hoaxer. Um, and I told him, I said, you know, I'm not a con artist. Tax. Uh, I said uh, Tex. Tex from Texas from Porch. Chakra, you're not a con man, in other words. No, I'm not. Um, in fact, I've had many people from the paranormal community who have been to my house, who've come to, to meet me in person, not just at the conferences, you know, but uh, who, who've interacted with me in my day-to-day -day life. And I've taken them to habitual sites, or habituated sites where I believe Dogman and Bigfoot are. Um, Barton was one of them. And I've taken these people, Bettina, I took her and Madly, Madeline uh, to, to these different places. Um, I, many people, Art Byers from the North American Dogman Project. I've taken a lot of people to the different places where these uh, encounters have happened. And they're spooky, creepy places with a lot of weird energy. I'm not joking. You got to be protected to go to these places. I'm not joking. I'm not, I'm not playing. Um, and so I wouldn't take somebody who's not legit themselves. <clears throat> I've, I have inter inter investigated some of the same places that David Weatherly, Ken Gerhard, Lyle Blackburn, of course, um, the Eric Palacios, that we've all investigated these places. Uh, I've been to the, some of the places, the places where uh, uh, my friend that's in the chat earlier, I don't know if he still is, but uh, Chris Garitano. I mean, we've all kind of, and we've, we've compared notes, all of us, and we've talked about these different things. I work with all these people and I've dealt with these people and they've helped me interview people and talk to multiple different witnesses about multiple different subjects. If I was a phony or a fraud, somebody by now would have called me out on it other than the other phonies and frauds that are out there who are real pretending to be, you know, who are real frauds who are pretending to be legit. They're the only ones who've said that about me, but you notice they're not working with anybody of any real, you know, repute. Uh, they're working with each other because they're a bunch of con men. And that's, so that's what they do, you know. Birds of a feather, they flock together, right? Rebecca says, best show ever. Hopefully you will find them face in the crowd. Luis says, do you believe there are legit vampire werewolf hunters out there? Yes, that is another thing I'm going to tell you. Okay? Yeah, they're legit. They actually do. Kurt Reed interviewed um, one of them, you know, 
Um, I've talked to, like I've said, I've talked to a couple. As of yesterday, I will make it another because somebody reached out to me when I talked about the vampire kit. And they said yes. And they claimed to be vampire hunters and that what they were saying kind of matched up to what I was saying earlier um, from what I know. And I think that they're, I think that they really do do what they say they're, they're going to do. The problem comes into is what if they make a mistake, you know, um, mistake joke, a little joke, but vampire humor. I'm going to tell you this. When these people confront these demons, they better be really, really, really prepared because these people that are walking around as de demons in human skin, they're very real and they're very powerful. And you could die like that. If you're not legit, you're not ready, and you're not in the spirit, you're not in the spirit of God. And it doesn't take much. So, yeah. Good question, Luis. Larry Fisher, Wolf, I heard the metallic door slam by the wall before the back side lit. Yes. That is that is something I also heard out there. So, Larry, Brother Larry, you've been, I call him Brother Larry because he's like a brother to me. Even though we don't agree on everything, he thinks that the Anunnaki are a bunch of bull crap. I don't think that they're bull crap. I think that they are. They have a, a purpose or whatever would, to be talked about, but to each his own, right? So Brother Larry has worked at the wall where I was one night when I did an impromptu live investigation, which also coincidentally was on a Monday night. But I don't believe in coincidences, right? Monday night, something weird about that. I will say this. I heard that. And I heard it twice that night, but I also have heard it a number of times, at least five or six times. We've heard that metallic door in those woods before it was lit up. Now, when you were working out there, Larry, my brother works out there and he's heard it. He's been in the backside and he heard a sliding oh, like a metal door, like a grate. Later on, he heard all this howling and weird stuff. What's to be made of that? I don't know. I don't know. Is it something that's being released? I have no idea. I can't tell you. I know that Martin Groves would have something to say about that. I can tell you that. Quantum Potential says, Josh is in overdrive tonight. He went from being in the, the zone to going full-on interstellar. I don't know about that. But just answering questions, really enjoying the chat tonight. That's why I'm still here. D Truth says, Do you think our government uses DM on the border? I don't know about that. I've heard some weird stories from people about the border. That'd be a question for Chris James. He used to be a Border Patrol agent. He's my co host on Saturdays. Chris James, a really good guy. Check him out. Strange, strange things with Chris James. That's his show. Oh, Nelly says the vampire kid pictures are posted on Facebook in the Paranormal Roundtable group. Go join the Paranormal Roundtable group. You won't be disappointed. There's a lot of cool stuff in there. The vampire kids we took pictures of at my friend's store. I say my friend because I know him. Corey Cole says, Josh, my phone started going haywire tonight and I had to restart it and get it to stop. Yeah, I've actually gotten some messages from people that are telling me this. Something was going on when I was talking. Like something didn't want those things being said. D. True says, if you had to kill a dog, man, what would you do with the body? Well, you can, you can, I don't know. You know what? I would, I would tell you this. Listen to the show I did last night. Go and listen to Sunday night's show. We talked about Quartru, uh, which is a, a Middle Eastern werewolf. I've studied a lot about the Levant and, and their different cultures, their different uh, beliefs and everything. And the Quartru is a very, very nasty, demonic werewolf. And it was attacking this guy's great-grandfather's family, this guy Ahmad, who got in touch with me. Um, that happened in Lebanon. When this thing was going into their their home and doing what trying to get into their home and then attack them in the outhouse, um, it was a it was a horrific thing. But they killed it. And they chopped it up and threw it in a bunch of different pieces 
across the desert because, and this is something I don't know if I specified this in the show, but I talked to him a little bit just briefly earlier today. He messaged me and he was telling me, and I asked him this before I was, you know, inundated with, with problems from work and everything else. He, I asked him this question. I said, why did he scatter the bodies, the body parts? And he said that they, they didn't look, according to his grandfather, they didn't look like a human. It didn't turn back into a human. It was it stayed that way. He said, because the legend is that if you bury it intact, it'll just regrow. It'll take a while, but it'll reconstitute itself. And then it'll come back, and it'll look like it's dead and smell like it's dead, but it'll be animated. And it can happen over and over again. It's like a damn zombie werewolf. Thus, the, the reason why the Quattrub is literally called a ghoul, a something between a werewolf and a ghoul, because when it is killed, and I believe this, I think this is what it is, it's a werewolf that is killed and becomes a zombie. Just like a werewolf that dies in some of the, of the uh, uh, Eastern European legends, they become vampires after they die. Right, and then they just go looking for blood, maybe because they can't no longer do what they did in life. Yeah, weird stuff, right? Larry Fisher says, "A lot of Blackburn is on Barton this Wednesday. Cool, two of my best friends in the on the field." And so, D Truth, to answer your question, what would you do with the body? It depends on if it turns back into a man or if it just stays the way it was. Um, if you had to kill a werewolf, I don't know what I would do, man. Burn it? I, I don't know. I've never had to, and I hope I never do. Black soil Texans, the salt of the earth. My, my mom's from Taylor, 97 years. Wow. Taylor, Texas. The home of Rip Torn and Tex Avery. Tex Avery was the creator of Bugs Bunny. Sometimes you see me wearing a Bugs Bunny hat. That's in honor of my man who was from my hometown. At one time, the deepest artesian well in the world. And I believe that the inner earth is right below our feet. And it definitely is over there in Taylor. And probably why there are legends of werewolves and why we see them. I know I did. Nelly, Nelly says, Corey, if you're tuned into the truth, they will interrupt you. That's right. Uh, let's see what else we got going on here. Capital letters, if you got questions, folks. Love Cat says, I call them abominations. What do you think of the movie The Cabin in the Woods? That's an interesting question. Jim Bob's full of good questions tonight, Jim Bob. Uh, Cabin in the Woods. I don't know. What would what 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 do we think of the cabin in the woods? How about this? How about we do this? Let me see what we got here. Uh, let me see what we got here. Got somebody who might be able to answer this question. Let's see if he wants to get this this question. Uh, that is a good question. I, I would like to see if this person wants to come on and answer that. What are your thoughts of making a theme music video for your songs? I thought about that, uh, Truth. We were we were talking about that uh, uh, last night. I think it was last night, not today. I don't know what we're going to do. That's a good – Dana says, I believe the metallic door is a portal to let out and let into our atmosphere. Hmm. Hold on one second. I'm right here, folks. I'm not gone. I just got to do something real quick. What do you have to do?
There we go. I got another guy who needs to come on the show that I talked to at the gym. I meet people at the gym. We've seen some weird things. And I met a guy recently who's an insomniac who lives in one of our apartment complexes. And he had some weird stuff. He says when he gets into a certain, like after he's been up for a while, um, like he's like, he thought it was just hallucinations, but it kept being the same thing. And it's kind of spot on with what he's seeing as, as like what people describe as like demons. Um, and people in that same complex had told me before that they would see this demonic looking entity. And he says, when he's been up for a while, he sees that when he started talking, he thought it was a hallucination. And I was like, wait a minute, you know? So I don't know. I told the guys that worked there, I was like, that could be, he's actually seeing that because he's been up for so long. You know what I mean? I don't know what your thoughts are on that, folks, but you can give me a give me a what you think of that. You now that, that somehow you know that that kind of turns into turns you into a a, a a zombie when you're up too long, drinking too much coffee. Rappy says, hi, buddy. New sub here from Dublin, Ireland. Have you any real stories from Ireland? Thanks and great show. Yeah, I have a few. <clears throat> I have a few involving the Fae um, from Ireland, too. What round would you feel comfortable to take a DM? That's a D truth. I, the biggest one you can find. I would. That's what I would say. I mean, you don't want to... Maggie P says, if Austin collapses, do you think cannibal gangs will emerge? Like what's happening in Haiti? Yes. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Because it's already happening. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and be like Chicken Little, you know. But yeah, I do. I, hell yeah. Love Cat says 50. <laughs> Probably. Uh, Love Cat, what do you know about that? Come on now. Uh, yeah, I would, I would, I would definitely. Those are definitely a yes. I'll put that on there, you know. A face in the crowd says we aren't a cult and can respect our holding to our scripture. Yes, <clears throat> funny because some people have made these jokes that we would uh, we're a cult, and then we get people saying, "Here's my cult dues or whatever," joking around. You know, D Truth videos. This is Nelly speaking. Would be cool, but they are expensive. Sadly, yeah, they are. Yes, Maggie P. There is a Filipino creature that can split its upper body from its lower. Per my grandma, if you put salt on the lower half, it can't reconnect. Yes, that's true. Uh, that's the legend. Dio chose as werewolf regenerates if you leave it intact, just like Jeepers Creepers. Hey, from, from NorCal, Sierra Foothills. Yes. He said, Chakra says, did he ever accidentally astral project when he was a werewolf? Are you referring to Gerald? If you are, I don't know. I never asked that. But he did say that he could leave his body. That is something that I was told. Um, did not ask that question. I should have. I wish I would have thought to ask it. But no, I did not do my due diligence on that. I was too busy listening to all, taking it all in. 
But he did say that these beings are capable, the, the people themselves are capable of leaving their body and basically going with this other that can travel with them into people's homes and um, they can separate and then reattach. It's a very weird thing. Uh, when Jason Bland was on my show, and I can't remember what the name of those shows were, we did like two or three part uh, show where Jason, Jason was on my show just on Saturday. Jason Bland has Paranormal Soup. He's a veteran of this, been doing it for a long time. Sadly, he doesn't have a really big following because he only does it late Saturday, Sunday nights, only time he can, because he's really focused on his family and his career, which is not this. But Jason came on my show and he talked on a three-parter. And those that are hardcore paranormal roundtable listeners, you can you know how to navigate and go back and look at the old shows um, from uh, YouTube or whatever, you know. And so Jason talks about this black shadow type entity that would come and pick him up, literally grab him and hold on to him and would fly him around and show him all these things. And uh, showed him like his girlfriend cheating on him or something like that. It would, and it was trying to hurt his feelings and make, you know do all these bad things. That is basically one of the others, what they are. And they grab you and take you and do things. And you can use them as a, as a tool to travel, whatever, and begin, go into different realms and whatever. That was something that Gerald was very adamant about, that these things will give you access to other places. For example, he said, even with his physical body, there was a mirror. Get, this is weird. This is a weird part that he told me, too. I, I didn't tell you about this. That he could go with his physical body through this mirror made of liquid that looked like quicksilver, mercury, and that he could walk through it, and he would be on this other in this other world. It was like a flip side. He never went too far in, and he was cautioned and warned not to go too far in because... In that world, there were other things that were way more dangerous than in our world. And it was a good place to get eaten. So he was like, he walked around and he goes, I was in like a clearing, like a, a field. It was very beautiful. It was like, it was very calm and peaceful. I went there. He goes, but the other that was on me began to go crazy. And typically, whenever um, that... Uh, He said whenever that thing uh, was with him, it was kind of like a spidey sense, as he called it. Whenever it would go crazy, he said it would start making this clicking noise in his head. And whenever it did, it was like a sign of danger, like something was wrong. And so whenever he went into that, what he called the flip side, that's what they called that world. They didn't really know what it was. But there were other mirrors in different temples that had different places. And he said that people would show up. He would be at this temple doing whatever it is that they would be doing, talking, having meetings. And these people would show up with their cloaks and walk, get naked and just walk into that mirror like it was nothing and go in there. And he didn't know who they were, but they had a map basically of a lot of these were underground too. Um, a lot of it was underground. This one was underground. And he said that they would go different places across the country, across the world. Um, and you could go from one point to another through these interdimensional whatever, but typically it was only through the astral plane. You couldn't take your body there. And he said that at times, though, they could, there were these places. And he said that there were no less than 150 of them across the country to where they could go into different uh, these mirrors. Each temple had its own mirror, not all of them, but most of them. And they could go into the mirror. And so say if you wanted to go to Sacramento, okay, and you were just right there. You couldn't just physically go there, but you could spiritually go there. Um, but he said that if, if you were to drive or fly out there, you could go to, and one of them was in Sacramento. He specifically said that to me. And he could go into that particular mirror thing, whatever it is, and he could go to another world. And that one was very popular because that one was like a place where it was like a very, like almost like a beach resort looking planet. Where you could go, it was off world supposedly, but he went through this mirror or whatever. And there was like this little tree maze, whatever, and you go through, and then you could go into this oceanic like setting or whatever, you know, and it was very uh, peaceful and beautiful. And there again, he says, um, if you went into the water, 
He said, be very careful because there were things that could kill and eat you. And if the other, the thing that was hitchhiking with him, whatever, did not feel like turning, then it wouldn't, then you couldn't protect yourself. Now he heard stories of the vampires and werewolves that would go into these different places and these warlocks, and they're all different. The warlocks were more powerful than the vampires and werewolves because they could summon other vampires and werewolves to do their bidding, and they could also uh, summon avatars. Typically, the warlocks were, were old. They were people who had been practicing black magic for a long time. And he, he figured out that it was kind of a sucker's deal to become a werewolf or a vampire because those warlocks never accepted any of that, but they could use that kind of stuff on their own. They had abilities and energy that they could use to do all kinds of crap. And he said that one time he got into it with one of these elders or warlocks and got in his face and this dude zapped him with energy that knocked his other right out of his body. And it's a very painful process for it to reattach to your spine. And he said that he learned his lesson because that dude hit him so hard with some kind of energy that almost made his heart. Well, it did actually make his heart stop. When he was telling me this, he was saying, look, this is something that happened to me regularly. Um, I don't know. I just saw something go back behind me. Did you see that? Uh, it was kind of weird. But he said that there were these beings or entities that could um, could could uh, come back in and attach themselves to you that were not your other. And then you would have all kinds of problems trying to get rid of it and trying to, you know, whatever. So you didn't want to become unattached to your other. And those warlocks were able to do that. And they would just be like, get off of me, dude. You know, like, like basically slap you like a child. And so those were very, very powerful, evil, evil, demonic people. The truth asking some very good questions tonight. Let's ask to see Chad Stan Smith says, Josh, Stanley Kubrick interview was a fake. They used actors. Okay. D truth, do you feel the reason of upticks and sightings due to technology or population increase? Possibly both. Possibly both. I've said this before on other shows I've been on. I was on somebody's show one day and I was talking about population, you know, explosion. And then people are building in places now um, where that there was one time it was the wilderness. Now it's not the wilderness. And so they have to go deeper and deeper into the wilderness. And they're running into these things where they thought they were, they had their sanctuary where they could be. National parks. Now here's something that he did say too. These beings going into national parks, that's where they're found because some of these portals that they like to play with and go into are national parks. And like I said before, he talked about the bear men. The bear men, he said something that those love to hang out in those national parks and they're more, they tend to be more wilderness like oriented people than the werewolves. He also said that they tended to be more loners. That's the bear like nature. But sometimes they they were they hung around in groups. He goes, but in the groups, they, a lot of them were very animalistic and bestial, and they could get in a lot of trouble and start to cause problems where they get found out, which I believe is something that happened at Yellowstone, which Josh Nokio talked about on his show. Um, and it was, uh, what's it called? The Woodlark Beneath. It was the Yellowstone. And then we were talking, I think, uh, was it uh, Friday night we were talking about um, Yosemite? It was. It was with Shane Michael Chris from West Coast, West Coast uh, Dogman Project. So we got somebody here in the in the chat. Let's see. What's going on, Chris? Half asleep, but I'm okay. Can you hear me all right? <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. Folks, Chris Garitano. So I, I thought about you because I saw you in the chat under White Phosphorus, but then and we were I had just talked about you and I didn't see you were in there when I first talked about you. I see you wearing a, the represent with the paranormal roundtable shirt. All right. I had to. <laughs> awesome. So, so we had somebody that asked a very pertinent question, and I thought you would be the man to answer this. And they asked me, because you're the film guy, they said, what do you think about um, the cabin in the woods? Right. That's an interesting movie. A lot of people feel like it holds a lot of um, credibility in terms of the, the fundamentals of its story, that there's this deep underground cabal. They house a lot of interdimensional and physical, everything from cryptids to ghosts to 
they're in touch with the ancients and they're in control over everything. They're manipulating everything. And I think that basic concept is what people, it really resonated with people. And the fact that it came out as this pop horror film, um, you know, okay. So for instance, around the time that it came out, I was screening early versions of Montauk Chronicles for Stuart Swerdlow in Michigan and his group and those people felt everything they were watching was real. Now, again, there's some people in those groups that were not very credible people, but oddly enough, even some of those people were talking about things back then that I didn't believe or was taking great caution with. And um, I have to admit, a lot of the things they were talking about that I doubted back then came true or, uh, you know, could be supported as, as truth now. So these days when I hear something and I noticed in the chat earlier, you know, you have, you say you have people that doubt you or the stories you tell. Well, it seems if you look back in hindsight, all of these stories that seem to be absolute fiction, uh, now are being supported by certain fact, even ancient histories, even the ideas that certain histori historians were doubting uh, on record the origins of Egypt or, or, or what we had on record was false or not accurate. And there were certain historians at the time that would just damn people for even dare questioning what was written down. And now you have prominent uh, archaeologists that are saying, no, we, we don't have the full story. So a, a pop horror film like The Cabin in the Woods, A Cabin in the Woods, um, supports a lot of those theories. And obviously the, the writer was into that stuff, you know, So because he, he put it into his movie. And it could, be, could have been as simple as that. He must have been listening to Coast to Coast and he's into a lot of conspiracies. <laughs> and, you know, it may not have been that, oh, he's part of this thing. Like he could have just been really into this stuff and felt like it would work for the story. So, because a lot of people have said that that they think the cabin in the woods is a real thing, that they are actually doing this, and it wasn't until about two years ago that I actually watched that movie. I had, I'm not, I don't watch a lot of movies. I don't get to. I don't have a lot of time, but um, I did watch it, and I thought about it, and I was like, wow, that that you know, and, and when the, the scene that sticks out the most to me was when they were in the when that grid. When uh, right. Chris Hemsworth hits the grid or whatever, and I thought about that, and I was like, "Wow, that is um, what if that's what we're living in? What if there's like a grid around us, and these creatures are just they're thrown into our world, and we just deal with them? You know, it's like we just have to deal with them." Yeah, and and would you consider the people in control of unleashing these things the bad guys? Because if that's the case, you know how do how do you conquer that? If we're just pawns in this whole thing, or worse, more malleable than pawns, less valuable, like what are we, you know? And can we get out of that position? I don't know. I don't know about uh, being pawns, but I can tell you this. I think that uh, the people that are in charge definitely are doing something. They're manipulating us in some form or another. And what we're talking about tonight, Chris, in case you didn't hear the first part, I told the story of a werewolf, a guy who told me a story who claims that he's a werewolf, that he's a real live werewolf, that he can change. And he was giving me all this information and he was very no nonsense about it. He didn't get, you know, he wasn't like a, a kid that was just playing LARPing sure. or whatever. He was like an older guy and he was very serious about it. And he was very matter of fact. And I, I kind of believe him. I kind of believe what he was telling me because I've heard this before. Now, if I hadn't heard it before, I'd probably think, this is cuckoo bananas. But I've been doing this for so long that I've heard people say this before. And like I said earlier, I mean, my brother had a guy who was lying. And we knew he was. But this dude did not come across as this phony baloney. And at any time, he was willing to just hang up and not talk about it. He's like, you want to know? You want to know? I'll tell you. If not, don't worry about it. And so... um yeah, he, he, he told me this amazing story of how he was involved with this cult for 19 years and then he got out of it and how he got out of it and what happened and, and, and what, what in, he, he was involved with. 
And so whenever this guy talks about these portals, like he would talk about these places where they could go different places in the country, different places in the world where you couldn't just go there like, you know, instantaneously you had to fly or drive, whatever. But as a physical body, you could walk through them. And they were like mercury looking mirrors. Um, And we were talking about it. And he said that that was the way out of, and his exact words were, it was out of the matrix. You could go in and out of it and you would go into another world that was supposedly more real than this one. See, I don't doubt the possibilities. I think it's, it's just difficult when, and you know this because you hear so many stories, what stories are, are real and what are not? In terms of the storyteller, are they just messing with you? And what should we listen to? Because obviously we've been lied to for quite some time. You know, we're, we're not, I mean, the, what, what we know of existence, your everyday life is just as real as the supernatural. Mm-hmm. But there is enough, another level happening or many other existences and realities happening um and even science is proving this but i'm just not sure to what degree of a lie we've been told all this time because it seems like any of this is possible and all of this stuff has happened as you i mean you can tell i'm just very cautious with it because i think for the main reason that i think if you open up the floodgates right away you can get sick you know Mm -hmm. if you're not equipped for it i guess I guess you could be equipped for it. For in your case, you had this trauma of seeing this thing a long time ago, and after that, you were ready. Um, and it won't be so traumatic. But if I think a lot of people, when they have their paradigm shattered like that, and they they accept that, oh my God, my entire existence has been a lie. They're not prepared. I guess if you have faith and you have that power and that safety and that comfort can help you through that. Um, other things, you know, a strong uh, resistance to certain things. But for myself, I need to take time through it. Very, a lot of caution before I say yes or what I know. But what I can speculate is that I think there's an enormous amount of the supernatural that is actually real. Uh, I, to what extent, I'm not sure. I mean, I've, I've had a few experiences myself but in the case of a cabin in the woods, I mean, it could very well be something like that. I think we have some very sinister characters uh, ruling uh, the world. And, oh, yeah. you know, I, I know your audience is very open to everything. Uh, but I also run into people that are extremely closed and afraid of everything, too. I wonder, do you, do you have many people on that? in an intelligent way, try to challenge all of the above, like a gentleman's debate. I don't mean an argument or a fight or spitting venom at each other, but like a gentleman's debate on how they can try and deconstruct. You know, I had somebody on, he's going to be, a, it's a pre-record on my podcast with this guy, Shane. I don't know if he believes in the afterlife at all. And he's a good guy, great artist from Texas. Uh, he's been around for a long time in his fifties. And I said, well, you know, my belief is millions upon millions of eyewitnesses throughout human history, you know, less than that would win any court case. So if you have millions of millions of eyewitnesses throughout human history, you must believe that there's something after this or something parallel to this existence. Uh, and he kind of took pause for a second because I've said, you're a logical thinker. It's like, just just consider this for a second. And I would love to see a, a gentleman's debate with you and someone who is a, a skeptic, skeptic that might bring up. You have to forgive me. I've been working nonstop since this morning. But um, yeah, oh, I know you're, you're a very busy guy. What, what do you get the project you're doing is the. Haunting We Will Go, getting it finished, or are you just... Well, that's part of it. There's another thing, though. Uh, Haunting We Will Go is a, a labor of love. Eventually, it's meant to be partially this display of my 100% creative control, and it will make money and everything, but it's all of my investment is in that. What I'm doing, partially for money in another passion project, but it's something huge for a network, and I do these every now and then. Like You saw me originally on one of my shows that was 
it was a passion, but it was also for a living. Uh, this is a series of movies. And it started with me uh, presenting South Texas Blues to this big company and this big network. But then they wanted me to write several other movies that are kind of in that realm. I can't say what it is publicly. I'll tell you privately. Uh, but it's I've been deep in this for uh, I wrote 30 page. Um, what I'm presenting tomorrow is a and they're very excited about it. A 30 page uh, combination outline and uh, some of the actual screenplay pages for this. And they're very uh, close to securing the the entire financing, which is a lot. And it would be, I, I believe it would be a six hour mini series, not unlike South Texas Blue. I can't tell you what it is. It, it's known though. And um, uh, I'm very excited about it. It's a powerful story. And um, I, I'm being very vague, vague on purpose because I can't announce it as part of a big project. No, I, I know, yeah, I know exactly what you're just. Yeah, we don't have to talk about it, but I know you're doing some projects, some big things that are happening. Yeah, it's something I've always wanted to do, and I knew some of the people that were involved that have now since passed, and I think they would be very happy that I I was involved in this. And this isn't South Texas Blues; it's another thing, but um, it's exciting and it's. I love motion pictures that were dangerous, that helped change the world. I think we need more of those now. Um, there aren't many of them. I, I had just seen Dune oh, yeah. Part 2. My only criticism is that I obviously Denny Villeneuve, who directed it, could have... I think a story like that needs the highest intensity. And it was a good movie, but I feel like the studio forced him to pull back, you know? Mm -hmm. And so motion pictures can awaken people. You know, like I said, you know, the stories that you discuss are real stories, but if portrayed in cinema it could be powerful. I talked to you about a project I'd love to collaborate with you on down the road that um, is not fiction. That was a document, a strange and terrible wonder, you know, no oh, one's yeah. ever really done that correctly. Um, I don't think anyone's actually ever done it. I don't know if the audience, if you guys, if anybody in the audience knows what a strange and terrible wonder is, what it's based on. Um, the minute you told me that I knew because we had talked, you know, I was, I'm a person that studies this esoteric stuff, but anybody in the audience want to answer that? Don't go look it up on your phones. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll just go ahead and say it. It's about the black dog. That's what that is. Old Shuck, right? But uh, yeah, Chris, you and I, we, we we talked about doing something like that, and I think that that would be a, a very um, powerful thing. Um, it's definitely something that both of us know a lot about. And um, the setting, I'm not going to give it away, but that was something that you and I had talked about and how we could we could make it into a modern, not sure. modern, but more modern, you know, Tell the same story, but yeah, we won't give all the details away now. But yeah, um, I think I think it could be something else. I really do. And I, you know, the the entire spectrum of motion pictures is changing, and in a good way. But movie makers still, you know, like your education is free now, and part of that is the ph philosophy behind movie making. It should be. Anything you do, whether it be documentary or narrative, which would be the, uh, you know, strange and terrible wonder, should be approached with a concern on the construction of it, just like anything else, the best quality, the best you can put in. And that takes time. I mean, Stanley Kubrick took three years to make his movies, um, you know, normally. And I think movies that are rushed are just for uh, profit only. Mm. And, um, you know rarely do they ever come out good, especially when you don't have a versed movie maker in the group and a real, you know, a real passion behind it. So movies take time. I mean, a haunting we will go is a total passion project. And, you know, it's my answer to that. I could make a better show alone than I could with strange world, which was like 75% of my vision got to the screen. And this is a hundred percent and it's coming out so good and it'll be out for Halloween, you know, so, I mean, it took me a couple of years to make on my own, but the quality exceeds anything I've done before for TV, and I'm very happy with it. So, um, 
you know, and I'll continue doing stuff like that. They'll go, they'll go a little bit quicker after this, only because I'm in a good situation with this new network project, and I can hire a little help. I usually do everything myself, which is insane. Yeah. Well, I saw when when we were on uh, Truth and Impromptu Truth, and we were late burning the midnight oil, and we had, I think it was you and I and Christopher Clough and a couple other people just got on there on Truth Show. And it might have been a couple hundred people in the chat or something, but you you showed us the Pepper's Ghost, which was oh, really yeah. cool. That I was still so have it over here. Yeah, cool. yeah. Do you I've, have it now? Yeah, it's just a simple effect. Uh, let me see if I can do it. Uh, it's pretty cool though the way you did it. It was like it was really. Let me see if I can pull an image up here. Because you like to do things legit, you know, instead of just using all this AI and all this. Oh, AI. I don't use any AI. You know, the only, there's some things. I mean, like for my thumbnails for Off to the Witch every week, sometimes I'll use an AI thing. I think, you know, and I had a discussion with an artist, that same guy, and he said, okay, here's the thing. They criticized everything. They criticized synthesizers, computers, you know, uh, whatever. And they're criticizing AI. If you use AI as a very creative tool, I'm all for it too. Because there's things that you and I can do if we wanted to make an epic sci-fi film or fantasy film. If we creatively participate with the AI and we're in control of it, we hold the reins and we're constructing things. And I can tell you more detail about how to do that. That's an exciting thing because that means they can no longer monopolize that artwork. And we can make, if we, let's say we spent $200,000 on a movie, it will look like what movies looked like for 40 to $60 million a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And I'm not kidding in terms of epic things, but you still gotta be good. And you still have to like figure out, okay, what's the best way to use this tool? I mean, just hitting buttons in it, great, but you'll never get a solid movie. But that movie I watched last night, the, uh, the Dune film, um, I mean, within five years, if you're good, you could make a good deal of that movie in AI now. I'm not kidding. And that breaks the monopoly that these people have had over us as artists who speak in the medium of film for forever. So um, if you wanted to do something epic like that and you're even a better creative, you know, you, you can you can accomplish it. I personally... I didn't come this far just to make everything with AI. So most likely I'm not going to be using it for much at all. You know, um, I, and there's no AI in um, oh, Haunted We Will Go. Maybe a couple of library tracks only because I made the library tracks in an AI program because I'd rather them be unique than use someone else's library tracks that someone else used as filler, you know, sometimes background music or whatever. So I made very unique uh, library tracks in a program called uh, Avia, I think it's called. But it, but you're so in control over it. You're you're picking octaves. You're picking the type of music. The you're feeding it inspiration. So I think that's okay. But that about but I I'm not lying about that either. I created a fake AI musician called uh, Enzo Omerta. So you know it's like I'm giving him credit, not myself. You know. Yeah. But everything else, I everything else is handmade. Everything you see in in that movie is just constructed from scratch. I remember there was some people uh, that saw Montauk, and you, you can like it or hate it or whatever. I made that by myself for like fifteen grand with my own hard earned cash, and um, you know people are watching it right now. And it's like one guy said, "Oh, there's a lot of stock footage. There's no stock footage. No, there's less than a minute of stock no. footage in the entire movie." All of those images are handmade for the film, every single one of them. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've seen some interesting, like I know an interesting filmmaker, He's <laughs> he put up something the other day, Night of the Tumbleweeds. And I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, that <laughs> sounds so weird. He made it in AI, but yeah. I'm looking at it, I'm like, how is this AI? This is crazy. And it's these kids riding bicycles with these giant tumbleweeds chasing them. And, and then, then, I don't know. I mean, it was just so weird and it's happening exponentially. It's improving so quickly that it scares me. I talked about this the other night and I was like, I don't know. Why is no one questioning this? Where is this? Yeah. Coming? Who are the inventors of this? We should know them by name, but we don't. Yeah, that's great. And we've talked about this multiple times, Chris, about being legit 
content creators that we are and 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 just some of the people that are out there with the bs and i mean i don't know nobody's really calling them to, calling them to the floor of what they're doing so you know of course nobody's gonna nobody's gonna say anything about all of that um it's just like i don't know man everybody's just kind of sitting back in a zombified state letting it happen and that's yeah, unfortunate that's no. That's the thing that frustrates me the most. I, you know, shame on everybody if they allow w what's going on all around the world, but also in the U.S. Um, if they allow it to keep going on, and shame on you. You deserve what you get. You know. Yeah, it's true. You, did did you kept catch what what I was saying earlier? Did what time did you jump into the chat, Chris? Uh, I had finished working. I came over. And sat down in the living room, and then um, I, I wanted to tune in, and uh, I don't know. It was um, you were just fielding questions. Um, you, I, I caught a little bit of the werewolf story. I think maybe it was the tail end of it. Mm. Yeah. I, have you ever had anybody give you a story, like tell you that they were something or another? I mean, has anybody ever done that? I mean, I've had a variety of people talk about their psychic abilities. And I, I mean, I was in the Monroe Institute working with, uh, you know, remote viewer number one. Uh, mm. So I've worked with some really interesting people. I talked to people in DARPA that they were already designing and changing DNA. Uh, I mean, these are real things. They were, they, they were injecting people with dolphin DNA. They were, this is real. They were really mm. doing this stuff. Uh, enhancing human abilities like the X-Men. And the X-Men was something that the central, well, at least with the version of the central intelligence at the time went down to uh, uh, Marvel Comics and encouraged this. They were monitoring those stories. This is a real thing. That really happened. Um, you know, Island of Dr. Moreau was written well over a century ago. And it described what came later. And, you know, they're enhancing human ability and have been. This isn't anything new, but this has been going on for a while. Uh, so in terms of shapeshifters, if they haven't been around since forever, which I believe they have, they've been in every folklore throughout human history, even ancient, like cave drawings, you know, like. So I, I, there's something to consider. Have I ever talked to anybody that said they were a werewolf? Well, there are facets of people who are into black magic that I met along the way that claim they can shape shift. Um, I've talked to all kinds. Um, there are people that want to believe they can change. And I think, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that they're scarier because <laughs> that's the, a human that's being that believes they're turning into a wolf might channel some kind of vicious spirit mm -hmm. and do something in the physical form which is is pretty scary i thought that movie with jack nicholson was interesting wolf did you like that mm -hmm. one? Oh yeah yeah they're called therians some of these people that they can they can actually they believe that they can physically or, or make their their it's like a spiritual thing but then it, the, the the flesh can reflect what their spirit is doing I've met multiple people like that. This guy that I was talking to, what he was a part of was a cult. And it wasn't a satanic cult. It was a demonic cult. He he called it demonic. He didn't say satanic. Satanists are do what thou wilt, you know, and the whole of the law is do what that whatever, and they worship themselves. That's not what he was doing. These people were worshiping a very specific deity, and it turns out it was a Mesopotamian deity, which, you know, kind of transformed over the years into whatever and into the modern time. And he was very specific about it and what they did and how they observed it. And it had, it had their own little network or whatever, but they weren't all friends with the other bad guys. Now, he called the other bad guys by different names. Um, one of the things he brought up, which I thought was interesting, was a group that he called the Commission, which is another sort of mafia type magic practitioners that they had run afoul of and they had to be careful for because they were older and they knew how to kill them, which was like really weird. He said, dude, these dudes knew how to take us out and, and they were evil too. 
but they worshipped another deity, which was technically the deity that he was serving, brother, because this thing had thousands of brothers and sisters that were all birthed by what he called Lilith, and it was based on the Kabbalah. And these people in the commission, some people know it as the Trilateral Commission, they were an offshoot of that. And what they did was they would go out and they would execute and destroy people who were getting you know, too close to the truth. And if they were going and, and telling people or blabbing, he said, if you had a big mouth, you'd be whacked basically by this other commission, this group of, of supernatural killers. They weren't hunters. Now, he said that the hunters were a whole nother thing. He said they could range anywhere from being just an average goofball teenager that didn't know what he was doing to a very serious person that could be, you know, anywhere from their 30s to 50s and had been doing it for a while and had been taught because there were families. One of them he named in the Appalachians. He said there was a family called the Denisons and they had been doing it, but they went by different names. They didn't use their last name, mm -hmm. but he said that they, they had been hunting werewolves and vampires and warlocks for years. And they were very well known in the occult circles. And I've heard of this before, and I thought it was a rumor. And I didn't know how this guy knew, but he did. And he said that they, one of them, had appeared on another show talking about how they booby-trapped things and blew werewolves to smithereens. And I remember hearing that. And I thought it was all bullcrap. But he and confirmed to me that it was very real. In and what location? Where did, where yeah, did he That was in West Virginia. West Virginia, okay. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he said there was another one, another group that was actually under the guise of Amish. They were not really Amish. Two things that was weird about this, and I asked him about this this one, especially. He said that Joel, his friend, is somebody that can answer the questions, and I'm slated to interview him next week. But he said that there was another group that, that was Mennonite. They pretended to be Mennonite out of Ohio. Right. But then he said that there was a group in Pennsylvania that were Amish, but they were straight up demonic, satanic, and they were shapeshifters. And he said that there wasn't a good one in the bunch, and they would they were killers, straight up killers, abductors. They would abduct people, and they would actually murder them, and they used them in their sacrifices. And he talked about how they were straight up just evil. There was nothing good about them. And he named a lot of different people and things and I think I get the feeling of the way that he wanted me to tell the story was he felt I felt kind of rushed. But I think that he feels like maybe that that, that his time is coming, like something is going to get him. Um, he had told me that he had been seeing shadows in his house as of late. And those, he said, could be eavesdroppers, as he called them. Right. In fact, I was sitting here earlier and something went behind me and several people noticed it in the chat. I don't know what that was, but I'm assuming that it's probably an eavesdropper because we're talking yeah. about the truth, you know? So I, I have a few haunted items here, I think. Yeah, something just went dim right there. <laughs> well, I have this, this monkey with the symbols. He's, uh, I don't think he's an evil spirit, but he did turn one night. I mean, I looked and he's usually facing the windows and, uh, he was facing me one night. So there's no explanation whatsoever that this thing <laughs> turned on its own. Yeah, I got a few things too. I have a key that disappears. I've talked about it on the show. We don't know where it's at currently, but we know it'll reappear. Um, I had a psychic one time. She's a very nice person, but she told me, she says, that object in your house. And I said, which one? Because I had a few others. I have a sword from the 1600s and I had uh, an actual uh, uh, sword that was is an executioner's sword. Uh, that was used by uh, the Sikhs. And so I told him, I said, I told her, I said, which one? Because I have a lot of items. I have World War II items, helmets from German, Spanish, Japanese, British, Australian. And she said that, no, 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 there's one in particular that comes and goes. I said, oh, it's the key. She said, yes, you destroyed its vessel, which was the gargoyle. I had a gargoyle statue. I've talked about it on the show. I'm not going to waste a lot of time talking about it, just bringing you up to speed. But I got rid of it. And the person that got it from me, his house burned down. I feel bad because I should have just tried to destroy it. But he said everything was burned to ash except for the gargoyle. And he took it and gave it to someone else. And I don't know what happened to it. But I assume that it's probably been destroyed at this point because that's why the key keeps reappearing. So Interesting. If that's to be believed. And I've shown pictures of the key on here. And I've had several people come and talk about the key. 
one guy, my friend Jack, who's a he's a big Italian, you know, his mother comes from where you come for your family comes from up there. And he's like, I don't believe in that crap, man. It was what your bull crap. So we go out into the we're on his boat, and Jack, you know, big Italian dude, he's like, Give me that key, man. F you. And he throws it in the water, and we're like, okay. And he's like, hey, hey, key ain't coming back from that. That's like 40 feet of water right there, man. And ain't nobody gonna find a key. A couple days later, the key showed up on a plate that I was grabbing and Jack was there and it was like right. it waited to kind of, you know, and I pulled the plate out and we're talking and the key falls out and I was like, whoa. And we're getting ready to eat some pizza and I was like, dude, and we all look and Jack walks in and he's like, oh my gosh. He's like, he almost fainted. Like he's he's a big tough guy. I mean, this guy, he's a tough dude, man. Um, he's done some time and he's nobody's patsy and he was just like, he he turned pale and he's like, that's, that's I said, yeah. That's the key. He goes, whoa, one of y'all had to go out there and dive to get that. I said, dude, nobody's going and diving in the middle of the lake to go find that key. That thing finds its way back. And I'm telling you, it's done this multiple times. And so Anthony's talked about it. He's found it in weird places. I found it in weird places. So is my brother. So is my wife. Uh, it is a cursed object that I cannot shake. And I've tried and it's just nothing you can do. Um, it doesn't do anything. It just, just reappears at weird places. What I would like to do is put it under a glass or something and like set up a camera that can be trained on it to maybe, maybe catch it trying to, you know, you could. Yeah. Yeah. Some kind of surveillance. Um, yeah, it depends. I don't Did know. You... I, I would love to see some demonstration of true telekinetic abilities. Um, I would love to see someone shape shift before my eyes at the very least, if we could capture it somehow. It'd be interesting. I yeah. can tell you that. You know, that what was that? Billy Corgan from the Smashing Pumpkins. Mm -hmm. I mean, he seems so sincere about those stories and he wouldn't tell Howard Stern on air the details. He said, I'll tell you off camera. And you could see Stern was engaged because the camera turned to them in the corner and he, you see Corgan telling Stern what happened. And Stern looked like, okay, I'm listening, you know, like, um, the guy's not going to change his story. And I, maybe one day he'll reveal all the details, Billy Corgan, but I believe him. I mean, he said he watched someone shape shift right before his eyes. And this happened twice. Yeah. And we get stories like that here at PRT of people seeing them. One of them, like I said on the show earlier, big Nick, um, he's a big dude. He's an African American guy I grew up, uh, well, grew up with, but I mean, like we, we know each other since we were young. And he worked for me downtown, and he's a big, tough guy. He's like 400-pound just monster. And uh, I've seen him lift people in the air by punching them. And so he, he was a good guy to have around back in the day, And and but now he works as a professional. He has a really good job and working for a large uh, computer company, and he does security for them. But he was, like, standing in the elevator when he, and he told this story on my show. He came on the live stream and he told it. He said, dude, I was in the elevator and I saw this guy. He was one of the big wigs from Europe. He's like, dude, he adjusted his face and he shifted into like a lizard temporarily. And then when he goes, I just acted like I didn't see it. And I kept looking at my phone. Now, he told this story to me in front of a bunch of people at, at, at my friend's bar who's also seen what he thinks is a werewolf. And he was a kid and he saw another one like in half transformation, at least that's the only way you could describe it when he got older. That's our Ash. Um, if you come to Austin, I'll introduce you to him and he can tell you his stories himself. Um, his, he's Persian, but uh, we were at his bar the first time and Nick was working part-time just for some cash, you know? And he said, very, very matter of fact, in front of all of us, he said, I saw one of these guys shape shift. Um, and we had an incident with with maybe what could have been two of them at our club. And everybody but me seems to have seen the eyes slit up. I didn't see that. I did feel this ridge on the guy's back when we threw him out. And that's been talked about on my show and I've had other people come on and talk about it. But there was a weird thing that, that, uh, that happened to a lady that used to work for another big computer company when her boss that came down and she had one of them standing behind him. And she said, I saw his face like kind of glitch out and become a lizard, like real briefly. And then it was and it stopped. And the guy that used to be the head of security there was now one of my business partners, has been one of my business partners for about nine years and or eight going on nine years. <clears throat> He's now running for political office down here. He's a good friend of mine. And I hope that he wins, you know. But uh 
he, he used to be a security owner and well, he still is, but he's going to be getting into politics. But he told me, he says, I can introduce you to some people that do the security for this large computer company. And she said, they'll tell you some stories. Well, she told me that these people would come down from Asia and Europe and they would, some people would, would talk about them looking like they were turning into lizards and that the, there was all this weird chatter and then in the on the campus here in Austin, right around, you know, they would see these werewolf-looking creatures running around in the woods when these people would come. Now, are those people going out into the woods and turning into werewolves, or are they bringing their bodyguards with them? Are they their bodyguards? Are they their pets? What are they? And why are they showing up with these lizard people? Very weird stuff, but I've heard it now from four different people, uh, four different companies with several different people at each one. To me, okay, so I've had a few uh, experiences with the supernatural, but not like this. However, one thing that's so striking to me is that now more than ever, people are talking about this particular thing. And then your audiences are huge because they're interested and a lot of them have had a, their own experiences. I'm not sure what's going on because it wasn't like this before. And um, mm -hmm. maybe there's an increase in these things and certain people are seeing them. So I think that's what's really fascinating to me is that obviously I believe in some kind of supernatural element to our existence, of course. And I can't be selectively supernatural like, oh, I saw an apparition, but these werewolves are, you know, I can't believe in them. It's mm -hmm. like, no, if I saw this apparition and I have these vivid dreams every time I close my eyes, there's something more to our existence. And I'm just telling you from my perspective is a little different that I'm, I'm always cautious with this stuff. But however, I won't dismiss it because, the th like I said, the most fascinating thing that's happening right now is that there's so many people talking about this. If, from your perspective, what, why is everyone talking about this right now more than ever? It, I, is it that they were afraid to talk about it before and it was always going on? It's or funny that it you, you said that and just now somebody just, <clears throat> I'm going to post that up there, Patsy Trigg, one of my regulars, she says CERN. <laughs> Could be. Well, we you know. know that CERN is a thing and it's doing what it does or they're doing what they do. Paul Sinclair, what's going on? Let me introduce Paul. Paul, have you met uh, Chris Garitano? I don't, I don't believe know I if have. he has. I would love to get Paul on and get his opinion. But Paul Paul has written books. He has a show called Truth Proof. You got to get him to interview. He's big in the UK. A lot of people know Paul. Me and Garitano, I mean, and, uh, Ken Gerhard, we're talking about having Paul come over for the next conference, Chris. That would be amazing. Yeah. He put out a, a, a documentary called Wolflands. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. So Paul and you would be uh, good to work together. Uh, Paul Sinclair, he's one of the guys who, when somebody wins one of my giveaways, I always from the UK. I got a big following over there too, and they'll uh, they'll uh, come and and uh, let me see if I can get this. I'm gonna I'm gonna send him the link real quick. But Paul, yeah, in a little bit, I'm I'm gonna have to get some shut eye because it's almost four a.m. Oh, I know. Because <laughs> over there, I think it's like what noon or something. I don't know what time oh, it is England, over yeah. in the UK. Yeah. Yeah, well, I would I like to get his start, opinion. If you start on seeing this. these, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, people do because you know you know who that is that made those. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Do you believe in that? Oh, I mean, I'm in a place where I believe that everything we've seen in fantasy is um, a depiction of some kind of premonition we've had, uh, a vision into either another reality, into the future, into the far past. I mean, it only makes sense. I'm not saying we don't have imaginations, but we don't, we're not exactly sure what an imagination is. It's probably a channeling of some sort, um, one way or another. We can combine things. What was that? That was my squirrel. Oh, <laughs> I, I woke up. Gonna jump you there. I was like, because <laughs> you she know, has you her own that monkey. So I had an arcade in the next room, and I had to move all the arcade games out into another room because she just took that room over. So yeah. I've been raising a little squirrel. She's great, though. She's just usually sleeping at this hour. Yes, Paul. I sent you the link through Messenger. 
So I was going to tell you, you know, you shouldn't have that little monkey because supposedly all of those are haunted. It's kind of like the little, what is that? The Manchi Chi, everybody is always saying that those are, and and the Teddy Ruxpin. Do you remember when we were kids, Chris, and everybody had a Teddy Ruxpin? Oh, I remember. Yeah, dude, that is so crazy. He's haunted, man. Yeah. Uh. You look so evil, dude. Why would you play with that thing? That's so creepy. Yeah, kids he's on my show. Well, not you, but kids would play with those at one time. <laughs> oh, you know? way, way back, yes. Yeah, I mean, when I was a kid, there was this Mexican thing, and probably because I'm here in Texas, it's a little different, but it was called a Manchi Chi, and we would get them, and there was one called in I remember those. Yeah. Hey, Paul, how you doing, man? Um, good, Josh. Great to see you. Good to how see you. Doing? This is Paul oh, Sinclair. Boy, Christopher Gartano, you guys got to do some work together. You guys are both nice to meet you. Really good at what you do. You both have shows, and it's very. And we're up burning the midnight oil here, but uh, it didn't plan would, on being this late. I ended up on another show with Barton and a bunch of people, and then we ended up doing this. And then I told the story of uh, Gerald, who told me he was a werewolf. And of course, if you go back and you listen from the beginning, it's an intriguing story. I don't know, you know. But then Gartano was watching, and he he jumped on. Gertano's a filmmaker, Paul. He he's done uh, uh, the Montauk Chronicles, the Dark. What's it called? The Dark Files. Yep. Um, and then and uh, Strange World. Eight hour series. Yeah, Strange World. Absolutely. In the UK. Yeah. I hope you. Were, I'll just pull this mic. I hope you were a little bit quicker than us. It took us three years to make Wolfland, <laughs> and uh, I, I really thought natural. we would have done it. Yeah, I thought we'd have done it in twelve months, but it, it was three years. But take uh, your three years. It's more important to make it with quality mm. than to just finish it. Well, well, just just came here. Um, I mean, it's ten to eight, eight in the morning here. I've been here since five a.m. If I'd have seen stream earlier, Josh, I'd have I'd have given you a shout earlier. But I'm I'm happy to chat for half an hour. I know you guys probably wanting to close down now. But I'm gonna uh, have to, yeah, because I have another deadline tomorrow. But yeah. Uh, absolutely. Uh, what can I say? It sounds like I'm boasting here for Josh, but it's it's a great stream. And who's going to put this many hours in and do this? It, it's just it's people don't look at it as hard work, but it is. I I do loads of shows and his own live streams, and it's hard work. And to put this amount of content out that Josh is doing, and I'm sure yourself, Chris, sure. it's it, it's hard work. And uh, I, I know that your viewers and you can see with listener count appreciate it. But uh, there's been loads of things happening here, guys. I mean, we're, we're still getting the reports, and I don't know what Chris thinks, Josh thinks, but there's a bleed through into all the phenomena. I firmly believe, you know, and I, you'll have looked into all examples of this, and I don't want to just jump all over you guys' conversation, but, uh, you know, I've, that's, I've been looking at it lately, and I've been looking at the alien abduction scenario. Yeah. And, the, the, the mind, we'll call it the mind speak, where these beings s s somehow speak to you inside here. Then you've got the, the cryptid scenario and the hunter in the forest. I don't know, he'll wander about 20, 25 years. These things don't exist. What a load of rubbish. And then one day, one of these things steps out to, onto the path. Sure. Sasquatch, Bigfoot, whatever you want to call it. He's got a 30 yard six in his hand. As you know, in UK, we don't have guns, but I've listened and spoken to enough people. So this thing can drop a moose at close range or whatever. I don't know. But he raises his gun because he's terrified. It's a voice in his head. Advi I don't know what it's saying, but it's advising him not to do it. It's the same science that's working through the full spectrum of unexplained phenomena. Uh, I don't do expect... Think it's coming, so, so when it comes to a head, what, what is it inching towards? What, what happens when whatever this rift opens up completely? Or is it just going to close someday? Or is it going to completely spill into our reality? Like, what, what, what exactly it, is happening? Perhaps, it, perhaps it's belief, Chris. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm from England, based on the accent. Yes, Maggie. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps it's, perhaps it's belief. Perhaps, I heard you and Josh talking before. You know, just sat up listening, and you're saying, "I don't know you that said, why are we finding out more of these reports now? Right. Why?" It's and and I typed in and I said, "Well." If, if we look into the abyss, it looks back at us. And perhaps it, it, I said belief, and then I need to contradict myself. It's not belief. It's not belief for Josh, it, uh, it, because Josh has seen and experienced, so he knows. But and you, the pathways kind of opened up to the phenomena. Uh, I'm not saying I've got the answers to this, Chris. Josh, yeah. I haven't. But it seems that the more you see and experience, the more you see and experience. 
You know, so well, you just mentioned a little bit of Nietzsche's quote. Nietzsche's full <laughs> quote was about chasing monsters to be careful not to become a monster yourself. Yourself. Yeah. I was staring into the abyss and then, you know, it looks back at you. It, it, I saw it, it, Paul, you, you, you mentioned that earlier. That's the HP Lovecraft thing that me and Garitano have talked deep, deep thoughts. I've, I've had a lot of deep uh, conversations with both you guys. And when we talk about the abyss, I mean, HP Lovecraft, of course he was in onto something, you know, he liked to talk about the middle East and the Levant and, and there's mm -hmm. a lot going on there. A lot to unwrap the story I told yesterday uh, from a Lebanese uh, friend of mine, uh, it was his his uh, cousin, you know. And, and so, whenever you you talk about these things, I think Chris, when you were saying like, what is it that's happening? Why is there so much of it now? And why is there so much uh, coming out that was never come that was never out before? I think one of the things we got to look at is we are starting to see, and I, I like to believe, and this isn't me wanting to be prideful, but I like to believe that I was one of the the, the leaders in this field to, to do this was to bring everyone together, you know, and bring them to the table and unite the different groups. Because, you know, Chris, you've been on the show and, and we did a three-parter on the podcast. Mm -hmm. But then you came to the conference and, of course, you were on the UAP show we do every every Saturday night and you were a guest on the UAP show. Um, and we were talking about the alien agenda and whatnot. And, Chris, you're, you're kind of a paranormal ghost person you're doing a haunting we will go and you got the show off to the witch which is like the the, the line between reality and fiction yeah, where does yeah. it you know, blurs i'm always exploring how fiction spills into reality how many times we've talked about these things either in science fiction or in fantasy or in horror fiction that it's comparable to something that has happened or is said to have happened in reality always it, it, it's fascinating, Chris, and if we stay with the, the werewolf scenario, <clears throat> the, 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 these accounts, even if we didn't call them werewolf, were probably there. Well, they were there long before uh, movies and, and, and everything else that came with it. I think when people roll their eyes when you talk about the werewolf because they're thinking about silver bullets and the full moon and transformation. That's not necessarily what's happening. You know, here in the UK, probably 11 miles from where I'm sat now, uh, are, are some of, potentially some of the most ancient stories of shape, shape shifting anywhere in the world. We've got a place called Starkar. It's, a, it's, it's an archaeological site. Uh, which you'd be able to Google these places, anyone listening that wants to do. It's definitely the most important one in the UK, but it's, it's renowned throughout the world. And the archaeologists of the day found evidence of mass animal sacrifice. They didn't say, they didn't, they didn't, based on what they're seeing, they thought these animals were being sacrificed rather than butchered for food. Right. Am I okay talking like this, Josh? Is that fine? Oh, there's John. And, and, um, Sure. The, the Go ahead. Talk, talk away. The that the people of the time these are these are Paleolithic people. We're going back eight to twelve thousand oh, yeah. years. Yeah. But they believe they'd been shaman, practicing sacri sac sacrifice and ritualistic magic. But what's interesting, Chris, is from the same area, literally on the out on the now it's a dried up lake bed. It's called Lake Flixton. Obviously, back in the day, all those years ago, they wouldn't have known it as that. And that's why all these artifacts have been preserved in this sediment. But on the edge of it is this village called Flixton. I've got reports from the 1930s up to present day of this creature that people, bipedal, that's been seen, be it fleetingly. I mean, the truth proof books that I've written. Uh, there's lots of accounts of it. So people are probably thinking, oh, this is pro prolific and people are seeing it all the time. It's not. It's just that we, we, you talked earlier about why are people seeing this? Why is it becoming more and more the in? Are these things coming to the forefront? I think it's because when you've got voices like yourself, Chris, and Josh and me that are actively trying to take these reports, it gives other people confidence. Sure. So where, where am I going with this? So we, we've gone to the Paleolithic time at Lake Flixton. If we jump forward then to 937 AD, so we're still 1,086 years ago, mm -hmm. on the edge of Lake Flixton, the king, King Athelstan, no, not some fictitious king, a real king, had a refuge built on the edge of the lake. 
Lake Flixton. And I should imagine even back then it would have probably been dried up. But it was protect to protect travellers from wolves. Now, wolves would have been prevalent in the UK 1,086 years ago. But the writing goes on to say there'd have been no bears either, by the way. They'd gone 1,500 to 2,000 years before. But the writing goes on to protect travellers excuse me, travellers from wolves and an infestation of savage beasts, which I find fascinating. I know we can bend it to how we want want it to be perceived. Sure. But we didn't, we didn't have anything else. The wolf was the apex predator. So why add this line? And in, <clears throat> an infestation of savage beasts. And then out of this area, like I've said, I've gone back to the 1930s with farmers who are on these remote, they call these areas the cars. C A R R S. It's yeah. wetlands. That's what it represents. It's nothing to do with cars, as in motor vehicles. And farmers who farm this area, it's remote. And I've got reports from old men now who worked on the farms in the 1930s who remember that their employers, these other old guys, talking about the werewolf, the Flixton werewolf on the cars, right up to present day. And we're getting these stories. And it wants to be seen. Do I believe it's real? I th yeah, I do. I think we've got to redefine what we believe as real because I think it's something like what the American, the Native American Indians talk about when it's something that can live between worlds. It, it can, and I know it's a fair stretch for some people, uh, the, but it slips in and out of our existence almost. And I, I don't know, I'm, I've, I've literally got about 15, 20 minutes, but I can relate a story that when we're talking about reviving the phenomena, uh, I haven't got the date in front of me, and we're jumping away from the cars now, but a young guy, years ago, I, th I think we're talking, it was 18 in 2002, and I might have got the dates wrong here, people, No, because I've, I've only picked this account up a few weeks ago, and uh, he's laid in bed in a semi-detached house uh, in, ho uh, in suburbia, not in the middle of nowhere, and he gets the urge to get up in the night. He's 18 years old in the little box room of the, the council house at home, and he gets up in the night, opens the curtains and looks across onto the, the houses opposite. And there's a small green with a cherry blossom tree on it, about 15 foot tall, he says. Am I all right to do this story, Josh? Sure. Yeah. And he says, I'm amazed to see. They call this guy Drew Hollings. And he's allowed me to give him his real name. He said, look, he said, I've seen this. I'm, I'm done with denying what I've seen with my own eyes. Uh, eyes, not Ed. Sorry. He said, so I'm looking across the road. He says, and on the roof of the house opposite is what I can only describe as a werewolf. He says, and it's sat. He said, have you seen the tribesmen when they sort of squat down, but they don't sit down and the legs come out or a frog? He said, it's sat there. He says, and I can't believe what I'm looking at. First, A, I don't know why I felt compelled to wake up. He said, so I'm watching this thing and it moves across the ridge of the roof. And it, this is where it gets even spookier. It goes down the gable end of the house like a spider, head first. So he got four legs. So, so it's, this is a crazy story. Uh, he said, from there it jumps onto the garage roof. It goes across the gardens, and it, with one hand or, or arm, it reaches up into the cherry tree and steps into it. He says it's seven to eight feet tall, and it sits in the tree. He says the normal street lights, the amber street light is close. He says I can. It looks a bluish colour under the fur that I can see in the street light, and I can also see that I think he only had two fingers. He said and I can see these fingers, and it's eyes, and we'll we'll get to the eyes in a moment. But he said the self illuminating. So that's nothing that we've got in Animal Kingdom unless we're going to bioluminescence, you know. So he said. Interesting. So, suddenly it fixes on me. It's, this thing's fixed on me. He said, I know it can see me. And even though it's in the tree, oh, and the tree never moved when it stepped into it. He said, this thing was huge. This tree's only 15 foot tall. There's no leaves on it. Uh, he said, "He said we used to climb on it as children. <clears throat> I said, but it never moved. So that's a strange aspect that we've got something that potentially can weigh, I don't know, three, 350 to 500 pound and the tree doesn't move. Fixes on him. He said, and the next thing, it's jumped out of the tree and it's coming across the garden, the garden, the, the road and on, into the garden. I lose sight of it. And then it's there in front of my face, 12 inches from my face. Now, I find his, his recall is interesting. He says, this guy says, I've got a big head. 
He says, and I'll tell you why I know uh, that my head's big. He said, I'd be measured for a crash helmet. He said, and that's how I can re relate this program, this story. He said, and it was 62 centimetres. He says, this thing's head was three times bigger than mine. He said, and its head melded into its neck. And the eyes are as big as snooker balls and there's no pupils. And I'm looking at it and I can see breath coming onto the window. He said, the next thing I, <clears throat> I know, I'm in bed and I'm waking up and I'm trying to make sense of what I've seen. He saw fangs, huge canine teeth hanging down and he doesn't know. But right now, the pathway back to the phenomena. He said he'd been thinking about contacting me for a long time, not just weeks, like like months and months he says and i went for a walk and i'm sort of walking down a bit of a secluded lane and i he said and i thought right i'm gonna do this i'm gonna contact paul and i'm gonna relay this account to him this story we've spoken on the phone now uh, it's not just some email i've gathered because I, I like you guys i'm sure that that's what you want to do ultimately you you get more you get more of a feel for person he said, but I started thinking about it and how I'm going to form what I'm going to be writing to you in the email. He said, and suddenly I felt like I'm enveloped in, in this bubble of silence. And I felt like I was being watched. I felt like this thing was watching me. He said, it's really uncanny. He says, because in all the years from 18 to now, even though it comes into my mind occasionally, I've, I, that's never happened. So... Is it just as he just spooked himself by looking at it a little bit deeper, or do we really create a pathway back to the phon phenomena? Sure. It's in mind connection, and I think that th there's something in that. Right. So I think it's the to, latter. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. So to take control of that one, Josh. Apologies. <laughs> no, no, I, I think I think you're on the right path because that's the only way you can figure it out. It's much more complicated. I think it's a much more. Uh, uh, elaborately woven answer, the best way I can explain it at yeah. four oh six a.m. after being awake, so, yeah. uh, <laughs> seven o'clock a.m. So almost twenty four hours we're going on. Yeah. yeah, I did one the other night for Howard Hughes. If anybody, I'll give Howard Hughes a plug because the unexplained Howard Hughes is pretty, absolutely brilliant in the UK. And uh, yeah, yeah, I find myself at all hours. But Josh well, mentioned this to me. Josh shows now uh, like um, Art Bell. He would do it all night long till oh, yeah. early in the a.m. Yeah. He's got more energy than me, but I've got to admit, <laughs> he's got more energy than me. But hey, Josh, if I can support you in any way, mate, you, if I'm around and you think I'm not bending people's ears too much, no, I'll come no. you, you're a great storyteller, my friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, so, you're good. You're you're very good. You remind me of, we were talking the other day about Lionel Fanthorpe. You remember? All from, right, from coast to coast, and he would say, "You know, George." And then at that time, that guy was, you know, in the well, way you well, well, well is he, I don't know if the guy's still around. Is he? I'm I, not I don't sure. think so. But he was a great storyteller. I used to like. He, he was a great storyteller, but you know, I, I contacted Lionel Fanthorpe years ago. I think he lived with his sister. I may be wrong, so I don't want to get get it wrong. But I, it was his sister that answered the phone. And I, you know, and I, I said, could, could I speak to him? And she said, what's it about? I said, I'd like to speak to him about what he's written about the Flixton werewolf. Mm -hmm. And he, she said, oh, why was that? I says, because he's got it all wrong. <laughs> and, and I said, I were polite. And I didn't, I went, I said, but it's wrong. And I've contacted a few authors about, there's a few people written about it. Uh, maybe I've got an, a, a, a better grip on this because I literally live. 11 miles from the location, but they'd never visited. And all of the authors that have written about it, that they're all piggybacking off the other people that have written about it. And there's no, there's no actual truth. Nobody's done the door well, knocking. You, you corrected on. me on the beast of Barnstorm drain because you know, that that was also kind of just based on the Flixton werewolf. With, and without a doubt. And the, for yeah, sure. I when I would heard those that. stories. Well, gentlemen, well, you're going to have to excuse me. It is time. That yeah. Preston, it was wonderful meeting you. Josh, Chris, great, great to see you again, my friend, Wolf. Yeah. All right. Chris, thanks for jumping on, and, and uh, I'll see you. We'll talk again soon. All right. I look forward to it. Take care, everyone. Right. Get some sleep, brother. Good night. So we, we, we were talking, uh, Paul, about that, the Beast of Barstrom Drain, and you and you you gave me all the information about it and what it was and, and how it you know was, was corrupted by the story it was – so, so you know your stuff. You have your information, you know, and it's 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 awesome that you're here. I, I'm I'm hoping that you can make it across the pond, as they say, 
when we yeah. have our conference in early November, I'd love to have you on board. You but know? Things might have eased up a bit for me there, you know, Josh. I got invited only last week to a cruise, Seattle to Alaska in September. And I just and I, I, we aren't going into detail with too much. We're looking after somebody with a, a bad illness and I can't just leave my wife to, to deal with it, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So, but if, if things change... Yeah, I'd, I'd jump at it. It'd be an opportunity not to miss, Josh, so I would love to. And, yeah, especially uh, because if, if, if this conference, if we do this conference, me and Ken both talked about it, me and Ken Gerhard, and we're probably not going to do another one. It's just, no. it's just so much stress. Um, and, and, of course, now my colleague and co-author, we were doing a project together, me and Nick Redford, and now he's back in England because right. his dad okay. you know, was, took ill and he's your, your, your uh, fellow – English patriot, you know, but uh, I, I, I really, it really sucked because I was doing the Montauk, uh, the guy that was just on right now, Chris Garitano, he, he, he had done the Montauk Chronicles and it was dealing with MK Ultra. So I was doing an MK Ultra project and then Bartonelli was going to get on board, but he had a bunch of other stuff to do because he's trying to finish writing his book, uh, Spotsville Monster. And so then I had this UFO project that I had done. And so they're both just going to have to be shelved because it was something that I was working on yeah. with Nick and uh, the MK Ultra thing. Garitana was going to be a consultant on that. But then our witness that, that was going to be one of the main people of the book, she got cold feet and was like, I don't want to talk about it. And so you can't, there's nothing you can do. And so I tried to talk to Barton and see what we could do. And there's just, there's, you know, when you get stuck, you get stuck. And so, I just moved on to the next project, which is the vampire book, and I'm going to be doing that, and hopefully in June it'll be done. Um, we'll see. It's frustrating, Josh, but there's a time and a place, and you know it'll probably come back round. That that you know, you, and you and then you've all these pieces of information and pieces of the puzzle that you've got laid out. It'll fall together and happen. Uh, it's it's a, it's a shame when that happens. I've had some incredible witnesses talk to me, and then it's just everything just closes down. I don't know. Sometimes it just becomes too much for people when they actually uh, uh, bring it out. But talking about the, the Barmstam drain and I've, I'm okay for five or 10 minutes. If I'll tell you a little story about the Barmstam oh, drain. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And this is, this is kind of UFO related. And it's a guy called Glenn uh, who, who purchased some of my books and then he got in touch and then he came to my house and related this story. And he said he was about 15 years old at the time, and it was 1970. And he's on the Barmston drain. Now, for, for the view, for the listeners, and also the viewers, for the listeners that don't know what the Barmston drain is, it's an area of wetland in Hull here in the UK. And it was excavated in the eight, the late 1800s to stop the low-lying ground flooding. Mm -hmm. And it comes out onto the beach at Barmston, which is miles away, really. So there, he said... It's a pretty built up area, but sparse on the drains, the Bamston drains, these land drains, which range from 20 foot wide and six foot deep to just little channels of water where all these attributaries filter in. And he says, when we're walking along it, there's about three or four of them, uh, summer evening. And we come across another group of boys from another area in Hull. He says, and what do we do? He says, we want to fight. He says, and there's, there's more of us than them. He said, so we end up chasing them. And we're across the Barmston drain, he says, and we find ourselves ourselves in an area that we're not familiar with, but we're still on the drain. We can still know where we're going home. So that's where that ends. He said, and then there's a flash of light in the sky, he says we all kind of look up and instantly this thing shaped like an egg comes straight down and splashes into the drain. Wow. <clears throat> he said, and we watch it submerge, submerge beneath the surface. He said it looked blue-white colour as it hit the water and went below the surface. He says, but instantly our eyes have taken off that because at the other side of this, this stream, there's a man. He says, and he's got a, a some kind of gadget in his hand, like a oblong box, uh, six inch by 12 inch by four inch deep. This is how he's describing it. And there's lots of lights flashing everywhere and he's moving from side to side. He says, and he's dressed in what looked like a leather outfit. He said, it, it just looks like he's clad in, clad in brown, dark brown or black leather with some kind of visor on. He says, we don't say a word. We're just looking at this man or this being, should we say. 
And this is instant. The, the objects hit the water. They've watched that. And then this is on the bank at the other side, only like 15, 20 foot away. Then one of the boys notices that the water's been disturbed and they look and this object that's gone into the water is starting to glow and it's glowing orange. Burst out of the water, so Glenn says, when they look again, the man's gone. So just, <laughs> obviously, I've condensed this. I'm, I'm, you know, we don't drag the stories out, Josh, just for, for the viewer, but it's it, nice to add more details, but... So the time's tight for me, and 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 I know it is for you guys. You've been there hours, but uh, that's the, the the gist of the story. So so these areas once again where the the beast of Barmston Drain has been seen, because I won't downplay that something of a cryptid nature has been seen on the Barmston Drain, uh, but we've got that we've got that interconnected. We've got that multi phenomena element to a lot of these locations where these things are seen. So we've got this strange story from 1970, early 1970, which is fascinating because on September the 8th, 1970, we've probably got one of the <clears throat> one of the uh, best documented UFO aircraft related incidents, certainly in the UK, where lightning XS894 uh, crashed into the North Sea approximately 15 miles off Flamborough and Bempton, and I'm sat in Bridlington, four miles from Bempton, uh, on September the 8th, 1970. And there's lots and lots on the internet about this if people want to look at uh, the story, the UFO-related account of XS894. So just a few accounts, Josh. I I'd love to come on and, and just spend an hour, two hours with, with you and your guests, if you'll allow me, and For share sure. some more at some point. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, if you need to run, Paul, I understand. That's great, dude. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm okay. Still, fire, fire anything at me. You know, I've, I've just, I've, I'm aware that we've the relative that we we're looking after. I'm gonna go up there and just check everything's okay in, in next fifteen minutes. But, yeah, uh, yeah, all good. Yeah, it just you know, one of the things that we were talking about earlier, and I mean, we still got four hundred and seventy something people in the chat. I mean, we had like five something earlier, but. You know, it, we were. I was talking about this guy Gerald that gave me this story about being a werewolf. You got to go back and watch this episode, oh, definitely, yeah. So you can hear what I said, and then you can give me some questions or whatever, and maybe, maybe I can get him to talk to you. It might be interesting for your British audience. But he wasn't wanting to be on camera or be seen, which is understandable because it's anyway what we were talking about. But it was a cult, basically, and and a cult in the way that. They weren't, uh, it was uh, not, I wouldn't call it satanic. They weren't, they didn't call themselves satanic. They worshiped a demon, as he called it. Um, but it was a very powerful one. And it was, the, the name, when he was given to me, it was a couple letters off. But it, I, 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 you know, kind of backtracked it to Mesopotamia. And what it did was, it was a vampire type demon um, that was akin to Ornius from, the, you know, King Solomon, you know, and he, this thing, they would get, it would give them the ability to shape shift and you could become a vampire or a werewolf. And, and then in this same cult, there were warlocks that were really, really powerful. And so he chose to take on the form kind of unwillingly. He wasn't, he didn't really have a choice because he was just kind of thrust into it, but it was like he was selling drugs, and the next thing you know, he was a part of this. And when you, I believe, when you're out there just bobbing around in the ocean, well, you become shark bait. And he had no Christianity, no nothing. He was just kind of there being a, a reprobate. And he said that he was very honest. He said, that's what got me caught up in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got with these two girls and thought things were going to have, he was going to have fun, and he ended up having problems. And so what he ended up doing was um, basically, you know, living a life for 19 years that he didn't really want to live, but he was kind of in it. And then one day his wife just broke the, the curse with the help of Christ. I mean, told him, you know, look, I'm, I'm leaving you. If, if this is, you know, I want to get away from your, 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 the way you are. I want to go to church. I want to live a Christian life. And so, that broke it all, and it was in one night. He said the power of God happened so fast that it was one night, and it was all done. And he he believes that he was delivered, and that at some point, you know, he always had kind of resigned himself to the fate that he thought he was going to suffer, which would be death or 
at some point, maybe even going to prison or being exiled to some sort of hell realm, which he which do exist, and that's something me and him talked about too. But uh, what are your thoughts on that? The, 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 that's, I weren't being rude when, I were, when you were talking. I was looking for this. The, uh, my thoughts are that these groups exist. And before I just get to this little bit, which will probably take five minutes, on the, on the East Yorkshire coast, Bempton, Flamborough and Speeton, where I do lots of the research, there's a disused RAF base. It's totally out of bounds for anybody in the UK. I have to say that because it's on private land. I've just, I say it every time. And that below ground, there's a Type 1 rotor. It's a, um, it's a former RAF uh, Type 1 rotor. 10-foot thick walls, 12-foot thick ceiling. It's it, pretty impregnable in the day, designed to take the impact of a near-miss nuclear blast. However, when it closed in 1970, <clears throat> through the 80s, it, it, you know, it could have been the target for thieves, for copper and other metals. Through the 80s, uh, it was used by a satanic cult be intermittently and they were trying to summon demons which is a a, a fascinating thing and and the th something that bleeds through with the summoning of demons and i'm no great authority on this is something akin to the werewolf phenomena and we've st I, i'm wondering if we've still got the residue of that on the clifftops but jumping from that josh you're talking about this and i'll just give you an example from this this account that I got and I've changed the person's name. I've even changed where they worked because they're that frightened about just disturbing what they perceived. So what we've got is a report that came in and I've changed the name from a guy called Danny. And it relates to an incident in 2008. And I'm forgive me because I'm going to just keep looking down. And he worked in a stationery shop. I've changed lots of things, but I've not changed the core truth of the story. I've changed things to protect this person in a, in a, in a small town in, in East Yorkshire. And he explained to me that somebody came in asking if they could use the photocopier and the internet uh, in the shop, which he allowed. And uh, he said he wanted to formulate a letter for a few friends. Uh, he said this guy looked perfectly normal, slim guy, 40 years old, white skinned guy. Uh, and he spent a bit of time forming this letter, uh, very secretive. She asked if she wanted any help. But once he'd been showed how to use the machine, once he'd been showed how to use the photocopier, that was it. Paid for, I think, she, let's just have a look. I think they paid for about nine or ten copies of a, of a letter. So without me reading this, basically... Uh, and it could be just some fanatics, this people, but it's interesting when you're saying these groups exist because I firmly believe they do. When he left, someone else came in a short time later to use the photocopier and he's left the original on the top, uh, on, mm. on, on the copier. So they bring it to the counter and what this person sees really disturbed them. She said it was a letter addressed or designed to be sent out to werewolves. Wow. People, people who believe there were werewolves or were werewolves. Let's do, let you know. I'm, I'm going to leave that open. It gave it gave the locations of butchers' shops and abattoirs where meat was left in stillages in 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 the back of shops and diff, you know in the you know, meat that's ready to go to I don't know. Not for human consumption, just just wasted. But it yeah. gave the locations with back of supermarkets. She said it were really detailed. It said it gave the 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 times and the dates of the next meetings, which were under the Hessel Foreshore Bridge in Hull, which is interesting when we talk about the Beast of Barmston Drain because it's all there. And so this letter that had been left. Or has disturbed this person from 2008. Quite what it means, I don't know. Because if it were left there to create some kind of stir, it never worked because I never found out until last year. And I've spoke to this person since. And one of those, they've just closed down. I think they regret uh, sharing it. It's not because they think I'm going to lead them anything back to them because I've changed it so much. You've got the core of the, the account. But simply because it's disturbing memories and they didn't, they, they're just reviving something that they're not happy with, the potential that either or individuals can actually be out there believing this or individuals can be out there who are actually somehow have connections to the werewolf. 
it's it's a fascinating and frightening at the same time. So I've just called it the stranger it gets. So when you were relaying that account, I was just looking for that. Then where are we there? So, so <laughs> you and I have talked multiple times about these things, Paul, but for the audience, I mean, just tell them, what is your opinion on werewolf versus dog man? Like, what do you think? I think we're looking at the same thing. I think uh, myself, I just think that dog man is, and I could be wrong and I'll hold my hands up. I don't want to argue with anybody about it, but I just think we're looking at the same thing. I just think we've got a, a different name. Dog man seems to be the in vogue word that is used mm -hmm. but if we go back we've got people like montague summers and and other writers from ancient times from earlier times we're looking at something akin to a werewolf i mean there mm -hmm. were probably na uh, names well there were names for these things prior to that but they're through every culture uh, it, it crosses continents and these things the same description of these things hasn't changed Long before the advent of the internet and and traveling in boats across to other countries people had already decided what these things were and what they looked like so there's there's a reality to what we're looking into i wouldn't invest all this time if, if you would have said to me probably uh, 10 years ago what do you think about cryptid phenomena i wouldn't have laughed at you i wouldn't laugh at anybody that wants to talk about these things but it wasn't on my radar i, I everything that i was looking into was ufo related or or, or to do with alien abduction because of my own experiences but when I started writing the books and the reports started coming in, Josh, I couldn't deny it. I, I, I couldn't just shut it out and be so blinkered like a lot of researchers are. This is the lane I'm staying in. I'm into UFOs and nothing bleeds mm -hmm. through into it. You know, UFO organizations, you get this incredible or, or cryptid researchers. They get an incredible account of a Bigfoot sighting. And then the witness will throw a paragraph in or a few lines in saying, oh, and there were some strange lights in Forest as well. Oh, well, we don't want to know about that because that's not what I'm looking at. I'm looking for some fur covered hominid that's running around the forest. I'm not saying that doesn't exist, but we can't deny the evidence that people are giving just because it doesn't fit our narrative. You know, maybe I didn't answer your question right there, Josh. No, no, no. I get what you're saying, and I and I know we've talked about this. Our stance is very similar. I think it's the same thing too. But there's so many people in this field that want to say a werewolf is not a dog man, and a dog man is not a you know, and, and it's like to Still me that's a very difference. I mean, it, I think it, they come from the same thing. What the, the late J.C. Johnson? I'll quote him again. He said that some of these dog men that we're dealing with are just werewolves that got stuck. Yeah. I mean, he really said that. I mean, he thought that too, because he spent time in the Navajo reservation and watched actual shape shifting. And of course, one of his dear friends and colleagues, David Weatherly, he's a good friend and colleague of mine, and he doesn't live far from me. And I would think it'd be awesome to have all of you guys at the conference at the at, in November, we could all talk about this and postulate on this and eat dinner and maybe come up with some some really good collaborations because I know that these last two have produced a lot of amazing collaborations have turned into alliances and we've brought people together from the ghost community the UFO community the Bigfoot community and the dogman community and a lot of people said it couldn't be done and there was a lot of resistance I mean mm -hmm. I you know the, the war is pretty much over now but I was fighting a war with some very nasty people and they were determined to stand in the way of progress and they were going to fight for their fraudulent hoaxing lies. And they were just like trying to drive me out of this field. And one of the things I was told by a UFO researcher, he says, maybe if you just stop trying to get everybody together. And I said, you're asking me to do something that goes against my nature to try to bring people together to find the truth, to bring us together. That's what I'm trying to do because we need to work together to figure this out. And he, he made a very good point. He said, some people don't want to figure it out. They just want to grift and make money. That's it, yeah. period. And I said, well, I'm not that person. He goes, well, a lot of people are. He goes, and not, not many people have your, you know, the, what you have. Which well, is, well, the thing you know, is, Josh, you, 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 they'll not break you. you, you, you you're sort of fixed not fixed in your mindset because you're very open-minded. You wouldn't be saying that all of this is potentially connected and there's the bleed through if that weren't the case, but uh, absolutely fascinating. And what time did you start Josh tonight? Or well, <laughs> five hours ago. So five I, guess, hours ago. Yeah. So, I was on a show with Barton and Tex and then uh, the blondes and booze. And we were on for 
uh, like an hour. I was only known for like an hour and 40 minutes because I came in late. And then I just said, hey, I got something to say and come on after that show was over. And I said, let's go to my channel. And so we started talking and then the numbers rolled. We ended up with 500 and something people. And I, I told the story and here we are. You know, we, uh, we 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 uh, last. Uh, if, am I okay just to say we we had a brilliant interview? Uh, are you familiar with the singer Robbie Williams? Yeah, yeah. I, I, well, Robbie's a friend. He's been a friend for years, and he agreed to to do a an interview with me last week, which we've put out there on Truth Proof Channel. If anybody wants to see it, or anybody else, I mean, we had Jim Segala from Skinwalker uh, on a, a few weeks ago, and so we get some great guests on. So. I'd just like to give that a plug if I could, yeah. For sure. And yeah. Wolflands, to your documentary, tell them where to find Wolflands. Well, if, if anybody wanted the physical copy, the, 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 yeah, that can be obtained from truthproof.uk, but it's available on Amazon Prime. And uh, I don't know, read the reviews. Uh, there's a few, there's a there's two or three that are damning, but I, I think there's 100 that are absolutely first class and we haven't got people to write them but i think it speaks for itself there's a lot of work gone into it it's been done on a shoestring people i've not got loads of money but it's three years of hard work with good cameras good quality cameras and you know we've done a lot with it and the books uh truthproof.uk and as josh says uh when when anybody wants books and they go to uk you usually give me a shout don't you uh i don't know how that works with you guys but uh yeah all good yeah for sure. And definitely hit me up, folks, if you want a book from, from Sinclair. Um, since he's on here, if you want to do a giveaway, then I can I can pick I, it up. I don't mind. How, how, how does that work? And just just contact me and uh, we, we can we can do that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's five books. There's The Night People, which is, there it is, about my own experiences. And then it's pretty self-explanatory. And, it, you know, we've got, we've got truth proof, uh, you know, two, number four there. That's more cryptid related. And uh, I didn't, I didn't come on to do that, Josh. I'll come on <laughs> I'm listening to you, but thank you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, it, I don't mind at all, Josh. So uh, let me pick I a couple people from the chat here, Paul. Um, I'll pick one, and you can pick one. Anybody who I can't see chat, won, Josh. So I'm going to leave it to you. You pick the people. Okay. Anybody who's not won a giveaway, uh, announce it right here, and I'll pick two of you, and Paul will send you a book. Uh, if you're in the UK, you have to be in the UK. I don't know. Right, I'm glad you said that, and it's that's easy done, Josh, and I'll do that gladly. Yeah. If there's anybody from the UK that wants Smurfy, are you from the UK? If you are, then Paul can send you a book. But let's let's keep it to the UK because it's a, a very expensive. I said, yeah, oh, that, never mind. <laughs> that was the problem, were not it? Before yeah. you know, the, the postage. We, we get a lot of people though from the UK that listen to the yeah. show. So. So we run the live stream every Thursday at 7 p.m. UK time. Uh, you know, if any anybody's interested. And likewise, uh, I always point, point people in direction of the uh, the Awakening, the guys from Zohar Stargate, uh, Josh's channel, lots of different channels. I would use the, the Unexplained. I think it's all about sharing and building, a, I don't know, a good con good connections with good people. And everything I see here is good. I mean, it speaks for itself. I can't see the chat, but when I could see it earlier, I think there were 500 people in. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah and, and late too. I mean, we're up late. And and so, you know, I, I think that it's just going to keep, we're just going to keep going. It's going to mm. grow and grow and it's going to get bigger. And the field needs to be unified. I know there's yeah. a lot of people who resist that because they don't like the direction that it's headed. I've heard people complaining and it's ridiculous because it's all connected. And now you're starting to see more and more people that are doing their shows based on everything, the 40, yeah, everything, not just their their little niche. You know, years ago when I started this, they wanted me to stay in my lane. People were telling me, they're like, why are you doing the ghosts? Why are you doing the UFOs? Aren't you a dog man person? And I'm like, I'm not anything person. I'm whatever the, tr the truth takes me. That's where I go. There's a there's the bleed through, Josh, and you see it, you, and and you always have done. You know, I talked earlier about the 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 cryptid scenario with the these things seemingly speaking to people in their minds. The alien scenario it even bleeds through into spiritualism. The 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 medium who, who receives messages from spirit, if if that's what they're doing, I'm not mm -hmm. subscribing to the idea. I'm not nothing I say, people, is setting stone. You know, and I'm I'm prepared to be 
to be educated if, if there's if there's more information out there but what does what does the Claire audience the medium receive messages in the in the form of voices in their minds it's the same exotic science that's being used throughout the whole phenomena and uh, that's what I find fascinating this multi-phenomena aspect that people like yourself Josh and other researchers are now realizing it, it, that's in my opinion that's the way to go and uh, I'm gonna right the guy who showed me showed me this saw one floating in the sky sometime well I, I didn't see that to first part of the question uh, Anu but uh, I'm sure it's been a fascinating night and I'm gonna make tracks Josh and yeah. uh, thank you thanks for your time thanks for allowing me Absolutely. to share a few things. if anybody's listening and they check this out later on and you're listening to this on the replay and you want a book from Paul Sinclair hit me up and uh, I'll, I'll get it for you I'll, I'll have them send it to you if you're from England or the UK so thanks Paul for for, for dropping in I just saw you in the chat and I thought man it would be good to have you come on with Christopher Garitano and we had a good time excellent I've enjoyed it thank you very much Josh you take care and rest up bye bye yeah you too I'll see you Bye-bye. So that's Paul Sinclair, another good friend of mine from the UK. He's a researcher and an author, and he's done a lot of good work. He's on Truth Proof. Uh, and like he said, he comes out on Thursdays. I think it's like noon my time or something. Um, <clears throat> one, of, one of the two Pauls, the other one's Paul Wallace from Australia, very good researcher, ancient alien researcher. Good guy, good people. We had a good chat. We had a good time, right? I'm leaving, but it's 456 people in the chat that stuck with me to the end. And uh, like always, they always say, oh, you can't do that. You can't do that. Don't do that. And then they're always telling me no, 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 and telling me that I can't do something or we won't be able to do something. Do they understand what PRT is? Do they really know? It's a steamroller. It's a steamroller that's rolling over all the lies and the fraud and the hoax and all, and we're headed to the truth. We're, we're going to find it. We're going to get it. And eventually, someday, maybe we'll have the answers. We keep trying. We keep going, right? Uh, JoJo says, great show tonight. Yes, it was. Thank you to everybody who donated. I didn't do this show to get a bunch of donations. We didn't. And that's not, that's okay. I wasn't trying to. Um, people say that. That's a knock. They always say, oh, you're just trying to get people to donate money, whatever. You're trying to, you want to be seen. You want to show yourself, whatever. I, you know, who cares? Say whatever you want to say. The bottom line is the truth is in the the proof is in the pudding. The truth is there. We're here and we're we're doing what we do. <clears throat> Somebody said that a shadow walked behind me at some point in the show, and I thought I saw it. So you might want to go back and rewatch this and check it out and and see if there's something there. If something did go behind me, I'm sure it's probably eavesdropping, just like everybody else who wants to stop me. You got the shadow people trying to do it too, right? It's it's. <laughs> Let them try. You're not going to. Nothing's going to stop me until God calls me home. Okay? We're going to be together. We're a family. We're your friends. And we're going to do what we have to do to get the truth out there. My name is Josh Turner, Paranormal Roundtable. We did five hours and 15 minutes. We had a great time. At the end, after we talked about Gerald's werewolf, as, as being a werewolf, whether he is or not, up to speculation, listen to the show. <clears throat> we had a lot of questions that people were, were asking, and I answered them. We did a Q&A. Garitano came on, and, and then Paul Sinclair came on. I mean, you can't ask for anything more. I mean, you have a great time. You have a great show. We always do a good We always do a good show tomorrow night. Remember, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. It's a pre-record. The Costa Rican Werewolf. I did the best job I could at telling what I had to tell for that. It was an hour. And uh, the guy was a contractor who went to Costa Rica and ran into something that can only be described as a werewolf. Check it out. Listen. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. We're going to get back to the interviews. But right now, I've just been too tired to uh, record. I can listen to people and then go back and retell it and do whatever I got to do and, and get the notes and whatever. But <clears throat> sitting down and recording, I have to go to the studio and take time to do that. And we've done a couple, but I'd like to just get a bunch of them done so that I can just put them all out, you know, the way we need to put them out. And um, I hope that everybody enjoyed uh, the show tonight. And if you want to help donate, I don't have the, the link or whatever, but I have a PayPal 
that you can use if you don't feel like doing the super chat so that we can help get um, some camera equipment because we want to do some investigating and we need a night vision. At least that's what I'm being told. Barton gave me that suggestion. So did a couple other people help and holler. They were like, hey, you know, the night vision thing, you're going to be able to go out at night. You need to do that. So thanks to all the people who've given me the advice on what I need to do. And uh, so I decided to do that. That's what we're going to do. But it does cost money. And so if you want to help out and donate, that's fine. If you can't and you can't afford it, I get it. You're on a budget. Don't worry about it. I'll figure it out. <clears throat> but we do want to want to go out and do the investigations because there are a lot of places where people have seen things in this area. And I'm going to be doing those investigations and, and, and including some stuff in April and I'm, it's coming up. I need to talk to David about it. David Weatherly, him and uh, Eric Palacios from Media Palace who did the Beast of Brushy Creek. Go check it out. It's on Amazon. That's one of Eric's. Uh, and Eric is a very good friend of mine and he's instrumental in helping me get syndicated. And so I do appreciate him and appreciate everything he's done for me. And um, I want to uh, have him come on the show and we'll go and do some investigating together and make a video. Also, I'm going to be working with Rod Nichols and a few other people, Joe Breezy, who was in the, the chat earlier. And uh, maybe you, Larry, if you want to come out and do it too, Larry Fisher, who also works for us. And although he doesn't totally believe my stance on the Old Testament, we disagree a little bit. Uh, everything else is what it is. We're friends. And here at PRT, you can have your own belief and you can agree to disagree. I don't always get people to like what I say. It's just the way it is. Um, I'm not everybody's cup of tea. And maybe sometimes I am, maybe sometimes I'm not. It's just what it is. Come here. Come on. Come here. Come here. Come here, sweet girl. Come on. My dogs came in. Oh, there's Elvira, too. Look at this. You want to say hi to the nice people? You want to say hi? Come on. Oh. Come up. There you go. Look at that. There you go. Say hi. This is Beansy. You remember when she was a puppy? This is her with her haircut. Oh, yes. You're such a sweet girl. Yes, you are. Here, let me, let me get Elvira up here. Come on. Come on, Elvira. No, no, no. Let your sister come up. Let her come up. This is my sweet girl. This one rides. She loves to go for rides. This one right here. Look. You want to go out there? You want to stand there? Beans, I'm down. So this is Elvira. Turn and look at the camera. <laughs> Turn and look at the camera. Well, there you go. A little therapy dog. When I have anxiety, this is the one that comes. They both do, but this one in particular, she comes and lays with me. Isn't it right? You help me with my anxiety. And Martis, my cat, my black cat, he always shows up if I'm feeling bad. He's, he's the, the helper in the house. He loves everybody. But what he likes to do is help people to escape. He likes to open the doors, doesn't he? Yes, he does. He opens the doors and lets them run around and go into places they're not supposed to be. He likes to let Banjo out. Like if Aunt, if Tony leaves, um, he'll put Banjo in the room. Martis has figured out. Come on, guys. Martis has figured out how to open the door. In fact, he opened my door right now, and then he opened my closet door because Martis knows how to manipulate the handles, and that's how the dogs ended up in here, and they're playing on the floor. But I don't know where my pig is at. Truffles. Truffles. Anyway, we'll be making some videos. Um, we're going to be doing some more work. I have that that uh, Facebook channel that I'm going to be doing some stuff on. I'm going to do some comedy sketches, um, and, and we'll see what happens. The truth says, I see Josh is a dog man. I'm a dog man, a bird man, a cat man, a fish man. Um, I love animals. I have a pig. Where is he? Where's Truffles? I don't. They won't be able to see him on the on the camera, but oh, they, can hear him. they can hear him. What's up, Truffles? Where are you at? He comes in here if, when Martis opens. Uh, Martis opened that door, and then he lets all the other animals in. And our other two cats, Panzer and Honey Butters, come in and they start going crazy. Mm -hmm. And then we have a bunch of Embunas. Pray for my Embunas because uh, something's been happening to them lately. We can't figure it out. But they've been dying, and I'm not happy about that because I'm really attached to all my animals, even my fish. And they know you. When you go up to the aquarium, they know you. They come to the aquarium. They'll they'll come, you know. And so I've gotten attached to them. And we have two birds, two cockatoos, Leonidas. And what, what happened? Everything okay? Um, is, that, is that butters? What is she doing? Oh, she she's mad. She's protesting. She's like, yeah. The dog is. 
Oh, uh, come here, honey butters. Honey, come here, honey butters. She's a little, she's a little irritated, but she's a sweetheart. She's our our latest cat that we've got. And how how long have we had her now? Six months. Yeah, I think so. About six months. We got her in October. Well, Martis will be able to. You can put Martis on the camera. Oh, Martis loves being on here. Martis is so chill. He doesn't care. He loves to be on the camera. But uh, I, I love animals. I'm an animal person. Uh, we have two guinea pigs, two ferrets. We have two cockatiels. We have uh... – there he is. Come here, Marmar. He's the one that was in there opening the doors earlier. Come here. Bad kitty. You're a bad kitty. Look at you. Hey, Marmar. You're a sweet boy. But you come in here, you let all the animals in, don't you? Yes, you do. You let all the animals in. You're a bad kitty, but I love you. This is my boy right here. This is my big boy. And this is my cat, technically. They're all our animals. Say hi. Look at them eyes. Look at them eyes. Ooh. Spooky. Okay. Let me, let me put you down because you're not. He's, now he's going to get into everything in here because he loves to get into everything in, in, in the study. He likes being in here. They all do. They come in here and they just want to hang out. When Smartest opens that door, they all run in here. I'm in here doing work, and they just and truffles comes and just bangs into my legs until I give him a treat because he knows I keep some treats in here. Martis, Martis is still in here, so just so you know. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, th th this is my family, and these are my pets, and we, you know, we have Thanos and Galactus, the the guinea pigs. They're the they're the bad bad dudes, you know. And uh, but Martis is cool. He'll go up and he'll pet them, and we have two rabbits. Uh, Roxy and Cinnamon, the very sweet, sweet girls. Um, but yeah, as it meant, am I always up this late? Yes. And actually, I was supposed to be doing guard checks tonight, so I had to call my field captain and say, "Hey, can you go and do the guard checks?" I, I was texting earlier. That's what I was texting, saying, "Hey, can you go do the guard checks?" Because I'm going to be busy. Uh, D True says, "I bet your cat would pick up on shadows." Yes, he does, and they all do. And sometimes, and whenever this stuff was going on with this war. They would all stop the animals and just look and watch, and you could feel it. And at one point, we had a guest over who saw something that looked like one of those predator-looking, you know, things people talk about with the blur and all that. Yeah, but that's for another time. I can tell you a million stories. I'll have to go back. You guys remember the things that I talked about that we're going to rehearse uh, or not rehearse, what do you call it, a rehash on uh, the Sunday show? Let me know. Let me know, and we will just ask the questions and put them in caps, um, or you can put them in a small donation or something like 99 cents or something to get it seen because there's so much. The, the thread the comments go so fast on Sundays that, that you might not be able to be seen. So put it in capital letters or whatever, or, or you can make it into a color by making a, do a small donation, 99 cents or something. Just so you can get your, uh, and I'm not trying to get you to pay. I'm trying to get you to, so you can be seen. Uh, X says, what time do you typically wake up? Sorry, I'm a nerd about routines. Yes, I do. I usually sleep four to five hours a night. Now, tonight, I'm a little tired. So I'm probably not going to hit the gym, but um, I, I need to, I need to go. But I usually go and work out four nights a week. Uh, I take, I do an upper body, then the legs, and then I take two days off and I do upper body and legs again. And that's usually how it goes. So within a six day period, I do four workouts. I videoed some of the workouts. People have asked me about it. And then, you know, I don't know, somebody had said that they were on Matt Imsch's show and they were, they were like, Oh, I don't know what this guy's talking about. Who is this crazy guy? Which I think is kind of odd because most of the people that were in that show were my listeners. But if that's what they said, that's what they said. And I have this to say to them. Um, go jump in the lake. That's all I can tell you. I don't I don't care what you say. It doesn't matter to me. Rexy W says, Ed Dames, remote viewer, told Art Bell that shadow people were the ghosts of aliens after seeing the Miami aliens cloaked in the shadow. Hmm. Very possible. Or they are aliens themselves. And now Martis wants to get out. You can open the door. You know how to do it. <laughs> Uh, I have been in here one time when Panzer was in here. When we first moved in, there was some stuff that we found in here. There was a very bad energy. And uh, 
I heard a weird noise and Panzer jumped at it and swiped at it. And I saw what I thought was something move really quick, like, you know, and so my cats are fearless and so are my dogs. They don't, they're not no punks. They don't just go, oh, okay, some scary stuff and they run away. Um, they seem to be like kind of protective and they're protective over us and protective over me. And so, um, yeah, we, we, we do our best to be loving and have loving animals around because animals that you love and that give you love, they will protect you too, because there's love there. And when you have them around, their little souls are there and they vibrate at a different energy and they keep a lot of bad stuff out. They really do. And of, of course, our ferrets, we let them out and they love to go and play with the cats in the garage. They love and they just run around in the garage and do whatever they do. It's awesome because it keeps you grounded. And if you're able to afford it and have pets and be able to take care of them, the only problem is when we go out of town, we got to have somebody babysit and pay somebody to watch them. And that's okay. As long as the person is a decent person and they love animals too, because you got to love animals. If you're around me, you got to love animals. And I'm always leery of people who animals don't like. I mean, some of, them, some of my animals are very cool, and then some of them don't take to people very well. Um, but then there's some of them that won't ever be cool with people. They just they they like you, and that's it. But you got to realize though, somebody who who you know an animal doesn't like. And recently, I was told a story from a guy who said that he was dating a girl, and uh, she was from uh, from California, but I can't remember the name of the city right off the top of my head. Be uh, Bakersfield. So she was from Bakersfield, California. And he says, dude, I, I was dating this girl and she was hotter than the sun. Um, but she was just so, she did not like animals. She was very, very mean to my animals. And uh, he goes, and I, and I had a bird, you know, and um, he just was, she wasn't okay with them. She wasn't cool with my cat. She wasn't cool with my bird. She wasn't cool with my, my even my fish didn't like her. They'd go away, run away from her. And of course, she turned out to be a very, very bad person. And they split up, and some bad things started happening to them. Shadow people showing up, things like that. Martis, he's in my closet. Martis, come on. Come on, buddy. Wish you knew how to close the doors behind you. All right, folks. So thank you for tuning in. I had a great time. This was an awesome live. I didn't plan on it going this long, but it did. And hopefully people will actually watch and watch it to the end. And it'll probably take them two days to get through it. But um, yes, you're right, D-Truth. Animals have a much better perception of people than we do. Yeah, you can, Jim Bob. He says, you can tell a lot about a person by how they treat animals. That's a true thing. That's a true thing. I like that statement. That's the truth. So I love you guys. We'll see you on the next show, which is tomorrow night, Tuesday, Tuesday night. Probably won't be a show Wednesday, but I'll be back on Thursday with Blondes and Booze. We're going to do a great show. We're going to have a – we always have fun. I love the Blondes and Booze show. I'm going to be on there every Thursday, just going into the future. Just plan on being on there. I need you to like and subscribe so they can get their numbers up. Those ladies deserve it. They do a lot of good work. They do a lot of hard work. Um, and so after that, Friday night, we have a guest coming on. Let's see who the guest is. I'm pretty sure it's going to be a good one. Always, it always is. Let me see if it's somebody that you're not going to want to miss. Let's see. Oh, yeah. This should be a good one. Yep. And then Sunday, we'll be back at Saturday with the UAP Project. We'll be on. And Michael Anthony, a good friend of mine, is going to be on the show. I'm glad to have him come on. He's a smart guy and knows a lot about the alien agenda. And then Saturday or our Sunday, we retell people's stories like we do, and then we do it all over again. So I'll see you guys, and you never know when we're going to do an impromptu show, and it's going to turn into a big old thing like it had tonight. I'll see everybody. Good night.